Prologue Marpinoff, The Year of Holy Thunder, 1450 DR Pain racked Vara, knife stabs of agony that kept time with her contractions. She lay on her back in a straw-filled birthing bed in the abbey, the Abbey of the Rose, Derek had called it, her knees bent, the sheets damp and sticky with sweat and blood. Her blood. Too much of it, she knew. She saw her fate reflected in the worried eyes of the homely middle-aged midwife who patted her hand and mouthed soft encouragement, saw it in the furrowed brow and filmy but intense gaze of the balding elderly priest with blood-slicked hands who reached into Vara time and again to no avail. Vara searched her memory, but could not remember their names. The previous hours, had it been just hours, had passed in a blur. She remembered traveling in a caravan across Sembia, fleeing before a storm of shadows, an ever-growing tenebrous thunderhead that threatened to blanket all of Sembia with its pall. Undead had attacked the caravan, unliving shadows, their keening voices announcing their hunger for souls, and in a moment of thoughtless bravery, she had led them off into the forest to save the others. There, terrified and stumbling through the underbrush, she'd happened upon a man, a dark man who had reminded her of Erebus, her child's father. The howls of the undead had filled the woods behind her, all around her, their keens a promise of cold and death and oblivion. Who are you? She'd asked the dark man, panting, her voice tense with growing panic. I'm just fiddling around the edges, the man had said, and his narrow, sharply angled face had creased in a mirthless smile. He had touched her pregnant belly, then not yet bulging, and sent a knife stab of pain through her abdomen. The memory of his touch caused her to squirm on the birthing bed. She moaned with pain. Bloody straw poked into her back. The light from the lanterns put a dancing patchwork of shadows on the vaulted stone ceiling, and she swore she heard the dark man chuckle. "'Be still, woman!' The priest said sharply. Sweat greased his pate. Blood spattered his yellow robe. He did something to the child. Who? The midwife asked, her double chins bouncing with the question. What do you mean? The dark man, Vara said, screaming as another contraction twisted her guts. The man in the forest. The midwife glanced at the priest knowingly and patted Vara's hand. It'll be all right she said, mouthing words they all knew were a lie. It's fine. You're not in a forest, and there's no dark man here. The priest mopped his brow, smearing blood across his scalp, and reached into Vara again. Pain ripped through her a wave of agony that ran from pelvis to chest. She gasped as the priest pulled his hands back, looked up, and shared a glance with the midwife. Vara read in their faces the words they didn't say aloud. "'What's wrong with my child?' she said and tried to sit up. The bloody sheets clung to her back. The effort caused her more pain, agonizing pulses. The room spun. She feared she would vomit. "'Please be still,' the priest said, and the midwife gently pressed her back down on the birthing bed." Pain and exhaustion caused Vara's vision to blur. Her mind floated backward into memory, to the forest. Run, the dark man had said to her. And she had, tripping, stumbling, and cursing her way through the brush. The unliving shadows had pursued her, closing, their wails loud in her ears, coming at her from all directions. She had stumbled into a meadow and fallen, she recalled the sweet smell of the purple flowers, the dusting of silver pollen that fogged the night air and glittered in Selyun's light. She remembered curling up among the blooms as the shadows closed in, like a child herself, wrapped in the meadow's womb. She'd put her arms around her belly, around her unborn child, knowing they were both about to die, 
and wishing and praying that she were somewhere else, somewhere safe, anywhere. And then, as if in answer to her wish, the motes of pollen had flared bright silver, and she recalled a sudden disconcerting lurch of motion. He saved me, she murmured to the midwife, knowing she wasn't making sense to anyone but herself. The dark man, he saved me. Of course he did, dear, the midwife said, caressing her hand, obviously not listening. And he'd also saved Vara's child from the undead, if not the perils of childbirth. She came back fully to the current moment, to the pain. Derek, she said, blinking tears and sweat from her eyes. I'm here, he said from behind her, and she drifted again. The magic of the meadow's flowers had moved her, and Vara had found herself elsewhere, disconcerted, nauseated. A soft rain that smelled faintly of ash fell out of a black sky. She'd felt drowsy, as if she'd been sleepwalking and had only just awakened. Sitting low on the horizon, the setting sun tried to poke through a roof of dense, dark clouds— but only a few stray rays penetrated the shroud. It was almost night. The sheer cracked face of towering mountains hemmed her in. She was in a pass. Her mind tried to make sense of events. How had she arrived here? Some magic, some miracle of the meadow. Her child moved within her, she gasped, her knees went weak, and she nearly fell when she saw the growth of her belly. How? she whispered, and ran her hands over the now swollen mound of her abdomen. The swell of her stomach seemed more miraculous than her inexplicable translocation. Moments ago, she had been little more than a month pregnant. Then she remembered. The dark man had touched her belly. He'd done something to the baby. He must have. Even as the thought registered, the contractions began, like a hand squeezing her womb. Her wonder turned in an instant to fear, and fear to terror. She was alone in an unknown place, and somehow soon to give birth. Her heart beat so fast she grew lightheaded. She tried to calm herself with long, deep breaths, the rain and the breeze summoned shivers. She had to find shelter, help. Gods, she needed help. She stumbled through the rocks, picking her way through the boulders, the stands of trees, calling out over the patter of the rain. The unliving shadows appeared to be gone. Perhaps the caravan was nearby. Or perhaps there was a village in the vicinity, a cottage, something, anything. She had to risk a shout. Help! Anyone! Help! Please! She realized that she didn't even know where she was. She'd been in a forest. Now she was in a mountain pass. Gods, she said, tears falling down her face. Gods! She wandered the shadowed landscape, shouting until her voice was hoarse, watching with a sense of dread as the sun sank. At last her legs would bear her no farther, and she sagged to the ground under a cluster of pines, exhausted, wrapped in the aroma of pine needles and rain. She would give birth alone, outside, in the dark. The realization pressed against her chest, made it hard to breathe. Help! she called, expiating with a scream the pain of another contraction. Help! Someone please help! Over the rain, she heard voices. She froze, afraid to let hope nest in her chest. She cocked her head, listened, tried to hear above the thump of her own heart. Yes, voices. Here, she cried. She tried to stand, but another contraction ripped through her and forced her back to the bed of pine needles. Over here, help me, please. The ground vibrated under her, and she soon saw what caused it. A patrol of armed and armored men mounted on war horses moved through the pass at a rapid trot. A blazing sun and a rose, 
both incongruous in the bleak shrouded land, were enameled on their breastplates. They looked about as if seeking her, their mounts trotting and snorting. The call came from around here, one of them said, and pulled his horse around. I heard it too, said a second. Where are you? another shouted. Here, she called, and held up a hand. Relief put more tears in her eyes, but gave her voice strength. I'm here! Helmed heads turned to her. The men pulled up their horses. Here, in the pines! It's a woman, one of them shouted. Several of them swung out of their saddles, pushed through the pine limbs, and hurried to her side. They smelled of sweat and leather and horse and hope. She's with child, said a young man whose helm seemed too large for his head. Even under the trees their bodies seemed to attract the last meager rays of the setting sun, and the fading light limbed their armor and shields. She could not take her eyes from the rose. Her memory blurred subsequent events, compressed what must have been close to an hour into moments. The oldest of the men, his long, gray-streaked hair leaking from beneath his helm, his face seamed with lines and scars that his trimmed beard could not hide, had kneeled beside her. Rest easy, he said. He closed his eyes and placed the fingertips of one hand on her arm. She felt his mind touch hers, as if evaluating her soul. She did not welcome the violation, but she was too tired to resist. After a moment he opened his eyes and nodded, seemingly satisfied. "'What is your name, good woman?' he asked. His deep voice reminded her of a rolling brook. It calmed her. "'Vara,' she said, and winced as another contraction knotted her abdomen. "'You'll be cared for, Vara.' He took a small holy symbol, a stylized rose, in his hand and placed both of his palms, gnarled and scarred from years of battle, on her stomach. He intoned a prayer to the Amonitor. A soft glow spread from his palms to her abdomen, warming her, easing her pain, and quelling her fear. "'You need a midwife,' he said, "'and a priest skilled in childbirth. I can get you both.' Can you stand? She nodded, and he helped her to her feet. He stood almost as tall as Erebus and smelled like the rain. Where am I? she asked. You're with me, and safe. The simple words took her by surprise, recalling, as they did, her wish from the meadow. Her eyes welled. The man removed his heavy cloak and draped it around her shoulders. How did you come here? he asked her, guiding her toward his horse. She felt the eyes of the other riders on her, their gazes heavy with questions. They'd already remounted. How did you find the pass? Are others with you? She swallowed, shook her head. I was with a caravan, but I think I'm alone now, and I don't know how I came here. What pass is this? She could be in service to the Shadow Var, Derig, said a young squat rider. Don't be a fool, the older man, Derig, snapped. Look at her. She is no servant of the Shades. The Shades of the Desert of Anarok? Vara asked, wincing in anticipation of another contraction. Desert, said the young rider, his face pinched in a question. He looked to Derig. She babbles. Or will ride toward the foothills, Derek said. See if anyone else from her caravan is about. To Vara, he said, do you think you can ride? She took stock of her condition, nodded, grunted as another contraction pained her. She rides daybreak with me, Derek said to his men. Nav, Greer, ride for the abbey. Tell the oracle we found her and tell the abbot we return with the pilgrim in the midst of labor. Then rouse Erdan. He has experience in these matters. Two of the riders wheeled their mounts and rode off. Abby? Vara asked, leaning heavily on Derek. Pilgrim? Oracle? The Abbey of the Rose, Derek said, 
as he assisted her toward the war horse he had called Daybreak. You're a pilgrim, yes? Come to see the oracle? She had never heard of the Abbey of the Rose. I don't know. He studied her face, the age lines in his brow deepening with his frown. Where are you from? Sambia, north and west of Ordulan. Derek's eyes narrowed. He studied her expression as he said, Ordulan is a wasteland. It was destroyed in the Shadow Storm, and Sembia is a vassal state to Netheril and the Shades. She stared at him, uncomprehending. Are you all right? he asked. She felt lightheaded. She shook her head. She must have misheard. I don't understand. I just left. A contraction doubled her over. When it passed, strong hands took hold of her and lifted her gently atop daybreak. She sat side-saddle as best she could. Derrick mounted behind her and closed her in his arms as he wickered at the mount. She hissed with pain as the horse started to move. She kept one hand on her belly, felt the movement of her child within. The abbey isn't far, Derrick said. Tell me if it becomes too much to endure. It's tolerable, she said, but please hurry. The rest of the patrol fell in around them as they rode through the pass. The way narrowed as they followed a winding, circuitous path of switchbacks and side openings. A mist formed around them, thick and pale, obscuring vision. Whispers sounded in her ears, sibilant words suggesting a meaning that slipped away just prior to understanding. She thought she heard Erevis's name in their whispered tones, and another name, too. Erevis's real name, Vason. Try to ignore the whispers and whatever else you see, Derek said to her softly. She nodded, alone with her pain. Please hurry. Faces formed in the mist, men and women with eyes like holes. They dissipated moments after forming, fading like lost memories. She squeezed her eyes shut, but still the fog tugged at her clothes, pawed at her belly. Still the voices hissed in her ears, speaking of her child. It's the child, they said. He'll dream of the father, and the father of him. They know me, she said, terrified. No. Derek said. There are the voices of spirits that serve the oracle and guard the way, but they're harmless to us. They only confuse. Don't heed them. Vara swallowed, nodded, and ignored the voices. She soon lost all sense of direction. The pass was a maze, and the voices of the spirits thickened her perception, dulled her mind. The moments passed with agonizing slowness, she tried through force of will to delay the birth of her child. The birth of Erevis's child. The child, the voices said. The child. She squeezed her eyes shut, wondering where Erevis was, if he was safe. He had left her to save his friend, and she had reconciled herself to it. But she missed him still, and always would. She hoped he was well but Derek's words resounded in her mind. Or Doolin is a wasteland. Sembia is gone. How could that have happened so fast? Oh, gods, she whispered, as realization broke over her. It seemed impossible, and yet... What's wrong? Derek asked. What year is it? She said, her voice breaking on the rocks of the question. She braced herself for the answer. Her heart pounded in her ears. Year, Derek said. By Dale Reckoning, 1450. The child squirmed within her and she cried out. The child is come, said the voices. Are you all right? Derek asked. She nodded as one pain passed, replaced by another. 1450. How was that possible? Seventy years had passed in what felt to her like moments. She wrestled with understanding, but failed. She could not make sense of it. 
Her child was seventy years old before he was ever born. She began to weep, not with pain, but with grief for all that she'd lost, all she'd left behind. How can this be? she whispered, and had no answer. If Derek heard her, he offered no answer either. They emerged from the mist, leaving the voices of the spirits behind. Through tear-filled eyes, she watched the last glowing sliver of the sun sink behind the western mountains, watched the long shadows of the peaks stretch across the pass. The already meager light faded to black. They had reached a forested vale. Huge cascades fell from cliffs, and a simple stone abbey was nestled in the trees. The priest's head appeared between her knees. Sweat slicked his thin hair to his pale age spotted scalp. The dim lantern light put shadows in the hollows of his cheeks. If I'm to save the child, you must not push until I say. Breathe in and out slowly, the midwife said. Vara swallowed, nodded. The rush of her heart boomed in her ears. A contraction girdled her pelvis in agony. She screamed, and the portly midwife, wincing, sopped up more blood from the bed, cast some of the sheets into the gory pile on the floor. I'm thirsty, Vara said. Almost, the priest said, not hearing her as he stared into her body and tried to save her child. Do something, said Derek from somewhat behind Vara. She's in too much pain. He had refused to leave her since bringing her to the abbey. We're doing all we can, Derrick, the priest said, tension putting an edge on his voice. Do more, Derrick said. Vara focused on her breathing and stared up at the vaulted ceiling. Her entire frame of reference distilled down to an awareness of only her abdomen, the birth canal, the child she was soon to deliver. But there was no ease from the pain. Her vision blurred. She feared she would be too weak to push when the priest told her to do so. She feared she would never see her child. She screamed again as the priest manipulated the child within her, a dagger in her belly. Get the child out, Derek said, stress causing his voice to break. The priest looked up from between Vara's legs, looked first at her then passed her to Derek. I can't. It's dying. The cord is... He trailed off, but his words left Vara hollow. No, she said, and tears wet her cheeks. No! The priest looked at her, his expression soft, sympathetic. I'm so sorry. You are not trying hard enough, Erdan, said Derek and she heard him move across the room toward the priest, although he remained behind Vara out of sight. The priest's soft voice never lost its calm. I've done all I can, Derek. We must take steps if the woman is to have a chance. Vara felt Derek's hand on her head, on her hair, a protective gesture that soothed her, warmed her. How strange, she thought, she realized in the clarity of the moment that in another time, another place, he was a man she might have loved, despite the difference in their ages. Her name is Vara, Derek said, and there must be something. Cut the child out, Vara said, her voice as soft as rain, its quiet resolve slicing through the room. Derek's hand lifted from her head as if he were recoiling. The priest looked as if she had spoken in a language he could not understand. What did you say? The midwife squeezed Vara's hand. You're not clear-headed. Cut my child out, Vara said, louder, her mind made up. Her body tensed, a contraction gripped her. The child moved within her, and she screamed. Cut it out! I'm already dead, I see it in your face! The priest and the midwife stared at her, eyes wide. Neither gainsaid her words. I'm already dead, Vara said, more quietly, the words spiced with her tears, 
her grief. The priest swallowed, his tracheal lump bouncing up and down. I haven't prepared the correct rituals, and I do have not the needed tools. A knife will do, Vara said, and managed to keep her voice from faltering. The room began to spin. She closed her eyes until it subsided. A knife? There's little time, Vara said. Right, of course, the priest said, looking past her to Derig as if for permission. Derig's hand returned to Vara's head, cradling it as he might an infant, as he might a daughter. His fingers twisted gently in her sweat-dampened hair. She reached up and covered his hand with hers as her tears fell. His skin felt as rough as bark. His bearded face appeared next to hers, his breath warm on her cheek. You don't have to do this, he said. It's my child, she said. Three words that said everything there was to say about anything. Her eyes went to the sheets piled along the wall, a crimson pile. I'm dead already. We both know that. The priest produced a small knife and held it aloft in a shaking hand. The lantern light flickered on its blade. Stress squeezed sweat from his blood-smeared brow. The midwife's clammy fingers clenched Vara's hand. Vara alone seemed to feel calm. Derek, listen to me, Vara said. Someone did something to the child, changed it. I did not know how, but it's my child, mine. Do you understand? His hand squeezed hers. He buried his forehead in her hair. She breathed in the smell of him. He still smelled of the rain and wondered how she could have come to care for him so much in mere hours, in mere moments. How cruel that they had only hours to share rather than a lifetime. I understand, he said. She swallowed in a throat gone dry, nodded. To the priest, she said, Do it. The priest winced, steeled himself to his work. This will pain you, he said, but did not move. Do it, Vara said. Do it now. But he didn't. He couldn't. His hand shook uncontrollably. The midwife took the knife from the priest's hand, stared for a moment into Vara's eyes, and began to cut. Vara walled off a scream behind gritted teeth as the edge slid across her abdomen and opened her womb, spilling warm fluid down her sides. The midwife's resolve spread to the priest as he moved forward to assist. Spots formed before Vara's eyes. Sparks erupted in her brain. She might have been screaming. She could not be certain. She felt the priest and midwife manipulating the hole they'd made in her, felt them reaching inside her. She was screaming, she realized, swimming in pain, in blood. She focused on Derek's hand, its solidity, the gentle way it cradled her own. Warmth radiated from his flesh, dulled the edge of her agony. He would never leave her, she thought. Never. Something warm and wet pattered on their joined hands. Her fading consciousness mistook it for blood at first, but then she realized it was tears. Derek's tears. She felt his mouth near her ear, and he whispered words of faith. From ends, beginnings, from darkness, light, from tragedy, triumph. Night gives way to dawn, and dawn to noon. Stand in the warmth and purifying light of a monitor who was Lathander and fear nothing. Fear nothing, Vara. She felt herself fading, slipping. The room darkened. Care for him, she whispered to Derek. Him, Derek said. Vara nodded. She knew the child would be a son, a son for the father. The spirits in the past had told her. His name is Vasin, after his father. I will, Vara, Derek said. I promise. 
Vara heard a rush like roaring surf. The room darkened. She could no longer see. She felt herself drifting, floating in warm water, sinking. She heard a tiny cough, then a newborn's cry, the defiant call of her son as he entered a world of light and darkness. She smiled, drifted, thought of Erevis, of Derig, and feared nothing. Derig had slain many men in combat, had seen battlefields littered with corpses, but he had to force himself to look on Vara's body, at the blood-soaked bed, at the opening in her abdomen out of which Erdan, the priest, had mined the child. Her face, finally free of pain, looked as pale as a new moon. He could not release her still warm hand. He held on to it as if, with it, he could pull her back to life. She is gone, the midwife said. Gone to light. Derek nodded. He'd known Vara perhaps two hours, but he had felt a connection with her, a whispered hint of what might have been had they met under other circumstances. Through sixty winters he had never married, and now he knew why. He was to meet his love only in the twilight of his life, and he was to know her for less than a day. He thanked a monitor for that, at least. What's wrong with it? the midwife said, her exclamation pulling Derek's attention from Vara. Hand to her mouth, the midwife backed away a step from the birthing bed, a step away from the child. Erdan, eyes as wide as coins, held the baby out at arm's length as he might something foul. The child pinched, dark and bloody, his legs kicking, cried in sharp gasps. The umbilical cord still connected him to Vara, and a thin vein of shadow twined around the cord's length and slowly snaked toward the child as if the baby, Vasin Vara had named him, had received nourishment not only from blood, but also from darkness. Vasin's eyes flashed yellow with each of his wails. It's born of the shadow, Var, said Erdan, and looked as if he might drop the child. Look at it! The darkness moves toward it! Vasin's appearance and the coil of shadow around the umbilical made the claim hard to deny, but deny it Derek did. He's born of this woman, Erdan, and his name is Vasin. The child kicked, wailed. It must be killed, Derek, Erdan said, although uncertainty colored his tone, and he paled as he spoke. If the shadow of our learn of the abbey, killed, the midwife said, and put her hand to her mouth. A child? You cannot. No, Derek said, his hand still holding Varus, feeling it cool. We cannot. You heard me give this woman my word. I'll keep it. He let go of Varus' hand and held out his arms for the child. Give him to me. Erdan looked dumbfounded, his mouth half open. His two rotten front teeth looked as dark as Vasin's skin. Give him to me, Erdan. It's not a request. The priest blinked, handed the blood-slicked boy to Derek, then wiped his bloody hands on his yellow robes. Vasin stilled in Derek's hands. His small form felt awkward, fragile. Derek's hands were accustomed to holding hard steel and worn leather, not a babe. Shadows coiled around the baby, around Derek's forearms. You damn us all for the child of a stranger, Erdan said, his tone as much puzzled as angry. Derek did not bother to explain that he did not regard Vara as a stranger. I gave my word. I must take this to the abbot. I take no responsibility. Yes, Derek snapped, unable to keep the sharpness from his voice. You take no responsibility. I understand that quite well. Erdan tried to hold Derek's gaze, failed. Give me the knife, Derek said. What? The knife, man. I can't use a sword on the cord. 
Muttering, Erdan handed Derek the small knife he'd used to cut open Vara's womb. With it, Derek cut the shadow-veined umbilical, separating boy from mother, then wrapped him in one of the sheets stained with Vara's blood. You must find a— the priest began. Shut up, Erdan, Derek said. I know he'll require a wet nurse. I'm childless, not a dolt. Of course, Erdan said. He stared quizzically at the boy. The shadows, Derek. What is he if not a shade? What he is, Derek said, is my son. Holding the boy against his chest, Derek stepped to Vara's side and leaned over her so the boy could see his mother's face. Her mouth was frozen in a half-smile, her dark eyes open and staring. That is your mother, Vason. Her name was Vara. You know the abbot will consult the oracle, said Erdan. You risk much. Perhaps, Derek said. He stared down at the tiny, bloody child in his arms, the tiny nose, the strange yellow eyes, the dusky skin, the thin black hair slicked back on his small head. He resolved that he would not turn Vason over to the abbot, no matter what the oracle said. If the oracle sees danger in the child, I'll take him from here. But I won't abandon him. Erdan studied him for a moment, then said, I will see to the woman's burial, and we'll see what the abbot and oracle say. Perhaps I'm mistaken. I was surprised by the boy's appearance and spoke hastily. Harshly, perhaps. It's forgotten, Erdan. Derek said softly. He knew the priest to be a good man. I'll prepare her body for the rituals, said the midwife. I, too, was... The lantern light dimmed and the shadows deepened. The child uttered a single cry and burrowed his face into Derek's chest. Derek felt pressure on his ears, felt the air grow heavy and found it difficult to draw breath. The shadows in the far corner of the room swirled like a thunderhead, their hypnotic motion giving Derek an instant headache. He caught a pungent, spicy whiff of smoke, the smell somehow redolent of times old and gone. By the light, said the midwife, fear raising her voice an octave. The shadows coalesced, a presence manifested in the darkness. Shadow of our... Erdan hissed. I told you, Derek. Then to the midwife. Get aid. Go. She ran from the room without looking back, stumbling over the bloody sheets in her haste. The entire room fell deeper into darkness. The lantern's flame reduced to the light of a distant star. Cradling Vasin against his chest, Derek drew his blade and took a step backward toward the door. Go, Erdan, now. You have the child, Erdan said, taking his holy symbol in his hand. You go. An orange light flared in the darkness, the glowing embers of a pipe bowl. They lit the face of the man who resided in the shadows, a man who was the shadows. Long black hair hung loose around a swarthy, pockmarked visage. A goatee surrounded the sneer he formed around the pipe's stem. He was missing an eye, and the scarred empty socket looked like a hole that went on forever. The embers in the pipe went dark, and the man once more disappeared into the shadows. Maybe you should both stay, the man said, and the lock bolt on the door slid into place. Erdant looked at the door, at the man, back at the door, his rapid breathing audible. You won't need your blade, Knight of Lathander, the man said to Derek. Or is it a monitor these days? I haven't kept up. Erdan intoned the words to a prayer, and the pipe flared again, showing the man's face twisted in a frown. Close your mouth, the man said to Erdan, his voice as sharp-edged as a blade. Your words are empty. Erdan's mouth audibly shut. His eyes widened, and he doubled over and pawed at his face, moaning behind his lips as if they were sealed shut. 
Priests, the man said contemptuously, shaking his head as the light from the pipe died and the darkness engulfed him. Release him, Derek said, nodding at Erdan and advancing a step toward the man. The baby went still in the cradle of Derek's arm. The man took a long drag on his pipe, and the light showed him smiling. Well enough, he's released. Erdan opened his mouth, gasped. By the light! Hardly by the light, the man said. But you needn't fear. I'm not here for either of you. He nodded at Vason. I'm here for him. Derek cradled Vason more tightly to his chest. The boy remained eerily still, his yellow eyes like embers. Derek recalled Vara's words to him about a dark man who had changed the boy. He tightened his grip on his blade's hilt. You're the child's father? The man exhaled smoke and stepped closer to them, shedding some of the darkness that clung to him. He moved with the precision of a skilled combatant. Twin sabers hung from his belt, and the hilt of a larger sword, sheathed on its back, peeked over his shoulder. His one good eye fixed not on Derek, but on Vason, then on Vara. Derek could read nothing in his expression. Are you the father? Derek repeated. The dark man? Oh, I am a dark man, the man said, smiling softly. But I'm not the father, and I'm not the dark man you mean. At least, not exactly. He was suddenly standing directly before Derek. Had he crossed the room? The man extended a finger toward Vason. The baby still did not move, but stopped before touching him. A stream of shadow stretched from the man's fingertip and touched Vason, for a moment connecting man and child, an umbilical of another sort, perhaps. How peculiar, the man said, and withdrew his finger. How so? Derek asked and turned his body to shield the child from the man's touch. His father was Erevis Kale, the man said, still staring at Vason, and I've been searching for this child for some time. Derek heard the echo of some distant pain in the man's utterance of Kale's name. He knew the name, of course. His father, Reg, had spoken of Kale often had watched Kale destroy a godling at the Battle of Sakors. Erevis Kale, Avalar's traveling companion? Shadows spun about the man, his lips curled with contempt. Traveling companion? Is that how he's remembered? He shook his head. You've lost much more than half this world to the spell plague, and you'll lose more of it yet if the cycle runs its course. The cycle? Derek asked. You're Drasic Riven, said Erdan, his voice rapid, excited. By the light you are. The man inclined his head. Partly. Derek did not understand the cryptic comment. He'd heard Riven's name in tales, too. You can't take the child, Drasic Riven. I gave my word. Do you think you could stop me? Riven asked. Derek blinked and licked his lips, but held his ground. No, but I'd try. Riven leaned in close, studied Derek's face. His breath smelled of smoke. I believe you. That's good. You haven't aged, blurted Erdan, stepping closer to Riven, curiosity pinching his wrinkled face into a question. You're not Shadowvar? Riven turned to face Erdan, and the priest, blanched, retreated. My kinship with darkness runs deeper than that of the Shadowvar, priest. And I won't tell you again to keep your mouth closed. You're a witness to this, nothing more. Erdan's eyes widened even as his mouth closed. You knew my father, Derek said. He spoke of you sometimes. Just sometimes, eh? Riven drew on his pipe, a faint smile on his face, a distant memory in his eye. 
I confess I'm not surprised. When he talked about those days, he spoke mostly of Dawn Lord Abelar. Dawn Lord? Riven looked up and passed Derrick, his brow furrowed as he wrestled down some memory. What is that, some kind of holy title? Of course it's holy, said Erdan, his tone as defiant as he dared. His tomb is in the abbey. Pilgrims come from across Faroon to lay eyes on it. You question his holiness, Derrick said. Riven chuckled. He was a man to me, and men are never holy. You blaspheme, Erdan said. Riven sneered. Priest, I saw Dawn Lord Avalar run his blade through an unarmed man trying to surrender. How does that square with your understanding of the man? You lie, Erdan exclaimed, then realizing what he had said, backed up a step. Often, Riven acknowledged, but not about that. Maybe you think killing Malkur Forin made him less holy. You might be right, but it made him more of a man, and that murder is why you have an oracle. Derek shook his head. I don't understand. The oracle is Avalar's son. You miss my meaning, Riven said and shook his head. No matter. Myths sometimes outrun the man. Riven took a draw on his pipe, blew out a cloud of fragrant smoke. He looked at Derek, his eye focused on a memory. I once promised your father that we would share a smoke, but other things got in the way. How did Reg die? Well, I hope. A fist formed in Derek's throat, old grief blossoming into new pain. He pulled Vason tighter against his chest. For a moment he considered refusing to answer, but changed his mind. He died an old man in his sleep. The light was in him. Riven's face did not change expression, although his eye seemed to see something Derrick could not. It pleases me to hear it. Voices and shouts carried into the room from the hall outside. Riven drew on his pipe, unconcerned. What do you want? Derek asked. Why are you here? Riven jerked the large blade from the sheath on his back. Derek lurched backward, his own blade held before him. Vason began to cry. Erdan froze, rooted to the spot. To see the boy, and to give him his father's weapon. Riven flipped the weapon, took it by the blade, and offered Derek the hilt. This is Weave Shear. The weapon was as black as a starless night. Shadows curled about its length, extended outward from the blade toward Vason. The child extended a hand, cooed. That's a weapon of darkness, Erdan said and made the sign of the rising sun, the three interior fingers raised like sunbeams. That it is, answered Riven. Derrick stared at the blade. The boy won't need it. No? No, he has me. Riven scowled, shadows swirling around him. He lowered the weapon and advanced. Although short of stature, Riven nevertheless seemed to reach to the ceiling. Derek knew he had overstepped, and his mouth went dry. His heart pounded. You'll take this blade, and you'll keep it safe. And when that boy is of age... You'll tell him who his father was, and you'll give him that weapon. I owe Kale that much, and so do you, all of you. I... Nod your God's damned stubborn head, son of Reg, or I swear I'll remove it from your neck. Derek did not care to test whether the threat was earnest. He fought down a prideful impulse and nodded. Riven offered him the blade once more, and Derek took it. Shadows curled around his wrist. He felt as if the weapon was coated in oil. It seemed to squirm in his grip. Well enough, Riven said, and the shadows about him slowed. He took a step back. We're done here now. Riven turned 
and shadows started to gather around his form, Derrick could barely see him. Why don't you take him? Erdan blurted. Shut up, Erdan, Derrick said. Riven did not turn. Shadows curled around him, slow, languid. Because I'm hunted, and my only safe haven is no place for a child. He'll be safe here for a time, and he should have what peace this life can afford. He paused, staring at the child. I fear it won't be much. I'll return if I can, but I'm doubtful that will be possible. Meanwhile, you keep him, and you prepare him. Prepare him for what? For what's coming. What do you mean, what's coming? Riven shook his head. I don't know for certain. Others will be looking for him. Why? Because of who his father was, because grudges die harder than God's, and because the cycle of night is trying to find its end. He's the key. I don't understand. Nor I. Not fully. Not yet. Someone's scribbling new words in the book of the world, and I was never much of a reader. He smiled, and it reached his good eye. Two and two, it seems, still sum to four, even in this ruined world. He got that right, at least. What? Derek's head was spinning. He? Someone I once knew. Riven shook his head, as if to clear it of an old memory. I can't stay any longer. My presence compromises the child's safety. He looked around. Your oracle has done good work here. This valley is peaceful. I especially like the lakes. Tell the oracle I was here. Tell him to do his part, and ask him if he still enjoys jugglers. What? He'll know what I mean. The darkness gathered, but before it obscured Riven entirely, he turned and looked at Derek, at Vason. What's his name, the boy? Vason, Derek said, and felt Vason's yellow eyes fix on him when he spoke the word. Vason, Riven said, testing out the word. A good name. Well met, Vason. Welcome to the world. When we meet again, I think you'll not be pleased to see me. Derek blinked, and Riven was gone. The room lightened. Vason began to cry. Erdan let out a long breath. What just happened? I'm not certain. That wasn't a man. No, Derek said. That was not. Chapter 1 Elint, the Year of the Awakened Sleepers, 1484 DR Glaciers as old as creation collided, vied, and splintered, the crack of ancient ice like the snap of dry bones. The smell of brimstone and burning souls wafted up from rivers of fire that veined the terrain. Cania's freezing gusts bore the innumerable screams of the damned, spicing the air with their pain. Towering insectoid gelugons, their white carapaces hard to distinguish from the ice, patrolled the banks of the rivers. Their appetite for agony was insatiable, and with their hooked pole arms they ripped and tore at the immolated damned who flailed and shrieked in the flames. Mephistopheles perched atop an ice-capped crag, a quarter league high, and stared down at his realm of ice and fire and pain. Plains of jagged ice stretched away in all directions. Black mountains hazed with smoke scraped a glowing red sky lit by a distant pale sun. And he ruled it all, or almost all, his gaze fixed on the mound of shadow-shrouded ice far below that had defied his will for a century, and his eyes narrowed. His anger stirred the embers of his power, and the air crackled around him, 
baleful emanations of the divinity he'd stolen from the god Mask. Staring at the shadowy cairn, he sensed that events were picking up speed, fates being decided, events determined, but he couldn't see them. Matters were fouled, and he suspected the shadowy cairn had something to do with it. Permutations, he said, his voice as deep and dark as a chasm. Endless permutations. He had schemed for decades to obtain a fraction of the divine power he now held, intending to use the power he'd gained in a coup against Asmodeus, the lord of the Nessus, a coup that would have resulted in Mephistopheles ruling the Nine Hells. But events on one of the worlds of the Prime had made a joke of his plans. The spell plague had ripped through the world of Toril, recombining it with its sister world, Abir, and causing chaos among gods and godlings. A half-murdered god had literally fallen through the astral sea and into the ninth hell. Asmodeus had finished the murder and absorbed the divinity. Mephistopheles, who had plotted for decades to become divine, had managed to take only a fraction of a fraction of a lesser god's power, while the lord of the ninth had become a full god through luck, by chance, and Mephistopheles was once more second in hell. Worst of all, he feared that Asmodeus had recently learned of his plans— Mephistopheles's spies in Nessus's court spoke of mustering legions, of Asmodeus's growing ire. A summons had reached Mephistar, Mephistopheles's iron keep. Asmodeus's words had been carried on the vile, forked tongue of the lord of Nessus's sometime messenger, the she-bitch succubus Malconthet. His Majesty, the Supreme Overlord of the Hells, Asmodeus the Terrible, requires His Grace's presence before His throne in Nessus. Supreme, you said? Shall I tell His Majesty that you take issue with his title? Mephistopheles bit back his retort. He sends me Hell's Harlot to convey a summons... To what end is my presence required? Malconthet had ignored the question, offering only, His Majesty wished me to inform you that time is of the essence. And my time is limited. I will attend when I'm able. You will attend within a fortnight, or His Majesty will be forced to assume that you are in rebellion. Those are the words of his majesty. Mephistopheles had glared at her while his court had muttered and tittered. Get out! Now! Malconthet had bowed, smirking, and exited the court, leaving Mephistopheles to stew in uncertainties, his court to gossip in possibilities. Mephistopheles had managed to put off a reckoning with Asmodeus for decades. He'd made excuse after excuse, but the Lord of the Ninth's patience had finally worn thin. Mephistopheles had little time and few options. He wasn't ready. Far below, the cairn of ice mocked him. Shadows leaked from it, dribbled out of its cracks in languid streams— Often he'd tried to burn his way to the bottom of the cairn, but the ice would not yield. He'd had hundreds of whip-driven devils tear into the mound with weapons and tools, all to no avail. He'd attempted to magically transport himself within the hill and failed. He could not even scry what lay at its bottom. And yet he had his suspicions about what lay under the shadow-polluted ice— Erevis Kale, saying the name, kindled his anger to flame. Mephistopheles had torn out Kale's throat on Cania's ice and taken the divine spark of mask then possessed by Kale. Then, while Mephistopheles had been distracted by his triumph, Kale's ally, Drasic Riven, himself possessed of another divine spark, 
had materialized and nearly decapitated Mephistopheles. The pain remained fresh in Mephistopheles's mind. His regeneration had taken hours, and by then, Kale's body had been covered by the cairn that vexed him so. Unable to destroy the cairn, finally Mephistopheles had simply forbade anyone from approaching it. Intricate, powerful wards allowed no one to go near it but Mephistopheles himself. Staring at the cairn, his anger overflowed his control. He leaped from his perch and spread his wings, power and rage shrouding him. Millions of damned souls and lesser devils looked up and then down, cowering, sinking into their pain rather than look upon the Lord of Cania enraged. He tucked his wings and plummeted toward the cairn, Erebus Kale's tomb. He slammed into it with enough velocity and force to send a shockwave of power radiating outward in all directions. Snow and ice shards exploded into the air. The damned of Cania uttered a collective groan. He looked down, his breathing like a bellows, his rage unabated. The hill remained unmarred a mound of opaque ice veined with lines of shadow. He aimed his palms at the cairn's surface and blasted the ice with hellfire. Flame and smoke poured from his hands, engulfing the cairn, the black blast cloaking him in fire and heat. He stood in its midst, unaffected, pouring forth power at the object of his hate. Around him ice hissed, fogging the air as it melted. Shadows poured from the hill in answer, a dark churn that coated him in night. The ice renewed itself as fast as his fires could melt it. The shadows swirled amid the storm of power and snow and ice, mocked him, defied him. He channeled fire and power at the hill, relenting only long enough to let the shadows disperse, the spray of ice and snow to settle. And when it did... He saw what he always saw, the unmarred cairn. It was protected somehow, and he did not understand it. Something was happening, something he could not see. Mask was in the center of it. The cairn was in the center of it, and he could not so much as melt its ice. And now, and now, Asmodeus was coming for him. Ropes of shadow leaked from thin cracks in the cairn's ice and spiraled around Mephistopheles's body. He threw back his head, stretched his wings, flexed his claws, and roared his frustration at the cloud-shrouded red sky. The sound boomed across his realm, the thunder of his rage. Distant glaciers cracked in answer. Volcanoes spat ash into the sky. When at last he was spent... He fell into a crouch atop the cairn, put his chin in his hand, and considered his options. He saw only two courses. He could ask forgiveness of Asmodeus and abase himself before the Lord of Nessus, for swearing rebellion, or he could obtain more power, enough to equal Asmodeus's, and so empowered pursue his planned coup. He much preferred the latter— and yet if he moved to obtain more divine power, he'd be moving blindly. Mask had put in place some kind of scheme. Was the cairn not evidence of that? And Mephistopheles did not want to stumble into it and inadvertently serve Mask's ends. Mephistopheles feared losing the divinity he'd already gained in an effort to gain more, for he had no doubt that Mask had plotted for his own eventual return but he had little choice. Time had grown short. Over the last hundred years, he'd scoured the multiverse for information about Erebus Kale and Mask, trying to suss out Mask's play so that he could thwart it. He'd tortured mortal and immortal beings alike, eavesdropped on the whispered conversations of exarchs and godlings, listened to the secrets carried in the planar currents, wrung what information he could from the nether with his divinations. And he'd learned only one thing, one tantalizing clue. Erebus Kale had a son. He'd come to believe over the years that the son had something to do with the secret buried under the ice, his ice, that the son was at the center of Mask's scheme, 
and that if he could find the sun, he could end Mask's plans, whatever they were, at a stroke. Then he'd have the freedom to move against the two men who, like Mephistopheles, held fractions of Mask's power. He'd pacted with many mortals over the decades, promising them rewards if they brought word of Erebus Kale's son. He'd bargained with so many that he'd lost track of them. But none had ever located Kale's son. It was as though the sun had simply disappeared. And now events had at last outrun Mephistopheles' ability to plan ahead of them. He could no longer wait to learn the full picture of Mask's scheme. He could no longer spare time searching for Kale's son. As Modeus was coming for him, as he did for any who dared plot rebellion, Mephistopheles would need more power to face the Lord of Nessus, and he knew where he could get it. Drasic Riven and Rivalin Tan Thule each possessed a spark of Mask's stolen divinity. If Mephistopheles killed them, he could take their divinity and face Asmodeus as a peer. He looked down at the cairn, imagined Erebus Kale's frozen body buried somewhere under its ice. He tapped the ice with a clawed finger. I haven't forgotten your son, and I won't, and your dead god won't be coming back whatever his schemes. For answer... Only more shadows. He shook them off, stood, cupped his hands before his mouth, and put a message in the wind for Duke Adonides, his major domo, blowing it in the direction of Mephistar. The gust tore over Cania's icy plains. Prepare the legions to march on the shadow fell. Drasic Riven is to die. Riven stood in the uppermost room of the central tower of his citadel, a fortress of shadows and dark stone carved in relief into the sheer face of a jagged peak. The plaintive, hopeful prayers of Mask's few remaining worshippers in Toral bounced around in his head. The background noise of his existence, a din that made him want to dig out his remaining eye with his thumbs. "'Lord of shadows, hear my words!' From the darkness I speak your name, Shadow Lord. Return to us, Lord of Stealth. I'm not your damned god, he said, and drew on his pipe. As best he could, he pushed the voices to the back of his consciousness. There'd been many such voices a century earlier, but they'd gradually faded, and there were only a few now. He wondered, not for the first time, if Rivelin or Mephistopheles who also possessed some of Mask's power, also heard them, or if the fading hopes of Mask's faithful were his burden alone to bear. He suspected the latter, and he wondered what that meant. Annoyed, he exhaled a cloud of pungent smoke and let his gaze follow it out the tall, narrow window and down to the shrouded land beyond his citadel. The starless black vault of the plain's sky hung over a landscape of gray and black, where lived the dark simulacra of actual things. Shadows and wraiths and specters and ghosts and other undead hung in the air around the citadel or prowled the foothills and plains near it. So numerous their glowing eyes looked like swarms of fireflies. He felt the darkness in everything he could see felt it as an extension of himself, and the feeling made him too big by half. The shadow fell had been his home for the past one hundred years, more his home now than Faroon, he supposed, and the realization annoyed him further. He'd never wanted to be a god, never wanted to spend his days in shadow, listening to the whines of the faithful caught up in the machinations of beings he hadn't even known existed when he'd been only a man. Back then, he'd wanted only to drink and eat and gamble and enjoy women. But now... Now he still wanted to drink and eat and gamble and womanize, but the divinity squirmed within him, a toothy thing that chewed at the corners of his humanity, 
eating away at the man to make room for the god, and unless he did something soon, it would consume his humanity altogether. He hated it, hated what it had done to him, and for what it insisted he hear and know. For as the divinity opened holes in the man, knowledge not his own filled the abscesses. The fractional divinity within him revealed its secrets only gradually, a slow drip of revelation that had been unfolding over decades, a plotting education in godhood. He wondered if that, too, was his burden alone to bear, because if Mephistopheles and Rivelin did not experience it the same way, well, what did that mean? At the least it meant that new memories bubbled up from time to time, popped in his mindscape, and loosed their stinking contents into his consciousness. Riven consulted them not as a man looking back on his own experiences, but as a scholar would a scroll written in a language in which he was barely fluent. Mask kept his secrets even from Riven, letting him in on the game only a little at a time. And the game, it turned out, had been a long con. Mask had played them all, including his mother, Shar. Mask had been Shar's herald on Toral, the prophet who started her cycle of night, a divine process that had repeated itself countless times across the multiverse, and had, in the process, destroyed countless worlds. And each time, on each world, the cycle ended the same way, had to end the same way, with Shar consuming the divinity of her herald. The divine cannibalism of her own offspring allowed the Lady of Loss to incarnate fully, and once she did, she reduced everything in the world to nothing. Cycles of night had left the multiverse pockmarked with holes. Voids of nothingness were the footprints Char left as she stalked through reality. Riven knew the amount of life she'd destroyed in the process, and it nauseated even him. And apparently it had been too much for Mask also, for when it came to Toral, he hadn't played his part. The cycle must be broken, Riven said, the words exiting his mouth but not feeling at all like his own words. On Toral, Shar had consumed only a portion of Mask's divinity, for he'd hidden the rest away, and what she'd consumed was not enough to finish the cycle not enough to allow her to incarnate. Mask had trapped his mother halfway through her incarnation. She existed now within a hole in the center of the Ordulan maelstrom, raging, gazing out through a window of nothingness at a world that had defied her, at least temporarily. Mask had frozen Toral's cycle of night. But Shar was still hungry, and she wanted the rest of her meal. Riven possessed some of Mask's divinity, Mephistopheles possessed some, and Rivalin Tanthul, Shar's night seer on Faroon, possessed the third portion. The divinity could only come out of them one way, with their deaths. And as much as Riven hated godhood, he hated being dead even more. He wouldn't be feeding himself to Shar any time soon. He'd learned more as Mask's memories showed him the game. He finally remembered what he'd done, what Mask had done to Kale's son, Vason, and he'd learned of Mask's plan to return. To end the cycle, resurrect the Herald, he said, the words once more like foreign things on his lips. Mask had changed Vason in the womb, given him a very special ability— and pushed him forward in time to hide him. Vason was the key. Vason could release the divinity in Rivelin, Riven, and Mephistopheles, and do it without killing them. But he had to do it with all three of them present, and he had to do it while Shar looked on. That meant it had to be done in the Ordulan Maelstrom. If it went right, Mask would reincarnate. If it went wrong, the cycle of night would restart and run its course. This should have been Kale, Riven muttered.
Riven had never had Kale's mind for plans, and he struggled to keep everything straight in his head. I should have died, not him. But then again, Kale wasn't dead. Mask had seen fit to reveal that bit of information to Riven recently. Riven had wrestled with the implications for days. He didn't quite see how it fit into the rest. All he knew at this point was that Kale was alive, alive and trapped under hell's ice for a century. Damn, damn, damn. Mask had either kept Kale alive somehow when he should have died, or brought him back to life immediately after his death. Riven didn't know which, and didn't understand why. He didn't even understand how. He presumed that Kale, too, must have still had some of Mask's divinity, a tiny sliver that Mephistopheles hadn't taken. That was the only explanation. Riven's head spun as he tried to think through all the players and their plots. Everything was complicated, wheels within wheels, plans within plans, within plans. And somehow Riven had to sort it out and end up on the right end of things. Yet he suspected that Mask had kept still more secrets from him. Riven could spend a decade planning, then learn something new tomorrow that changed everything, put everything in a new light. He put it out of his mind for the moment, looked out on his realm, and tried to enjoy his pipe. Flashes of viridian lightning periodically knifed through the dense churn of low clouds, painting the landscape for a moment in sickly green. Gusts of wind summoned dust as fine as ash from the foothills, whipped through the plains and caused the twisted grass and oddly angled branches on the Shadowfell's trees to hiss and whisper. The miasmic, gloomy air, soupy with shadows, thronged with undead, pressed down on Riven's mood. He'd long ago had enough of the Shadowfell, but he left the plain only when absolutely necessary. His close connection to it meant that he was strongest when here, weaker when away. He knew Mephistopheles and Rivelin both would kill him if they could, each for their own reasons, and he dared not give them a moment's weakness to exploit, not unless he must. They'd both tried to scry him from time to time. He'd felt their divinations pawing at him, making the air around him charged and itchy, but the spells never quite latched onto him. His divinity allowed him to slip almost all scrying. But the Lord of Cania and the Nightseer knew where he was, and he knew where they were. The three of us, he said, stalemated. His voice drew one of his dogs, bitches he'd had for decades. She pushed through the door behind him, padded over, and plopped down at his feet with a tired exhalation. His mood immediately improved. Her short tail beat against the smooth stone floor. When he looked down and smiled around his pipe, she flopped on her side to show her age-fattened belly. Shadows slipped out of her flesh. She'd been a tan, white, and brown mutt once, but years in the shadows, years with Riven, had turned her dark, the shadow fell had seeped into her, the same as it had into Riven, turning them both into shadows of themselves. She whined for attention, tail still thumping, and Riven took the hint. He scratched her chest and stomach, and she answered with happy sighs and more wags. He tried not to follow the implications of her graying muzzle and labored breathing. Unlike Riven, she was not divine, not immortal. Shadow stuff had extended her life, but it would not keep her alive forever. I shouldn't have brought you here, he said, and she just wagged happily. He should have let his girls die in peace in Faroon, still themselves, still normal. Her sister, also as black as ink, caught wind of the petting and ambled in. She plopped down and showed her stomach, too, and Riven surrendered fully. He set his pipe on the floor and vigorously scratched and petted each of them. They rolled over and put their heads on his legs, licked his hand. Shadows spun around all three of them. He smiled, 
thinking how they must look, the dark god and his fat, tail-wagging shadow hounds. You're good girls, he said, patting their heads, stroking their muzzles. He would have been dead inside without them, he knew that. He sometimes felt that they were the sole thread connecting him back to his humanity. And he missed his humanity. He missed need, the satisfaction that came from striving for ordinary things and achieving them. Divinity had expanded his mind, but dulled his body to pleasure. He could partake of food, drink, and women, but he experienced all of them at a distance, almost as an observer, not a participant. The curse of a divine mind, he supposed. For some reason, the pleasure he felt smoking his pipe remained sharp, so he smoked often. Jack Fleet, an old companion of his, would have smiled to see it. All right, girls, he said, and patted each of them one last time before grabbing his pipe and standing. They watched him stand, forlorn, as dogs do. He drew on his pipe, thinking, planning. He put things in place as best he knew how. Now he had to wait for Vason, he'd be over thirty by now, to come to him, for he dared not visit Kale's son again. After that, he had to rescue Kale. Then he had to resurrect a god or destroy the world, one or the other. Damn, he said. He thought of his old life, thought of Kale, Jack, and Mags. Mags. He made up his mind. He'd need Mags, someone he could count on, someone he could trust. He'd risk leaving the Shadowfell one more time before all the pieces started to move. Magadan stood behind the bar of his tavern, wiping one tin tankard after another with a dirty rag. He'd closed an hour earlier, and his now empty place, a rickety tap room he'd named the Tenth Hell to amuse himself, felt hollow. It still carried an echo of the day's stink, though, Smoke and beer and sweat and bad stew. Darlin, and indeed all of Faroon, had changed much over the eighty years he'd owned the place, but his tavern remained more or less as it was since the day he'd first bought it. He'd done nothing but minimal maintenance. It was frozen in the past, like him. He, too, had changed little over the years. He'd let his horns and his hair grow long, and he'd grown more powerful in the invisible art, but little else. He was passing time, nothing more and nothing less. He served his ale and his stew, his weapons and gear stored under the bar, while he waited. Damned if he knew for what. Something. The tavern was a two-fireplace, decrepit wooden building that attracted a decrepit clientele who didn't mind a half-fiend barkeep, the building nestled against Derloon's eastern wall, squalid and lonely. If the Shadowvar and their Sembian allies ever marched on Derlin, which had declared itself an independent city decades ago, they'd come from the east, and Magadan's tavern would be among the first buildings to burn. Maybe there was meaning in that. The threat of war with the Shadowvar had loomed over Derlin for decades— as much a shadow on the city as was the miasmic air of neighboring Sembia. Over time, the populace had gotten so used to the threat of an attack that it had gone from danger to jest, as probable as Sakors floating up to the walls, they'd say, in references to something deemed unlikely. But the jests had been fewer of late. Teamsters and peddlers and soldiers spoke in quiet tones of skirmishes in the perpetual dark of the Sembian plains, of Shadowvar forces blockading the lands south of the way of the Manticore, of battles being fought in the Dales. An open call for mercenaries had gone out from Sembia, and Magadan imagined shiploads of blades for hire sailing into the ports of Selgaunt and Serloon. The war would eventually reach Derlin and its towering obsidian walls. If the Dales fell to Sembia's forces, Derlin would fall next. Magadan didn't think it would be long, 
Sakors had been sighted once or twice on the distant horizon, floating on its inverted mountain, hanging in the dark Sembian sky like a promise of doom. Sakors. Magadan had not actually seen it himself in many years, but then he didn't need to. He'd seen it long ago and dreamed of it often. The sentient crystalline mithler that powered the city and kept it afloat, it called itself the Source, had permanent residence in Magadan's mind. Long ago, Magadan had nearly lost himself in the Source's vast consciousness. He'd augmented his mind magic with its power and become a godling, at least for a moment. In the process, he'd also become a monster. But his friends had saved him, and he'd stood with Erevis Kale and Drasic Riven and defeated a god. Thinking of those times made him smile. He considered those days the finest in his life, yet things felt incomplete to him. That was the reason he could not move on. That was the reason he tended bar and bided his time. The source still called to Magadan, of course, but because he'd grown stronger over the decades, its call no longer pulled at him with the insistence it once did. Instead, the source's mental touch felt more like a gentle solicitation, an invitation. He could have blocked them, a simple mind screen would have shielded him, but the source's touch had become familiar over the years, a comforting reminder, and a connection to a past he wasn't yet ready to let go. Clay lamps burned on a few of the tavern's time-scarred tables, casting shaky shadows on the slatted wood walls. He stared into the dark corners of the room, a little game he played with himself, and let a doomed flash of hope spark in his mind. He gave the hope voice before it died. Kale? Riven? Nothing. Shadows danced, but none spoke. Kale was dead. Riven was a man become a god, and Magadan hadn't seen him in almost a century. He blew out a sigh and hung all but one of the tankards he'd cleaned on their pegs behind the bar. He filled the one he'd kept from the half-full hogshead and raised it in a salute. After draining it, he set to closing down the tavern for another night, all of it routine. His life had become rote. He went to the tables, each of them wobbling on uneven legs, and blew out the lamps. The low fire in the hearth provided the room's only light. He checked the stew pot on its hook near the hearth, saw that almost nothing remained, and decided to leave cleaning it for the morning. He took the iron poker from the wall, intending to spread the coals and head to his garret next door, where he'd lay awake and think of the past, then fall asleep and dream of the source. All at once the air in the room grew heavy, pressed against his ears, and a cough sounded from behind him. He whirled around, brandishing the poker. Instinct caused him to draw on his mental energy, and a soft red glow haloed his head. The darkness in the tavern had deepened so that he could not see into the corners of the room. He stood in a bubble of light cast by the faint glow of his power and the fire's embers. He slid to his left, holding the poker defensively, and put his back against the hearth. He'd left his damned weapons behind the bar. Show yourself, he said. He charged the metal poker with mental energy enough to penetrate a dragon's scales. Its end glowed bright red. The light cast shadows on the walls. I said, show yourself. You carry that instead of a blade now? said a voice from his right. Megadon whirled toward the voice, and shock almost caused him to drop the poker. Riven! The darkness in the room relented. The weightiness in the air did not. Nice that someone remembers that name, Riven said. He stepped from the darkness, emerged from it as if stepping out from behind dark curtains, all compact movement and blurry edges. Sabers hung from his belt, a sneer hung from his lips. He hadn't aged, but then he wouldn't have. Magadan reminded himself that he was not talking to a man, but a god. 
Riven glided across the room, his footsteps soundless, and Magadan could not think of a single word to say. Riven smiled through his goatee and extended his hand. Magadan hesitated, then took it. Shadows crawled off Riven and onto Magadan's forearm. It's good to see you again, Mags. I don't have long. My being here puts you at risk. At risk? From what? I don't... Riven was already nodding. I know you don't. I know. And that's as it must be. Mags, the cycle of night either succeeds or fails. And that's up to us. Maybe. Magadan's head was spinning. His thoughts were inchoate. The cycle of night? Riven nodded, started pacing, dragging his fingertips over the tabletops as he moved, the shadows clinging to his form. This is a shithole, Mags. What? Riven chuckled. I caught you by surprise here. Apologies. I need you to be ready when I call. I just need someone I can rely on. Can you do that? Magadan could not quite gather his runaway thoughts. He resisted the impulse to cough out another stupid question. I don't know what you're talking about. Riven looked almost sympathetic. I know you don't, but that's good for now. I don't even know what I'm talking about half the time because they're not my words and only half my thoughts. Magadan blinked, confused. Riven looked at him directly, his regard like a punch. Can you be ready, Mags? I don't know. Riven nodded, as if he'd expected ambivalence. Where's your pack, your bow and blade? Magadan started to find his conversational footing. Behind the bar. A barkeep, Riven said, chuckling. Not how I saw things going for you. Not how I saw things going for me either, Magadan admitted with a shrug. It's been a hundred years, Riven. You show up, you talk about things as if you know what they are, but I don't, and... I found Kale's son. Thirty years ago, I found him. The words stopped Magadan cold. Found him where? He was alive thirty years ago? He'd have been over seventy years old. Riven shook his head. A pipe was in his hand, although Magadan had not seen him take it out. You have a match? Magadan shook his head. Gods, Mags, you used to be prepared for anything. He shook his head. No matter. He put the pipe in his mouth, and it lit. He inhaled, the glow of the bowl showing the pockmarks in his face, the vacancy where his left eye should have been. The smoke joined the shadows in curling around him. He's not seventy, Riven said. He was newborn thirty years ago. It's a long story. How could he have been newborn thirty years ago? Kale would have been dead seventy years by then. A smile curled the corners of Riven's mouth. I told you it was a long story. I've nothing but time. Riven nodded, blew out a cloud of smoke. But I don't. You're telling me he's still alive, the son? He's alive, and he's the key, Mags. Magadan shook his head, unable to make sense of things. The key to what? The key to fixing all this, undoing it, making it as it should have been, stopping Shar's cycle of night. But it'll have to happen in Ordulin. Magadan was still not following, although the mention of Ordulin turned Magadan's mind to the Shadowvar, to Rivalin Tanthul, Shar's Nightseer. Magadan had been captured and tortured by Rivalin and his brother Brennus long ago. Rivalin and Shadowvar are involved? Riven nodded. More than involved, Rivalin's trying to complete the cycle, and he's clever, Mags, very clever but maybe too clever this time. Your father's involved in this, too, although he's a bit player, and so are you, or at least you are now. My father? The last time Magadan had seen his father, Mephistopheles, the archdevil had flayed his soul. He banished the memory. You all right? Riven asked. Magadan nodded. 
Where's Kale's son? Riven's eye looked past Magadan to the east. He's out there in the dark. A light in darkness is what they say. He's safe, though. You tell me where he is. I can go to him. Keep him safe. Riven shook his head. No, you can't. He's where he's supposed to be. Now he's got to come to me. Besides, I need you here. For what? I told you, to be ready when I call. What does that even mean? You're talking in circles. Riven grinned around his pipe stem. I don't know what it means yet. I'm figuring this out as we go. I just know I want you ready. I'll need your help. Just like always, just like it was back before... everything. Like it was back before, Magadan echoed. He pointed with his chin at the stew pot still hanging over the embers. Do you eat, now that you are what you are? There's a little stew over there, or an ale, maybe. I eat, Riven said, losing his smile. But it's not the same anymore. It's like I can't help but analyze instead of just enjoy it. He shook his head. It's complicated. Magadan put a hand on Riven's shoulder in sympathy, but Riven pushed it aside and cocked his head as if he'd heard something. And a half-beat later, a loud thud sounded from above, a powerful impact on the roof that cracked a crossbeam and shook the entire tavern. Dust and debris sprinkled down. Magadan looked up. What? Another thud. The crossbeam cracked further and the entire roof sagged. Shit, Riven said, exhaling smoke. The pipe was already gone and he had his sabers in hand. Magadan had not even seen him draw them. A heavy tread on the roof, creaking wood, a scrabbling on the roof tiles as of blade or claw. They must have followed me. Riven said, taking position beside Magadan, his body coiled, shadows swirling. They must have been watching me in the shadow fell somehow, waiting. Or maybe they've been here the whole time. See anything unusual recently? What? No. Another thump, more splintering and dust, more tension. Magadan drew on his store of mental energy, shaped it formed it into a cocoon of transparent force that surrounded his body and would protect him as well as plate armor. He tightened his grip on the poker, looked up at the bowed roof. Who followed you? he whispered. Agents of your father, Riven said, his voice low and edged. Devils then. A crash and a sharp, prolonged splintering as the roof gave way entirely— the main crossbeam hit the floor with a boom in the process crushing a table and two chairs. Tiles and wood planks and two winged fiendish forms poured down through the hole. The devils hit the floor in a crouch, narrow eyes on Riven and Magadan. Tridents clutched in clawed hands, membranous wings tucked behind their back. The fiends, Magadan recognized them as Malabranche, stood taller than even a very tall man. Thick muscles clotted in bunches under their gray, leathery skin. Each wore ornate vam braces and a pauldron over one shoulder. Two curved horns jutted from their brows, overlooking vaguely reptilian features. Their oversized mouths had a pronounced underbite, and a pair of tusks stabbed upward from their lower jaw. Shadows are the same here as they are in the Shadowfell, one of them said, its voice gravelly. The other grabbed a chair and hurled it at Riven. Riven ducked under it casually. The chair smashed against the hearth and splintered, spilling the stew pot. They're about the same, Riven said with a sneer. The devils opened their mouths in a deep growl. Licks of flame danced between the tines of their tridents. They can't get out alive, Riven said. Neither escapes. Understood, Magadan said. He pulled from the deep pool of mental energy that filled his core, shaped it into a field of latent force, and transferred it once more to the tip of the poker he held. A halo of red energy formed around the point. The devils leaped at them, the tree trunks of their legs propelling them forward like shot quarrels. 
Magadan hurled the energized poker at one of them while Riven bounded forward with preternatural speed, meeting the larger Malabranque's charge with a charge of his own. The fireplace poker flew true and slammed into the smaller fiend in mid-leap. The latent power with which Magadan had charged the tip allowed the makeshift weapon to strike with exaggerated force. The impact knocked the fiend out of the air and into a table. It bellowed with pain and rage. The poker sunk a hand span into its hide. Meanwhile, Riven faced the other devil, his blades a whirlwind of steel, his movements trailing shadows. He sidestepped the devil's charge and a stab from its trident, leaped over another stab, slashed and spun and cut. The devil retreated under Riven's onslaught, bumping into tables, stumbling into chairs, its trident too slow to parry the speed of Riven's assault. Two clay lamps hit the ground and shattered, spilling their oil. Riven, his speed and skill that of a god, carved flesh from the devil in gory ribbons. The creature roared, Icor spraying from its wounds, and stabbed at Riven with its trident again and again, hitting only empty air. Its trident scraped the floor, and the flames between the tines ignited the oil. The devil Magadan had knocked prone, jerked the poker from its flesh, and intentionally toppled another table into the flames. The lamp atop it broke, spilling its oil. Tables caught fire, a chair, another chair, the floor. Smoke clotted the air. Magadan cursed and sprinted across the common room. The fiend leaped to its feet and gave chase. Magadan jumped over the bar, sending two tankards and a plate clattering to the floor, and landed in a heap on the other side. He scrambled to his feet and looked back to see the fiend coiling for a leap. Drawing from his reserve of mental energy, Magadan formed it into a spike of force that bound the devil's leg to the floor. The fiend leaped anyway, and the floor planks that now adhered to its clawed feet tore loose, the dislodged nails and wood screeching like the damned. Thrown off balance, the fiend fell forward into a table, splintering it under its weight. Behind it, more smoke and flames, riven and devil dueling in the flames. The room would soon be an inferno. Magadan grabbed for his bow and quiver, and had both in hand by the time the devil had regained its feet. Magadan knocked, charged his arrow with mental energy, drew and fired into its face. The missile sunk into the devil's throat and it screamed, staggered back, clutching at its neck. As it did, it made a wild throw with its flaming trident, and the huge weapon struck Magadan squarely in the chest. Although the tines did not penetrate the field of force that sheathed him, the sheer power of the blow drove him backward against the wall, cracked ribs, and drove the air from his lungs. Dislodged by the impact, tankards rained from their pegs. The hog's head fell to the floor, broke open, and covered the floor in beer. Gasping for air, coughing on the growing cloud of smoke, Magadan staggered back to the bar and reached for another arrow from his quiver. The devil he'd shot spun frenetically around the burning common room, toppling tables and chairs, screaming, its breathing an audible squeal through the hole Magadan had put in its throat. Behind the wounded devil, Riven continued his dissection of the larger devil. Riven's blades were a blur, slashing, stabbing, cutting. The devil roared and spun, lashed out with claws, trident, even a kick, but nothing landed. Riven was too fast, too precise. The fiend bled dark ichor from dozens of wounds. Its flesh hung in scraps from its body. A final cross-cut from Riven's saber severed its head. As Magadan knocked another arrow, the surviving devil finally pulled the arrow from its throat, screaming in agony. It fixed its eyes on Magadan, its huge chest rising and falling. It spit a mouthful of black ichor and rushed him. Magadan sighted and powered his arrow with enough mental energy to fell a horse. The tip glowed an angry, hot red. He picked a spot between the devil's eyes and prepared to draw. Before he could loose his shot, Riven stepped through the shadows, covering the length of the room in a single stride. He appeared in front of the devil, his saber sheathed. He held a thin loop of reified shadow in his hands. He dodged a surprised slash from the fiend's claw, spun, and looped the line of shadow around the fiend's neck. 
Before the devil could respond, Riven leaped atop the fiend's back, wrapped his legs around the devil's midsection, and pulled the line taut around the fiend's throat. The devil reared back, eyes wide, choking, gasping for breath, shooting a mist of blood from the hole Magadan had put in its throat. It spun, reached back to claw at Riven, staggered around the room, bumping into tables, chairs, walking through the flames. Throughout, Riven rode its back in calm, deadly silence, the shadow garrote choking out its life. Magadan relaxed, set his bow on the bar, and his body lit up with pain, the suddenness of it like a lightning strike. The tip of a black sword exploded out from his abdomen and showered the bar in blood. He gasped, screamed, looked down uncomprehendingly at the dark wedge of steel protruding from his guts. His mouth was filling with blood. He gagged on it. His vision blurred. Shit, he heard Riven shout. Mags! I'm all right, he tried to say, but he wasn't, and no words emerged, just a gurgle of blood. He put a hand on the gore-slicked bar to stay upright as his knees started to buckle. His clothing was already soaked in blood, his thoughts overwhelmed by pain. A chuckle from behind. He turned his head. It seemed to take forever and saw a male devil standing behind him, holding the dark blade on which Magadan's dying body hung. It wasn't another Malabranche. It looked almost human, save for its violet skin and the two thin horns that jutted from its head. Shadows and leather armor wrapped its lithe body. Magadan recognized it as a breed of stealthy fiend used by other devils as quiet killers and assassins. It must have entered the tavern with the Malabranche, invisible or clad in darkness. Magadan had missed it, and it had killed him. Riven, Magadan tried to say, but it just came out as an inarticulate gurgle of blood. He tried to focus, but his eyes wouldn't hold on to anything but the devil's face, the red eyes, the fanged mouth. The fiend gave a smile as it twisted the blade in Magadan's guts, then jerked it free, scraping ribs, widening the wound. A gush of warmth poured from the slit. Magadan screamed. Desperately, he grabbed at the pain, focused on it, lived in its center for a moment, a moment during which he ignored the blood and shit seeping from the hole in him. He grabbed at the devil with arms gone weak, he lurched, staggered, and would have fallen had he not gotten hold of the fiend by the forearm. The devil tried to shake him loose, but Magadan held on. The devil pulled back his blade for another stab, but before he could, Magadan made a spike of his will and drove it into the fiend's mind. The devil sensed danger immediately. It resisted the mental intrusion, tried to shake Magadan's grip loose, but its desperation fed Magadan's physical and mental grip. His fingernails sank into the fiend's skin, and his mind put a psychic hook in the devil's consciousness. The devil stabbed him again, but Magadan was beyond pain, and heard more than felt the blade slice his flesh and organs, great on bone. Lights flashed before his eyes, sparks, then darkness. He was fading, falling but he held on to the fiend's mind and used their connection to set up an empathetic connection. When he felt the connection take firm hold, felt the psychic bridge between them, he grinned, tasting blood, and transferred the wounds and every damned bit of pain in his ruined body through the connection and into the devil. The fiend's eyes went as wide as coins. It dropped its blade as its fanged mouth opened in a wail of pain. Shadows swirled around it, a storm of darkness. A jagged hole opened in the devil's abdomen, spilling gore as the hole in Magadan pinched closed and painfully healed. This is for you, bastard, Magadan grunted, pushing his agony into the dying devil. He shoved the creature backward, and the fiend stumbled back against the wall tripping on tankards, trying and failing to push its innards back into its abdomen. 
Magadan reached back to the bar and grabbed an arrow in his fist, sidestepped a feeble stab by the devil with its sword, and plunged the arrow into the fiend's eye, deep into its horned head. The devil fell to the floor, and Magadan rode him down, the two of them slick in shared gore. He pulled the arrow out and drove it into the fiend's other eye. Magadan stood, breathing hard, his legs still weak, and found Riven right behind him, crouched atop the bar, backlit by the glow of the spreading flames. Shadows made a slow swirl around him. Somehow he reminded Magadan of a crow. Like old times, Riven said. Magadan stood upright, wobbled, nodded. You all right? Riven asked. He wasn't even breathing hard. In passing, Magadan wondered if he breathed at all. Magadan looked at the gory arrow in his hand, his blood-soaked clothes, the corpse of the devil behind him, his burning tavern. I'm good, he said. He picked up the hogshead from the floor and found that the spill hadn't drained it entirely. He filled two tankers and gave one to Riven. It's a shit brew, he said, draining his. Riven drained his, too. Best I've had in a long while, Mags. Riven's pipe appeared in his hand, already lit, and he took a long draw. Fire Brigade will be coming, Magadan said, as he watched his tavern burn, a thick column of smoke pouring through the hole in the ceiling. His fiendish blood protected him from heat and fire. Riven, too, would feel no threat from flames. Too late for this place, Riven said. Sorry, Mags. Magadan shrugged. I'd had enough of it anyway. Riven nodded. Let these bodies burn. If these three had been working for your father, we'd have had ten score fiends here by now, and maybe the archfiend himself. The mere hint of Mephistopheles' name spoken by a godling caused a cool wind to waft through the bar. Flames hissed and popped, the sound suggestive of dark words. These three were working for themselves, probably trying to get in your father's favor. Their mistake. I... Riven took another draw on his pipe, exhaled the smoke. Well... Magadan eyed his old friend, more god than man, while the life he'd built burned down around him. I'll be ready, he said. Well enough, Riven said, and Magadan thought he looked relieved. Link us then. A mind link? So I can call you when I need you. Just leave it laying there so I can pick it up if I need it. And don't look around in there, Mags. You won't like it any. The thought of linking minds with a god disconcerted Magadan, but it needed to be done. He opened his mind, drew on his mental energy, reached out for Riven's mind. The shock of contact caused him to gasp. Mindful of Riven's admonition, he kept the link superficial and narrow. Still, he sensed at a distance the scope of Riven's mind. His expanded perception of time and place, the voices of the faithful that echoed through his mindscape. Gods, Magadan said softly. Gods indeed, Riven said. Makes a man a monster, Mags. No way to avoid it. I'm sorry. Riven shrugged. We've all got our burdens, and don't feel sorry for me just yet. Things will get ugly for you before it's all said and done. Count on it. Magadan smiled ruefully. When has it not? Riven grinned. Stay sharp, Mags. See you soon. And Mags? He's alive. Who? Kale. And we're going to get him. What? Wait! The darkness gathered, folded Riven into it, and he was gone. He's alive. He's alive. The words and their implication pushed all other thoughts out of Magadan's mind. Kale was alive, and his son was alive. Grinning like a lunatic, Magadan gathered his weapons and gear. He donned his wide-brimmed hat, fitted it over his horns, 
and walked unharmed through the flames and into the night-shrouded streets of Derlin. Already some passers-by had gathered. The fire wouldn't spread, though. It'd burn up his garret and the tavern, but nothing else. One of them, a tall, gaunt, bald man who held an open book in his hands, struck Magadan oddly. He wasn't looking at the burning building like the rest of them. Instead, he wrote something in his book with a quill. The man must have felt Magadan's gaze. He looked up from his book. His eyes had no pupils. They looked like opals set in his skull. He grinned. Goose pimples rose on Magadan's skin. He had no idea why. Something about the man. Hey, are you all right? shouted another of the gathered passers-by, a sailor with drink-slurred speech. You all right, friend? Look at your clothes. Gods, man! The bald man had gone back to his book writing, his mouth bent in a secretive smile. I said, are you all right? The sailor shouted again. Magadan looked at the sailor, raised a hand, and smiled. I'm fine. He was better than fine. He was good as he'd been in a hundred years. Chapter 2 Magadan walked for a time, thinking. The streets bustled even at the late hour. Mule-drawn wagons of supplies moved toward the barracks, and groups of grim-faced soldiers stood on corners, monitoring the traffic and the passers-by. The city was preparing for war. Every day, hundreds of soldiers marched out of the city to the parade grounds outside the towering basalt walls that ringed Derlin, and there drilled for hours. Scouts, mounted on Vesserabs, giant-winged lamprey-like creatures, swooped over the city, carrying messages from Cormirian nobles to High Bergen Gascarn High Banner. Rumors had an alliance brewing between Derlin and Cormir. Magadan wasn't sure that would be enough to thwart a Sembian assault when it came. He didn't realize it until he arrived, but his boots had carried him to the east gate. Beyond the dark basalt wall, the shroud of Sembia's shadowed night hung across the sky. Lines of green lightning flashed, the veins of Sembia's sky. He felt the gentle touch of the source's consciousness brushing against his own. Sakors was out there, floating in the dark, as was Kale's son. And with that, he knew what he would do. The gate was closed and the guards stiffened at his approach, but their minds were ordinary and easily manipulated by his mind magic. I'm on official city business by orders of the High Bergen, he said, and pushed acceptance of his statement into their minds. I need to get out of the city right now. Apologies for the late hour. Of course, of course, said the gate sergeant, a heavy-set bearded fellow whose breath smelled of onion and pipe smoke. In moments, Magadan stood outside the gates with the basalt walls of the city behind him. He stared across the plains at the distant wall of the shadowed air that blanketed Sembia. He'd walked Sembia in the dark before, with Erevis Kale at his side— They'd braved the shadow storm and trekked to Ordulin. The memory made Magadan smile. Walking in our footsteps, old friend, he said, and started off. Using the source's mental emanations, he kenned the direction and distance of Sakors. It floated in Sembia's perpetual night south of the Thunder Peaks, about halfway between Derlin and Ordulin and Riven had said that whatever was to happen must happen in Ordulin. Riven said he wanted Magadan's help, but how could Magadan be of assistance to a god? The same way he had assisted in the murder of a god a century before, he would draw on the power of the Source to augment his own. He felt the Source's mental emanations answered them with his own. See you soon, he projected. He avoided the roads, fearing he'd encounter Sembian troops, and instead moved rapidly across the plains. His bow and woodcraft kept him fed, and his mind magic and stealth kept him unobserved. 
Even traveling cross-country, he spotted Shadowvar patrols from time to time, once including what appeared to be a prisoner transport caravan. He stayed well south of the Thunder Peaks and the Way of the Manticore, but he still saw signs of the gathered Sembian troops there. Even the perpetual gloom could not hide the light, like faintly burning stars from thousands of campfires in the distance. The Sembians had blocked the road between Darlin and Cormier on the one hand, and the Dalelands on the other. Whatever army the Dalelands had to face, they'd face alone. Magadan did not take time to investigate any of it more thoroughly. Riven had asked him to be ready, so he kept moving east, moving directly for Sakors, for the source. The twisted, malformed trees and whipgrass of the Sembian countryside saddened him. He'd walked the plains when they'd been lush with old trees and fields of barley. Now the leafless skeletons of old elms and oaks rattled in the gusty wind. He put a hand on the trunk of any old elms he encountered, a moment of bonding between two living things that had once seen a Sembia under the sun. He stayed off the roads and skirted wide around villages, although many appeared abandoned, their fields fallow and weedy. Possibly the villagers had fled as Sembian forces marched east, or possibly something worse had happened to them. Monsters prowled the plains. From time to time Magadan heard growls and roars in the distance, occasionally caught motion out of the corner of his eye. Often he knocked an energized arrow into his bow, but he never had to fire. The creatures that stalked the darkness left him unmolested. The pull of the source grew stronger as he covered the leagues, and as he grew closer, he sensed an undercurrent to its pull, a sadness. The source's mind seemed dulled and melancholy. He didn't understand it. As he neared it, as he sensed the full scope of its power, he grew nervous. He feared he could lose himself in it again. But by the time he actually spotted Sakors in the distance— a dark star hanging in the lightning-lit sky of Sembia's night. He knew for certain he could resist its pull. He could use the source and still keep himself. He'd been broken once before by using it, shattered, really. But his reassembled self was stronger than the original. Small dark figures flitted around the floating mountain on which Sakor stood. They looked tiny from afar, but Magadan knew them to be Shadowvar cavalry mounted on scaly-winged Vesserabs. The source seemed finally to sense him fully, and its pull grew plaintive. It wanted him to come closer, to deepen their connection. He eyed a stand of pine directly under the floating mountain and drew on his reserve of power. A dim orange glow haloed his head, and a mirror of the glow shone in the spot he'd mentally chosen under Sakors. He activated the mind magic, and it moved him instantly to the wooded spot under Sakors. The mountain floated over him, huge and ominous, and somewhere within its center was the source. Magadan opened his mind and let the source's touch wash through him, let part of its power, its ancient consciousness, become part of his own. He sensed right away that it had lost no power, but it had lost acuity and in an instant, Magadan understood. The source had been calling to him. For a hundred years it had been sending mental energy out into the world in a desperate effort to reach out to him. It missed him. It wanted him near. Why? he projected, but knew the answer before the source offered it. The source was dying, its sentience slowly fading away. Worse, it was aware of its impending demise, the slow erosion of its self-awareness. It was afraid. And it was alone, surrounded by beings that didn't understand it and could not connect with it. I'm so sorry, he projected. The source's fear and sadness tightened his chest, caught him up in its swirl and swept through him. He sank to the bed of pine needles, weeping and wrapped his arms around his knees. It had wanted him to come to it for a century, and he had not answered. He'd failed it. 
Forgive me, he projected. It did. In fact, it had nothing for him but affection, and his connection with it and his sympathy mitigated its sadness and alleviated its fear. It welcomed his companionship the way a thirsty man welcomed a drink, another mind to keep it company as it faded. It had simply not wanted to die alone. I'll stay with you throughout, he promised. When the city moves, I'll move with it. I won't leave you. He felt its gratitude. He made a place for himself under the city, hidden by his mind magic and the pine trees, and kept company with the oldest consciousness he'd ever encountered. Shadowvar patrols came and went, sometimes cavalry on Vesserabs, sometimes soldiers afoot, but none ever noticed him. Over the days and nights, the source showed him many things, events from its past, possible futures, jumbles of non-sequential, nonsensical things that he could not follow. Time passed oddly for him as he walked in the source's dying thoughts. Its consciousness took odd turns, made strange connections, moved from things extraordinary to things mundane. He came to understand that he'd lost himself in the source the first time, not because of the source's malice, but because of its loneliness. It was a consciousness with no body. It had wanted mental and emotional companionship so much that its over-exuberant consciousness had simply overwhelmed his. He'd been unready then, but one hundred years had passed since, and he was ready now. Magadan experienced months and years in moments, lived lives in hours, laughed and cried and raged. But always he kept a firm hold on himself, on his purpose. There may come a time when I need your help, he said. Will you help me? The source answered in its way that it would if it still could. Magadan broke his connection with the Source only once to send a message to Riven through their mind link. He didn't know if Riven would receive it, but he wanted to try. I'm ready, he projected, and nothing more. Then he waited, keeping death watch on the Source, his thoughts often turning back to Riven's words. Erebus is alive, and he has a son— and his son is the key to everything. Vason had never known the father whose blood ran in his veins, but Erevis Kale lived on in him somehow, haunting his dreams. Vason always saw him as a dark man with a dark sword, a dark soul. In the dreams he never saw his father's face and rarely heard his voice. They somehow communed without truly seeing one another, in blindness, in quietude, and over the years, through the sense-starved dream connection, Vason believed he'd come to understand what Erebus would have wished for him to know. The depths of loss, the pain of regret, everything he'd learned of his father seemed to circle around regret. Vason was dreaming now, he knew. He saw only darkness before him, deep and impenetrable. Frigid air stirred his hair felt like knives on his skin. Erebus spoke to him, each word a treasure, his deep voice pushing aside the silence of the dreamscape. I am cold, Vason. It's dark. I'm alone. Vason knew solitude all too well. He'd spent his life among others, but always apart from them. Vason tried to move, but could not. Something was holding him in place. The cold was growing worse. He was shivering, going numb, paralyzed. Where are you? he called. Vason, you must not fail. The words hung there for a time, heavy, portentous, filling the darkness. Must not fail at what? Find me. Write the story. How? How can I find you? You're dead. Vason felt colder. He wanted to ask more questions, wanted to see his father's face at long last, but the darkness receded. Wait! Wait! Vason caught a flash of glowing red sky, rivers of fire. 
he heard the screams of millions in torment. He awoke on his pallet, shivering, heart racing. He stared up at the cracked, vaulted ceiling of his quarters in the abbey. The gauzy, dim gray of a newly birthed morning filtered through the single window of his quarters. He could count on one hand the number of days he had seen more than an hour or two of sunlight in the past year. He'd gotten used to Sembia's perpetual shroud long ago, the same way he'd gotten used to many things. Letting the dream slip from the forefront of his mind, he sat up, his flesh still goose-pimpled, and recited the dawn greeting, the words softly defiant in the ever-dim sun. Dawn is a monitor's gift. His light dispels darkness and renews the world. He sat on the edge of his sleeping pallet for a time, bent over his knees, his head in his hands, thinking of Erebus, the legacy he could not escape, even when asleep. He'd been dreaming of his father more and more in recent months. He examined his calloused hands, his skin the color of tarnished silver, his veins a deep purple. Shadows webbed the spaces between his fingers and spiraled up his forearms, gauntlets of night. He stared at them a long while, the curves and whorls and spirals, the script of his blood. When he shook his hands, the darkness dissipated like mist. The light of your faith is stronger than the darkness of your blood, Derek had often told him, and most of the time Vason credited the words. But sometimes, after awakening from a dream of Erebus and sitting alone with only his shadow for company, sharing time with the darkness he felt lurking around the edges of his life, he wasn't so sure. Erebus's life haunted Vason's. Vason's heritage occluded his hopes. He sometimes had the feeling that he was doomed to live a history written by someone else, unable to turn the page to get to his own life. The shadows that cloaked him, that he could not escape, were the story of his life. Write the story. What did that even mean? Derrick had told him often that Vason had to prepare himself, had drilled it into him with such fervor that Vason's childhood had been no childhood at all. It had been training of mind, body, and spirit since he'd been a boy. Prepare for what? Vason had asked through the years. For whatever comes, Derek would answer softly, and the concern in his eyes spoke louder than his words. And you must not fail. And now Erebus echoed Derek in Vason's dream. The voices of his two fathers, the one of his blood, the other of his heart, had merged into a single demand. You must not fail. He stared at the symbol inlaid into the wall over the hearth, a blazing sun over a blossoming red rose. I won't, he said. Whatever came, he would bear it, and he would not fail. Hard raps on his door startled him. As always, when his emotions spiked, shadows leaked from his skin. Hold a moment, he said. He stood, and the morning chill resurrected his goose pimples. The fire in his hearth had burned down to ash and embers. He pulled on his tunic, his holy symbol on its sturdy chain, splashed water from the wash basin on his face, and padded the few steps to the door of his small chamber. He opened the door and blinked in surprise. The oracle stood in the doorway, his red, orange, and yellow robes glowing softly. His eyes were the solid, otherworldly orange of a seeing trance a shining platinum sun with a rose raised in relief on the circle of its center hung from a chain around his thin neck. He stared not at Vason, but at a point just to Vason's left. The oracle's guide, a large, tawny-coated fey dog with intelligent eyes, stood beside the elderly seer, tongue lolling, tail upright and entirely still. Vason realized that he had never once heard the dog bark. Oh, Oracle, Vason said, shock summoning a stutter from his mouth and shadows from his flesh. He had never heard of the Oracle entering a seeing trance outside the sanctum. 
The oracle smiled, showing toothless gums and deepening in the web of grooves that lined his hawkish face. Age spots dotted the skin of his scalp, visible through the thin fluff of his gray hair. His skin looked parchment thin and lit with a soft inner glow. His light and warmth keep you, Vason, said the oracle. Despite his age, his voice was the steady, even tone of the valley's cascades, so different from the voice he used when not in a trance. And you, oracle? You may go, brownie, the oracle said to the dog. The creature licked the oracle's hand, eyed Vason, and disappeared in a flash of pale light. Vason always marveled at the dog's ability to magically transport itself. Standing face to face with the oracle, Vason keenly felt the differences between them. The oracle's pale skin, deprived of direct sunlight for a century, but illuminated by the inner glow of his trance, contrasted markedly with Vason's dark skin, dimmed as it was by the legacy of his bloodline. The oracle was lit with a monitor's light. Vason was dimmed by Erebus Kale's shadow. Do you wish to come in, Oracle? Vason said. He realized the words sounded foolish, but was not sure what else to say. Again, that toothless grin. Vason, did you know that Abelar Corinthal was my father? The abrupt conversational turn took Vason back, but he managed to nod. My father told me. Which father? Recalling the dream that had awakened him, Vason had trouble forming a reply. Derek, my adoptive father. I've never known another. You know this, Oracle. But you see Erebus sometimes in your dreams. Vason could not deny it. Yes, but they're just dreams, and he's long dead. So it's said. Shadows leaked from Vason's skin. Once more, the goose pimples. What do you mean? I see him too, Vason, son of Vara. Vason swallowed the bulge in his throat. And what do you see when you see him? I see you, the oracle said. I, I don't understand. I don't either. I met Erebus Kale. Did you know that? I didn't, but I wondered sometimes. Why did you never ask? Vason answered truthfully. It seemed a betrayal of Derek, and I was afraid. I didn't want to know him. He was hard to know, I think. I saw him twice when I was a boy. The first time he was a man haunted. The second time he was no longer a man at all, but he was still haunted. Haunted? By what? Doubt, I think, the oracle said, then changed the subject. Your father, your adoptive father, was the son of Reg, who rode with my father. Did you know that? Yes, of course. Vason could not shake the impression that he and the oracle were simply reciting words written out for them by someone else. He still did not understand the purpose of the oracle's visit. You, like your father, and like his father before him, swore to remain here and protect this abbey, to protect me, and you have done so. Vason did not answer. He felt humbled by the oracle's acknowledgment. You have been here the longest with me, and have done credit to the memory of Derig and Reg. You have become the first blade— but change comes to everything. It does, Vason said haltingly. But what's to change? The world. I see a swirl of events, Vason, but I cannot make sense of it. Gods, they're chosen, gods beyond gods, the rules of creation, the tablets of fate. Wars, Vason, we see it already in the Dales, War is sweeping Toral. Something is changing, and in the midst of it all, I see shadows, and I see a growing darkness that threatens it all. Vason's head swam. 
he could make no sense of the oracle's words. I am one hundred and six years old, Vason, the oracle continued. Where will you go when I die? The question startled Vason. What? Already pilgrims come only rarely. Traveling the realm of the Shadowvar is too dangerous. Monsters walk the plains, and, where they do not, Sembian soldiers march. When I die, still fewer will come. They will come to see your father's tomb. Perhaps some. They will come to see your tomb as well, to honor your memory, the work you've done here. A light in the darkness, Oracle. The Oracle smiled, and Vason saw that it was forced. His lined face wrinkled with remembered pain. That, I fear, will not be. Are you... dying? We're all dying, the Oracle said. So I ask again, where will you go when I go to the Dawn Father? Vason shook his head. He had dedicated his life to service and had never conceived a life for himself outside the valley. He had no family anymore, no real friends. The pilgrims and his comrades in arms respected him, but none were friends. His blood and appearance made him different. He lived his life in solitude. I don't know. Perhaps I'll remain here. This is my home. The oracle smiled as if he knew better. Indeed it is. Here, there is something you must have. From the pocket of his robe, he withdrew a thick silver chain from which hung an exquisitely made charm of a rose. Age had left the silver black with tarnish. This was my father's. Vason held up his hands. Oracle, I cannot. Abelar Corinthal, dawn lord of the abbey, my father, would be pleased for you to have it. This I know. Vason felt himself flush. He could not refuse the oracle. He bowed his head to allow the charm around his neck. The touch of the symbol, once worn by Dawn Lord Abelar, made the hair on the back of his neck stand on end. It is tarnished, the oracle said. But scratch away the tarnish, and there is silver and light beneath. Many things are that way. Vason took the oracle's point. I understand. The darkness in you is not born of Erevis Kale. Vason stiffened. Who then? You separate yourself from everyone, from everything except your duty, because you think yourself bound by the past to a future you cannot change, and you intend to change that future alone. Vason's anger kindled in the heat of the truth. Shadows swirled from his skin. Is that not true? Isn't that what you see for me? The oracle shook his head. No, I see hard choices before you, but I don't see what you will choose. They're to be your choices. Remember that. Nothing is foreordained. Nothing is written. Write me a story. And listen to me carefully, the oracle said, continuing. You do not need to face them alone. You should not face them alone. Vason's anger dissolved in the face of the oracle's concerned tone. He bowed his head again. I apologize for my outburst. Thank you for your words, oracle. The oracle smiled softly. It's nothing, and you may regret your gratitude some day. Never. Listen to me, Vason. The light is in you and burns brighter than the rest of us because it fights the darkness of your blood. Will you remember that? I will. Smiling, the oracle said. Very good. Then be well. Vason, son of Derig, and Erevis, and Vara. Wait, is that all? But it was too late. The oracle's face slackened, and the glow left his skin. 
The orange light of a monitor fled his eyes, and they returned to the filmy, bleary eyes of an old man. He sagged, his aged body unable to so suddenly bear his weight. Vason caught him to prevent a fall. He felt like a bundle of sticks under his robes. It's Vason, Oracle. Vason, said the Oracle in his slow, awkward way. Where, Bounty? You sent Brownie away, Vason said. I'm sure he's nearby, though. Bounty, the Oracle called, alarm in his expression. Bounty! Vason found it difficult to reconcile the sure, powerful voice of the Oracle when he was in a trance with the childlike voice of the mentally infirm Oracle when he was not. A soft pop and flash of light announced Brownie's return to the Oracle's side. The dog nuzzled the Oracle's hand. Bounty came, the Oracle said, grinning. I'll escort you back to your sanctum, Oracle, Vason said. The Oracle shook his head. No, Vason, when the bell calls, have pilgrims sent to me for a seeing. I speak to them, then all leave this day. All, you take them. The latest group of pilgrims, the first in months, had arrived less than a ten-day earlier, dodging Sembian troops along the way. They would be disappointed to leave so soon. They only just arrived, Oracle, and the Dales are racked by war. We'll have to take them north through the foothills toward High Moon. Even that way may be closing. Sembian troops are massed along the borders of the Dales. I know, but they go, Vazen. Vason knew better than to dispute with the oracle. Very well. The oracle smiled at him. Farewell, Vason. The light keep and warm you, oracle. He watched the oracle, one hand on Brownie, totter off down the corridor. Vason closed the door, mind racing. First the dream, then a personal visit and seeing from the oracle. What did it all mean? He took the rose holy symbol from his neck. Thin threads of shadow spiraled from his fingertips around the rose. He imagined Dawn Lord Abelar using the symbol to channel the power of Amonitor while facing the Nightwalker at the Battle of Sakors. He studied its petals, the stem, the two thorns. It was so finely crafted it could have been an actual rose magically transformed into metal not unlike the rose gardens around the abbey that the spell plague had petrified. With his thumbnail, he scratched at the tarnish of one petal to reveal a line of shining silver, light under the darkness. Smiling, he returned it to his neck. He would try to be worthy of it. His eyes fell on the dusty, locked chest he kept in one corner of his chamber, and he lost his smile. The chest held the dark, magical blade once borne by Erebus Kale, Weave Shear. Vason had held its cool, slippery hilt only once, when, as a boy, Derek had first given it to him. Shadows from the blade had mingled with the shadows of his flesh. The weapon had felt an extension of him, but the familiarity had frightened him, and he had never touched it again, and he would not touch it today. Today was a day for light and hope, not shadow and somber remembrances. Mindful of the oracle's words, he donned his padded shirt and mail, his breastplate, slung his shield over his back, strapped his weapon belt with its ordinary sword around his hips, and headed out. As was his habit, he would commune with a monitor at high sun, walk the veil, and see his mother's grave before he took the pilgrims back out into the dark. Rain fell in straight lines from the dark Sembian sky, beating the whip grass into a flat, twisted mat. The sky cleared its throat with thunder. The stink of decay suffused the air, as if the entire world were slowly decomposing. Quickly, Ziad said his voice as coarse as a blade drawn over a wet stone. Quickly, it will come soon, Saeed. 
Saeed swallowed, nodded, and kept pace with his brother's hurried, shambling steps. He would have offered Ziad a reassuring touch, an arm to steady him, but Saeed disliked the way his brother's flesh squirmed under his hand. They walked, walked because horses would bear neither of them, under a bleak sky and over sodden, spongy earth, they moved cross-country because Sembian soldiers and wagon trains had become too common on the roads. Saeed's rain-soaked cloak hung from his shoulders like a hundredweight, like the burden of the fourteen decades he'd lived. Beside him, Ziad sagged under the weight of his own burdens. He wheezed above the hiss of the rain, and the hump of his back was more pronounced than usual. Ziad's wet robes hugged his form and their grip hinted at the shape of the warped body beneath, the flesh polluted by the wild magic of the spell plague. Around them thronged the pack of mongrel cats his brother had summoned when they crossed into Sembia's shadow-shrouded borders. Feral cats? Sayid had asked. Feral, yes, his brother had answered, staring at the creatures with his glassy eyes. But not cats. Sayid counted thirteen of the felines, although the numbers seemed to change slightly from time to time. They held their tails low, and the rain pressed their mangy fur to their bodies, showing with each stride the workings of bones and muscles. Their heads looked over large on their thin necks, their legs disproportionately long. They seemed composed entirely of black eyes, thick sinew, and sharp teeth. Dark clouds stretched across the sky, blotting out the sun. It was midday, but was as dark as dusk in winter. Saeed and Ziad had been walking through perpetual night for many ten days, avoiding airborne Shadowvar patrols and Sembian foot soldiers as they traced a winding path across the ruined Sembian countryside. Rumors spoke of pitched battles in the Dalens, as Sembia moved against its northern neighbors. Saeed and Ziad wanted nothing of war. They had come in search of the Abbey of the Rose and its oracle. What if this Abbey and its oracle are just myth? Then what do we do? Both could be stories the Sembians tell themselves to preserve hope. No, Ziad said, shaking his head emphatically. They exist. How do you know? Ziad stopped and turned on him. Because they must. Because he told me. Because this. He gestured helplessly at his body. This must end. It must. Sayid knew who Ziad meant by he. Mephistopheles, the archdevil who ruled Cania, the eighth layer of hell. Merely thinking the archfiend's name caused Sayid to hear sinister whispers in the falling rain. He took a moment to drink from his water skin, a habit, nothing more the ghost of a human need. Saeed did not need to drink, or eat, or sleep. Not any more, not since he had been changed. If the spell plague had fouled his brother's body, it had perfected Saeed's, although the price of perfection had been to make him as much automaton as man. Why are you slowing to drink? Ziad called. I said we must hurry. Ziad's agitation conjured coughs from his ruined lungs, thick and wet with phlegm. The cats mewled and crowded close to him, their feral knowing eyes watching with terrible intensity. Between hacks, Ziad tried to shoo the animals away with his boot, and Sayid tried to ignore the unnatural way his brother's leg flopped at the hip as he kicked at the cats. The coughing fit ended without a purge, and the disappointed cats wandered back into their orbits, tails sagging with disappointment. The cats disgust me, Sayid said. Not cats, and they're a gift, Ziad mumbled, as he wiped his mouth with a hand partially covered in scales. His dark eyes stared out at Sayid from the deep-shadowed pits of their sockets, his hatchet-shaped face was dotted with pockmarks, the result of a childhood illness. Sayid looked past his brother, across the plains, and his mind moved to old memories. I can't picture our mother's face, can you? She had 
long brown hair, I think. Ziad drank of his own water skin, swished and spit. The cats pounced on it, saw it was naught but water, and left off. It was black, Ziad said. I used to dream of her back when I slept. You'll sleep again, Saeed, and dream. When we find the oracle, we'll make him tell us. His voice cracked and broke into a cough. Saeed moved to help, but Ziad waved him off with a hand and one cough followed another into a racking wet fit. Once more the cats crowded close, mewling, circling, jostling for position as Ziad fought the poison the spell plague had put in him. He hunched over in the rain, coughing, warring with the foulness of his innards. Saeed could only watch, disgusted. He looked away and tried to remember his mother— the exercise helping distract him from the shifting swells and lumps that bulged under his brother's robes, the mucus-filled gasps, the wet heaves. Saeed could not recall his mother's eyes, or even her name. His memory was fading. It was as if he were someone new every day, someone he hated more and more. He remembered with clarity only one day from the distant past— one moment that connected who he was now to who he had been before the spell plague, the moment Abelar Corinthal's men had chopped off his right thumb with a hatchet. He remembered screaming, remembered the knight who'd cut off the digit apologizing for the mutilation. Ziad's coughing intensified, turned into a prolonged heave, and the sound pulled Sayid back into the present. The cats meowed with excitement, circling, tails raised, eyes gleaming as Ziad gagged, and finally the felines received what they wished. Ziad's abdomen visibly roiled under his robes, and he vomited forth a long, thick rope of stinking black sputum. The grass it struck smoked, curled, and browned. The cats pounced on the mucus, hissing and clawing at one another, a fierce caterwaul, each lapping at the phlegm. Ziad cursed and wiped his mouth. Thrice damned cats, Saeed said, stomping a boot on the ground near the felines, splashing them with mud. The cats arched, hissed, and bared their fangs, but did not back away from their meal. Saeed had never seen them eat anything other than the black result of his brother's expulsions. They're not cats, but damned indeed, Ziad said. He cleared his throat again, and the creatures, having devoured the first string of mucus, turned to him hoping for another meal. When nothing was forthcoming, they sat on their haunches and licked their paws and chops. Ziad lowered his hood, threw his head back to put his face to the rain. He ran a hand over his thin black hair, with skin pulled taut to reveal sunken eyes and cavernous cheeks, he looked skeletal, the living dead. The purgings only slow the advance of the curse, Ziad said. I need someone soon, Saeed, a vessel, otherwise the curse will run its course. Saeed nodded. Their use of vessels had left a trail of aberrations in their wake. Come, Ziad said and threw up his hood. We must get to the next village. The urge is strong. He inhaled as well as his ruined lungs would allow, and stared down at the cats. They looked up at him, far too much intelligence in their eyes. I can't let it happen to me, Ziad said softly. Let what happen? His brother seemed not to hear him, and Saeed was, as always, left to wonder. The spell plague had transformed both of them, but differently. Saeed had been made unable to sleep and increasingly dull to life's pleasures and pains. His emotions and appreciation of physical sensations had been ground down to nubs. Ziad, on the other hand, had been killed, but the blue fire had not left him dead. Instead, it had somehow filled him with pollution and returned him to life. Saeed well remembered how Ziad looked upon his return, the panicked eyes, the animal scream of terror and pain. He had shivered with cold, but inexplicably smelled of brimstone, of rot. 
Ziad had pawed frantically at his own body, his breath coming in strained gasps. What is it? Sayid had asked. I'm unchanged? Ziad had said, his tone amazed and relieved. I was torn, Sayid, burned, flayed. For centuries I saw the master of that place, and he spoke to me, made me promise to seek. Sayid had thought him mad. Master, centuries, you were gone only moments. Ziad had not heard him. I'm unchanged, unchanged. But he was not unchanged. His laughter had turned to wheezing, then coughing, then his first purging, and both of them had stared in horror at the squirming black mass expelled from his guts. Oh, gods, Ziad had said. He'd wept as if he understood some truth that Sayid did not. It's in me still, Sayid. That place. It's a curse, and it wants to come out. Only later had Sayid learned that Ziad's soul had gone to Cania, where his brother had forged a pact with Mephistopheles to seek out someone the archdevil could not find alone. And only later had Sayid learned what the purging actually meant, what it would require again and again until Mephistopheles set them free of their afflictions. Come on, he said, hating himself for saying it. We'll find you someone. They walked on, two men who weren't men, and thirteen cats who weren't cats, bent under the weight of the rain. In time, they came upon a packed earth wagon road. Must be a village near, Sayid said, scanning the shapeless black expanse of the plains. Wisps of shadow clung to the trees and shrubs, a black mist. Ziad nodded, his head bobbing strangely on his neck. His voice, too, sounded odd when he spoke. Let's hope so. Jerak awoke before sunrise, or so he judged. Dawn's light rarely penetrated Sembia's shadow-shrouded air, so he relied for timekeeping on the instincts he'd sharpened as a soldier. He stared up at the ceiling beams of the cottage, listening to the soft roll of distant thunder through the shuttered windows, the patter of rain on the wood-shingled roof. He hoped it was ordinary precipitation. Ten days earlier, a stinking black rain had fallen, and whatever it had borne in its drops had fouled the soil. Soon after, the barley crop had begun to wither, and the autumn vegetables, especially the pumpkins, had browned on the vine. They'd done what they could to minimize the loss, but the whole village keenly felt the absence of a green priest of Shantia. The villagers' own prayers to the Earth Mother whispered in small secret gatherings, as if in fear the shadow var in their distant cities and floating citadel would somehow overhear, went unanswered. Winter would bring hardship for them all. Another black rain would ruin the harvest altogether. He and El would have to put up as much food as they could before first snow, and that meant he would have to risk a hunt. The thought of it sped his heart, although he wasn't sure if that was out of fear of what he might encounter on the plains or out of fear of El's reaction. She lay beside him, her form covered in the tattered quilts, her breathing the deep regular intake of sleep. Moving slowly so as not to awaken her, he swung his legs off the straw-stuffed mattress and sat on the side of the bed. He tried to squelch a cough, but only half managed. L did not stir. He sat there for a time, his bare feet flat on the cold wood floor, and waited for wakefulness. The damp air summoned the aches that lurked in his joints and muscles, and he massaged first one shoulder, then another. Age was turning him brittle. He tried to swallow away the foul taste of morning, but could not summon the spit. He grabbed the tin cup on the bedside table, swished the leftover tea, and drank it down, cold and bitter, like the morning. He rubbed the back of his neck and considered the one-room cottage, lit faintly in the glow of the hearth's embers. 
furniture he'd made from the straight dark limbs of broadleaf trees, bowls and cups and pans that had served three generations. He tried to imagine their baby crawling on the floor, but could not quite do it. He tried to imagine how they would provide for the baby and could not quite do that either. Elle's pregnancy had been a surprise to them both. Jarek had resigned himself to a childlessness long before. Ten seasons of marriage had produced not a single pregnancy, so they had assumed one or both of them was sterile. At the time, Jarek had thought it was just as well. The world seemed too dark for children. And then El had told him, her voice quaking. I think I'm with child, Jarek. The joy he'd felt had surprised him, as if the child were a key to a locked room inside him that held happiness, that held possibility. In a moment, the stakes of his life had been raised. A child would rely on him. The realization terrified him. He wondered if they should leave Fair Elm. Many of their friends and neighbors had already abandoned the village, the Milsons and Rabs the most recent. They had braved the darkness, the Shadowvar, and the Shadowvar's creatures, and made for the sun. He didn't know if they'd gone west for Darlin or north for the Dales. He wasn't sure it mattered. War or the threat of war seemed everywhere in Sambia. The big cities were the sites of musters, the borders were the sites of battles, and the villages and towns in between were left to fend for themselves. He didn't know what to do. L was still able to travel, and they owned a wagon, a pack horse. They could sell their remaining chickens, gather up their goods, and head northeast. Jarek knew how to handle a blade and was matchless with his bow. Maybe they could avoid the soldiers, and Jarek could protect them from the creatures that prowled the plains. He tried to coax another drop of tea from the cup. Nothing. He tried to coax from himself the will to leave. Nothing. Leaving seemed too dangerous and felt too much like surrender, like a betrayal, and neither was in him. He had been raised in the cottage, as had his father and grandfather before him, and despite the perpetual shadow that covered Sembia, despite the dire creatures that prowled the countryside, despite the sometimes harsh rule of the shadow var, his father and grandfather had managed to eke out a living from the land. They had taken pride in it, and so did he. He hadn't always. He'd thought a farmer's life contemptible in his youth, and had run off to serve in one of the shadow var's many wars. He'd killed more than a dozen men with his bow, but only one, the last, with his blade. Killing felt different up close. Jarek had seen his reflection in the dying man's eyes, and that had been all he wanted of war ever again. He ran a hand through his hair. It was getting long, and scratched at the three-day beard that covered his cheeks. He exhaled ready at last to start another sunless day. As he started to rise, Elle's voice broke the quiet and stopped him. I'm awake, she said. He sat back down. He knew her tone well enough to understand that her thoughts had probably veered close to his own. She, too, was worried about the future. He put his hand on the rise of her hip. You've been awake this whole time? She rolled over and looked up at him. Her skin looked less pale in the light of the embers. Her long, dark hair formed a cloud on the bolster. Under the quilt, she had one hand on her belly, which was just beginning to swell with their child. The rain awakened me hours ago. I started worrying for the crop, and then my mind whirled and I couldn't fall back asleep. Try not to worry. We'll manage. Are you cold? Without waiting for an answer, he rose, walked across the cool floor, and threw two logs onto the embers. The logs caught flame almost immediately, and he returned to the bed and sat. She had not moved. Are you worried? she asked. He knew better than to offer her a falsehood. Of course I am. I worry about 
how we'll feed ourselves and the baby mostly. But then I remind myself that my parents endured difficult years too, especially after I left to fight. And yet here this cottage stands. The crops will recover and we'll endure. Yes, but do you worry about the world? He took her meaning and offered her a falsehood after all. The world is too big for my worry. I'm trying to focus on our bellies. And if the Shadowvar come for a quota of the crop to supply the troops, they say there's war in the Dales. The fire caused shadows to dance on the walls, and Jarek flashed on memories of his military service when he'd served the Shadowvar in battle against Cormirians. They say a lot of things, and the Shadowvar haven't come for a quota in years. The farms near the cities must produce enough, or perhaps they eat magic in the cities these days. She did not smile at his poor joke, but at least it smoothed the worried furrows from her brow. She inhaled deeply, as if to purge the concerns that plagued her, and when she exhaled, a playful look came into her eye, the same look he'd first seen on her ten years ago, the look that had caused him to want her as a wife. You snore loudly. I know. You should nudge me. No, she said, and snuggled more deeply into the quilts. I like the sound sometimes. You like strange things, sweets. Taking you for a husband seals that ward, I'd say. I'd say, he agreed with a smile. He bent and kissed her on the crooked nose she'd broken years before when she'd stepped on a rake. He placed his hand over hers on her belly, so that both of them had their unborn child in their palms. We'll be all right, he said and wanted her to believe it. I know, she said, and he knew she wanted to believe it. He stood and stretched, groaned when his muscles protested. Why are you up so early? she asked. He hesitated for a moment, braced himself, then dived in. I'm going on a hunt, El. What? Instantly she sounded fully awake. The grooves had returned to her brow deeper than before. We need to put up some meat, he said. She shook her head. No, it's not safe. We saw sackers in the night sky only last month. The Shadowvar keep their creatures away from the villages, but let them wander the plains. Only soldiers and those with official charters walk the road safely. Neither the Shadowvar nor their flying city will take an interest in a lone hunter. They just want no one in or out of Sembia without their permission, especially during a time of war. No one has come to the village in months, Jarek. Why do you think that is? It's not safe. He could not deny it. Peddlers and priests and caravans had once roamed the Sembian countryside, tending to the villages. But Fairelm had seen nothing in a long while, nothing but old Mincer the peddler, who seemed to enjoy spinning tales more than selling wares. But Mincer had not returned in more than a month. The village seemed to have been forgotten out in the dark of the plains, all alone and surrounded by monsters. There are worse things than Shadowvar, she said. Don't go. We can manage. I have to. I'll be gone not more than two days. Two days, she said, half sitting up. Two days, he said, nodding, his resolve firming up as he spoke. And when I return, we'll have a stag or three to dress and smoke. And that'll keep us in meat through the winter and then some. You and the baby need more than roots and tubers, and we need the chickens for eggs. I need my husband and the baby its father. He bent and put his hand on her brow. She covered it tightly and lay back, as if she had no intention of letting go. Nothing will happen to me. How can you know? I'm a soldier, El. You were a soldier. Now you're a farmer. Nothing will happen to me. She squeezed his hand. Swear it. I swear. If you see something bigger than a deer, you run away. Promise. I promise. She gave his hand another squeeze and let it go.
He cleared his throat and went to the chest near the hearth, feeling El's eyes on him. He opened the lid and removed the weapon belt and the broadsword, still oiled and sharp, that he'd earned as partial payment for his military service. He had not worn more than an eating knife and a dagger in what felt like a lifetime, and when he strapped on the heavier blade, the weight felt awkward on his waist. I used to feel awkward without this on, he said, and L said nothing. His bow sat in its deerskin case near the chest, his two quivers, both stuffed with arrows, beside it. He undid the tie on the case and removed the U shaft. He strung it with practiced ease and placed his hand in the grip. It felt as smooth and familiar as L's skin. He imagined himself sighting along an arrow, a stag, in his sight. His talent with the longbow had been a matter of comment among his fellow soldiers, and he had not let his skills atrophy over the years, even after taking up the plow for the sword. Wait for the rain to end at least, she said. He strapped the quivers on, did a quick count on his various arrows. The sooner I leave, the sooner I'll return. You'll get sick from the wet. I won't. Then at least eat something before you go. I can eat when I... Eat, Jarek. The rain and cold is bad enough. I won't have you out there with an empty stomach. He smiled, nodded, went to the small table he'd made, and broke off a large chunk of two-day-old bread from a loaf. With it, he swabbed yesterday's stew slop from the bottom of the cauldron hanging near the fire. L watched as he ate. There was no meat in the turnip and kale stew, and the absence only strengthened his resolve to hunt. He would fill his water skin in the pond and could forage for additional food in the field, should he need it. You eat too, L. I will. The baby's always hungry. Takes after its father, I suppose. He went to the bed once more and gave her a lingering kiss. There's ample stew and bread, a few eggs in the coop. I'll be back before you know it. She stayed strong, as he knew she would. You're leaving me here with none but the fools and cowards. You manage fools and cowards quite well, sweets. Again, I think our marriage seals that ward. She smiled as she spoke, and he thanked the gods for it. I think I like you better asleep. She turned serious. Be careful, Jarek. I will, he said and pulled on his boots and cloak. Go see Anna while I'm gone. A good idea, she said. I'll take her a couple eggs. They're suffering. I know. See you soon. He opened the door and the wind rushed in. Wait, she called. Take my locket for good fortune. She leaned over and took the locket, a bronze sun on a leather lanyard, from the side table. L, that's take it, she insisted. Mincer sold it to my mother, told her it had been blessed by one of Timora's priests. He came back to the bed, took the locket, secreted it in a pocket of his cloak, and gave her another kiss. I'll take all the luck I can get. She smiled. You need a haircut. You'll cut it when I return, he said. Everything will be fine. With that, he headed out into the storm. He opened his mouth to the sky and tasted the rain, found it normal, and thanked Shantia. The crops would live another day. He stood for a moment, alone in the dark, alone with his thoughts, and eyed the village nestled amid the elms. The other cottages sat quiet and dark, each a little nest of worry and want. The dozen or so elms rose like colossuses from the plains, whispering in the wind. The rain beat a drumbeat on his cloak. Jarek had always liked to think that the elms protected the village, wood guardians that would never let harm befall those who sheltered under their boughs. He decided to keep thinking it. Holding his bow, he pulled up his hood and cut across the commons to the pond, where he filled his water skin. Then he headed up the rise and toward the open plains. Chapter 3 
The limbs of the malformed trees rattled in the wind and rain. Sayid recalled the Sembia of a century before, before the spell plague, even before the shadow storm. Fields of barley, forests filled with game, rivers that ran fast and clear, merchants everywhere. But all of that was dead. Like him, Sembia was alive while dead. The last time Sayid had walked the Sembian plains, the nation had been in the midst of a civil war, and he and Ziad had worn the uniforms of the overmistress's armies. They and many others had been captured and maimed at the order of a Lathandarian, Avalar Corinthal. Sayid had taught himself to fight left-handed over the intervening years, and now Sembia was in the midst of a war again. Damp air and bad memories caused the nub of Sayid's thumb to ache distantly. Why do you slow? Ziad barked over his shoulder. Sayid had not realized he had slowed. He hurried forward, the cats eyeing him as he moved through them to his brother's side. Ziad's hood obscured his face. I was thinking. About? The plains dredge up old memories. Ziad grunted. I was thinking about the spell plague, about why we were changed as we were. I wonder if there's purpose in it. Ziad spat, the cats pouncing on the spittle. There's no purpose in it. We were on that ship when the blue fire struck, just the wrong place at an ill time. And we were there because of this. Ziad held up his own right hand, the stump of his thumb a mirror of Saeed's, although marred with scales and a malformed joint. And we owe that to Avalar Corinthal. Look for no more meaning than that. Men do awful things to other men. That's the world. That's the world, Saeed echoed. We'll be free of all this soon, Ziad said. The Lord of the Eighth promised... We need only find him the sun. The sun. They'd been seeking their prey for decades, scouring Faroon. By now, the son of Erevis Kale would be an old man. Or dead. You think this oracle will tell us how to find him? Sayid asked. We'll make him tell us, Ziad said. And if the sun is already dead of age, we'll find out where his corpse is and give that to Mef to the Lord of Cania, and he will free us. Come on, we must find a village. Ziad picked up his pace, his gait lumbering, awkward, bestial. Sayid fell in after him. Over the next several hours, the rain picked up until it fell in brown, stinking sheets. The whipgrass under their feet squirmed at the foul water's touch. Do you require shelter? Sayid asked Ziad. Sleep? No, his brother said, in a voice deeper than usual. The hood of Ziad's cloak hid his face. You know what I require, and I require it soon. They hustled through the rain, the wet ground sucking at their boots, the anticipatory cries of the hungry cats driving Sayid to distraction. His brother wheezed, coughed frequently, and spat a black globule every few steps, to the delight of the cats who feasted on it. After a time, moans began to slip through Ziad's lips, and his form roiled under his robes. Sayid could not help but stare. He'd never seen his brother so bad. Stop looking at me, Ziad said to Sayid, half turning his cowled head, his speech slurred and wet from malformed lips. Sayid licked his lips and looked away, queasy. The plains looked the same in all directions. The road they traveled appeared to lead nowhere. He feared they would not be able to stop whatever was soon to happen to his brother. A small, secret part of him wished that whatever was to happen would happen. His brother disgusted him. Their lives disgusted him. He tried to exercise the traitorous thoughts with the half-hearted offer of aid. How can I help, Ziad? Ziad whirled on him. You find me a vessel, or become one yourself. Sayid's eyes narrowed. 
His hand went to the hilt of his blade. As one, the cats turned to face him, all eyes and teeth and claws. He tightened his grip on the hilt, prepared to draw. But a sound carried out of the rain, the distant scream of a woman from somewhere ahead. The cats arched their backs, cocked their heads. You heard it? Ziad asked, still eyeing Saeed out of the depths of his cowl. It's not a phantasm of my mind. I heard it, Saeed said slowly and relaxed his grip on the blade. More screams carried through the rain, terrified wails, dogs barking feverishly. Someone requires aid. Come on, Ziad said, turning and staggering over the wet earth toward the screams. Despair raised his voice. Hurry, I can't continue like this. They ran over the slick earth, Saeed leading, the cats trailing. Twice Ziad slipped and fell. Twice Saeed turned back, lifted his brother to his feet, and felt the flesh and bone of his brother's body swell and roil under his touch, as if something were nested in his flesh, squirming underneath it in an attempt to burst forth. Bile touched the back of his throat, and Shock pulled a question from him before he could block it with his teeth. What in the hells is in you, Ziad? Ziad kept his cowled head turned away from his brother. His voice was guttural. I told you before, I don't know. He put something in me. To make sure I did his work, it'll change me. He shoved Saeed ahead. Please, hurry! Closer now, Saeed distinguished the screams of several women and men, the frantic barking and growls of not one but two dogs. He topped a rise and crouched low amid a stand of broadleaf trees. Ziad crawled into position beside him, wheezing and moaning. The cats formed up around them, silent and staring. Below them, the ribbon of the packed earth wagon road stretched east to west, Two wagons lay overturned on it. A flotsam of household goods lay scattered in the grass. Rain-sodden blankets, a small table, broken stoneware. Two bodies lay among the debris, both torn open at the abdomen. The ropes of their entrails smeared on the grass, glistening in the rain. A third corpse lay a few paces from the first two, arms and legs at grotesque angles the skin drawn tightly against the bones, mummified as if sucked dry. A misshapen, bipedal creature twice as tall as a man stood in the road. It appeared almost skeletal, but sickly black flesh and bands of muscle wrapped the bones here and there. Overlong arms ended in finger-length black talons, and large pointed ears walled a hairless, misshapen head. Green light burned in the depths of its sunken eye sockets. The fanged mouth was opened wide, and a pink tongue, as thick as Saeed's wrist and as long as his forearm, dangled grotesquely from the opening. Currents of dark energy swirled around it, gathered on its claws. It shrieked in hunger and hate, a high-pitched ear-splitting sound that would have stood Saeed's hair on end a hundred years earlier. Ziad coughed, spat a globule of dark phlegm. The cats pounced and consumed the black mass in a moment. It's a devourer, an undead that draws power from the shadow fell. Two men, simple villagers to judge from the homespun they wore and the wooden axes they wielded as weapons, circled the devourer at a distance of two paces, the weapons trembling in their grasps. A mastiff, barking frenetically, harried the devourer opposite the two men. A boy's body lay on the ground near the devourer's feet, his head nearly ripped from its neck. A girl lay not far from the boy, her dress torn and covered in mud, face down, unmoving. The bodies of the three other children lay around the road, their clothes and bodies torn, pieces of them scattered about like the wagon's debris. Two women hovered on the outskirts of the combat, shouting, cursing, crying, hurling rocks and stones and whatever they could find at the devourer, all to no effect. A second mastiff stood near the women, barking and growling. Run! The tall bearded man shouted to the women. 
Run! I won't leave you, the thick-set woman answered, crying. Leave us be, creature! The bearded man lunged forward, axe held high. Before he could bring his weapon to bear, dark energy flared around the devourer, a cloud of darkness veined with green streaks that knocked the man from his feet. The second man, much younger, perhaps the first man's son, shouted in anger, bounded forward, and sank his axe into the devourer's leg. The weapon barely bit, and the devourer showed no sign of pain. The creature lashed out with its overlong arm and claw and caught the young man across the face. The impact spun the youth completely around. Blood sprayed, and he fell to the mud without a sound. As he fell, the younger of the two women screamed in despair, her hands clasped before her as if in prayer. The dog's barking grew manic. The heavier woman tried to pull the younger girl away, but she seemed frozen to the spot. The devourer lumbered forward, grasping the older bearded man and lifted him triumphantly into the air. The man's arms were pinned against his body, his axe hanging futilely from his fist. Run! The man screamed at the women, his face twisted with pain and fear. Please run! The devourer pulled the man close and ran its tongue over his face, leaving a road of blood and blisters and a ruined eye in its wake. The man wailed, legs kicking against the devourer's chest, all to no effect. The devourer opened its fanged mouth as if in glee, tongue dangling. The dark energy that animated the creature spun and whirled in a black cloud around the man and the undead. Green lines flared within the cloud, baleful veins connecting the man to the devourer. The man's screams rose to a high pitch and then turned to a distorted wail as his body began to shrink in on itself, the whole of his mouth appearing to get larger as the skin drew tight against his bones. The green lines pulsed, netted the dying man. A green glow formed within the devourer's abdomen. A vile egg. The energy flared, causing Saeed to see spots, and the man's wails stopped. When his vision cleared, Saeed saw the devourer drop the shriveled, lifeless form of the man to the mud and turn to face the women. Within the devourer's abdomen, caged by the bars of its ribs, squirmed a tiny, naked effigy of the man, the devourer pregnant with horror. The effigy's eyes and mouth were wide with pain and terror. Saeed knew what had occurred. The devourer had caged the man's soul and would use it to power its own unholy force. Seeing that, the women finally broke entirely. They shrieked and turned to run. The older slipped and fell in the mud, and the younger turned to help her. The devourer keened. Green energy flared from the effigy in its abdomen, traveled to its claws, and shot out toward the women and their dog. It struck all of them at once, and the barking and screaming ended, cut off as if by a blade. All three fell to the sodden earth, limp. The tiny body within the devourer watched it all and opened its mouth in a wail of despair, the devourer ran its tongue over its lips and fangs, shuddered as if in ecstasy. The surviving dog whined, turned circles in its agitation. Saeed stared at the small form of the trapped soul, wondering if he could die were his soul so trapped. It had been so long since he'd rested. He wondered if he could find peace in the belly of a horror. What would it be like to have his soul slowly... What are you doing? Ziad said, I need someone alive. Ziad stood and pushed past Saeed while drawing his sword. He spoke words of power, his voice ragged and deep, and extended his blade in the direction of the devourer. A twisting spiral of smoking deep red flames exploded from the steel and slammed into the devourer's chest. The creature staggered backward, bent, flesh charred and smoking, steadying itself by placing one clawed hand on the wet ground. Its green eyes scanned the rise, fixed on Ziad and Saeed, and flashed with unholy light. It crouched, flexed its claws, and shrieked. 
The cats hissed in answer. The surviving dog took to barking and growling, but did not get within the devourer's reach. The soul of the trapped man writhed, veins of green energy pulsing from it to feed the devourer. Black energy swirled from the devourer's form, green light flared in its abdomen, and the tiny effigy of the man imprisoned there squirmed, shrinking ever smaller as the devourer consumed him for power. As the effigy shrank, the burns Ziad had inflicted on the flesh of the devourer healed, the flesh knitting closed. A coughing fit seized Ziad, and he bent double, slipped in the wet, and fell to the grass on all fours. His form twisted under his clothing, getting taller, thinner. Saeed started to help him up, feeling his brother's bones twisting, but Ziad pushed him away. Go! he said and coughed. That's all I can do for now. Saeed stood, drew his blade, and readied his shield. Ziad's hand reached up and closed on his wrist. His brother's hand was feverishly hot, although he still kept his visage hidden within the cowl. That creature cannot give you peace, Saeed. Your soul and mind would live on in its form, regenerating constantly, forever sating its appetite. You would suffer eternally. Another cough then. The Lord of the Eighth has promised me a cure, promised us a cure. Only through him will we find an end to this. He has already gifted me with hellfire. You saw, Saeed, you saw. The devourer shrieked again and padded across the grass toward them, stepping heedlessly on the corpses of those it had slain, driving the bodies deeper into the mud. I saw, Saeed said to his brother. He didn't trust Ziad. He hated Ziad. But what choice did he have? The devourer broke into a loping run. Saeed didn't wait for it. He roared and ran down the rise, his armor clanging, meeting the creature's charge head on. The thrill of battle filled him, the only thing he felt with clarity anymore. They closed in five strides. The devourer slashed with one of its huge claws, but Saeed deflected it with his shield and did not slow, instead slamming his body into the devourer's larger form while he drove his blade into the creature's abdomen, through the effigy, and up through the neck. The enchanted blade vibrated gleefully in his hands as it found purchase in flesh, and the movement made the already deep wound jagged, more painful. The devourer and the effigy both keened with pain. Dark energy swirled around them, a black fog that pulled at whatever withered bits of Saeed's soul remained. The stink of the creature, like a charnel house, filled Saeed's nostrils. The devourer shoved him away, nearly causing him to slip on the wet earth, and bounded after him, claws slashing. Saeed parried with his shield and ducked under another blow, but the creature pressed, heedless of Saeed's blade. Saeed slashed the creature's arms, leg, but the devourer grabbed his face with an enormous clawed hand and squeezed, the nails piercing Saeed's cheeks, penetrating gums and scraping teeth. Blood poured into Saeed's mouth. He felt no pain, but nearly vomited at the taste of the creature's foul digits in his mouth. With preternatural strength, the devourer lifted Saeed by his head and cast him five paces away. Saeed hit the ground in a clatter of metal, rolled with the momentum, and bounced to his feet. Already the flesh of his face was knitting closed. He spat out the taste of the devourer's fingers and a mouthful of blood. The devourer cocked its head and licked its fangs with the rope of its tongue, perhaps puzzled that Saeed had not remained prone. Saeed's weapon shook in his hands, hungry for more violence. Saeed, eager to feed it and high on the rush of battle, roared and charged anew. He blocked an overhead claw strike with his shield and cleaved the creature at the knee. His blade bit through flesh and sheared bone, severing the leg. As the devourer fell, it lashed out with its other claw, catching Saeed on the shoulder, ripping through mail and flesh and spinning him around with the impact. A blast of dark energy from the devourer engulfed him, cooled his body, and once more pulled at his soul. 
His rage proved the hotter, and he resisted the dark magic. He spun and drove his blade downward into the prone creature's chest. He left it there, pinioning the creature to the ground, while the devourer tore at his legs and abdomen. Black energy from the devourer churned around him, a seething cloud of unholy power. Saeed felt the blood running warm from his body, but ignored it. Straddling the creature, he took his shield by the sides, lifted it high, and slammed the sharpened edge of its bottom into the devourer's neck. The slab of enchanted metal severed the devourer's head, ending its shrieking, extinguishing the green light in its eyes. The dark energy around Saeed subsided as the head fell away from the body, tongue still dangling from its mouth like some grotesque pennon. Saeed stood over the corpse while the rain fell, while his body healed its wounds. With battle over, the rush left him, and he once more returned to his usual emptiness. The devourer's corpse began to leak shadows, the stink of them like rotting meat. Its flesh fell away from bones that began to crumble. The trapped soul in its abdomen, like a malformed fetus, was the last to go, screaming as it dissolved into putrescence. As Saeed watched the rain wash the stain of the creature from the plains, he recognized that he was no more human than it had been. He should have felt fatigue, soreness, pain, but he did not. He occupied flesh, he moved, but he felt nothing, not unless he was killing something. Standing there, he realized there was nothing left in him but hate for himself, for his brother, for the world. The spell plague had done more than transform his body. It had transformed his soul, robbed him of hope. He'd once tried to kill himself, slitting his own throat with a dagger. For a brief, glorious moment, his vision had blurred and sleep and death had seemed within reach, but his flesh had healed far more quickly than he could bleed out. He wanted to die, but the world would not let him. Hearing his brother shambling near, he recovered himself, his blade, his shield. He used the grass to wipe the ichor from both. His brother was grunting like a beast. Saeed tried to block out the sound, tried to quell the impulse to drive his blade into Ziad's guts expose whatever foulness polluted his brother's flesh. The surviving dog hovered at a distance, whimpering, unwilling to approach. Saeed sheathed his blade and turned to the dog. Here, boy, come. The mastiff bared its fangs, turned a circle, whined, and did not come any closer. Animals always saw them for what they were, he and his brother. Ziad lumbered among the carnage, gasping, awkward with the bulges and swells forming under his robes. The cats followed, their eyes glowing red in the dim light. Are none alive? Saeed, are none alive? Ziad sounded as if he might weep. Saeed felt nothing for him. Saeed! Saeed sighed, sheathed his weapon, and slung his shield. He went to the women the younger and the older, and kneeled beside them, found them both dead. The men and all the children were dead, too. All except one. The girl is alive, he said, and gently rolled her over onto her back. She looked pale, her dark hair pulled back and tied with a leather tie. Her breast rose and fell with her shallow breaths. She might have been fifteen winters old. The dog whined. The cats hissed at it, eyed it hungrily. Excellent, excellent, Ziad said and waddled over. His voice was wet, as if he had a mouthful of liquid. Leave her to me. Leave her, Saeed. Saeed stood, backed away a few steps. He made another attempt to win over the dog. He didn't know why, but the mastiff would have none of it. Ziad kneeled at the girl's side, cradled her in his arms, and spoke words of healing. They came awkwardly to his brother's lips, accustomed as they were to uttering arcane words that harmed. The girl moaned, and her eyes fluttered open. Saeed saw the panic form in them. Let me go! Let me go! Be at ease, girl, 
Ziad said, his words sloppy, wet with drool. You're safe now. Saeed realized that his mouth was dry, and that he still had the taste of the devourer in his mouth. Odd that he could barely taste even the finest food, but the foulness of a devourer lingered. He drank from his water skin, swished, spit. Thunder boomed. The cats ringed Ziad and the girl, although they stared out at the growling dog with an unmistakable hunger in their eyes. What happened? the girl asked. Who are you? Where are Mama and Papa? Ziad used his roiling girth to shield the girl from the sight of the corpses. You were attacked. You were with your family? She craned her neck and looked around Ziad at the carnage. Saeed saw her expression fall, saw the light fade from her eyes. She had just died, although her body still lived. In that moment, she had become him. Not my mom and dad. Oh, no. Oh, no. Tears leaked from her eyes, snot from her nose. Ziad daubed at both, as gentle as a wet nurse, and wrapped the distraught girl in his overlong arms, enveloping her in his cloak. His body pulsed and seethed under the sodden cloth. There, there, my girl, he said, his voice the gentle roll of thunder before the lightning. It's all over now. Sobs shook the girl's small frame. The cats milled in a circle around them, their meows like a question. Ziad tried to shoo them while tending the girl. His hand poked from his cloak, and Saeed saw its malformation, the claws, the leathery skin, the fingers almost twice the length they should have been. That creature, the girl said through her sobs. It was awful. Oh, father. There now, Ziad said. The creature is no more, and that's all that matters. What's your name? Lonnie, the girl said, her voice muffled by Ziad's cloak. Lonnie Rab. That's a beautiful name, Ziad said, and stroked her hair. Saeed took another drink from his water skin. He wished it was wine. He wished he could drink himself into unawareness, but even drunkenness was denied him. He toyed with the idea of decapitating Ziad, an idle thought that made him smile. The mastiff whined, barked uncertainly, sniffed the air, hackles raised. The dog won't come, Saeed said, because he had nothing else to say, and the silence was awful. The dog turned a circle, agitated, spit frothed on its muzzle. It began to shiver as if in fear, but did not abandon the girl. That's our dog, said Lonnie. Papa's dog. What's its name? Ziad asked. King, she said. King, Ziad said. That's a fine name. We'll see to the dog. He waved an arm in the direction of the dog, and the cats tore off past Saeed toward King. The guttural sounds that emerged from their mouths were nothing Saeed had ever heard from cats. The dog barked once in alarm, wheeled around, and fled, the cats in pursuit. What is this? Ziad asked, his malformed fingers closing on a charm the girl wore on a leather thong around her neck. Is it amber? Mom gave it to me for my fifteenth life day. It's beautiful, Ziad said, his clumsy fingers nearly dropped the amber charm. Oh, Mom! the girl said, and melted into Ziad's grasp, sobbing. Ziad stroked the girl's hair harder, harder. That hurts, she said. I know, Ziad said. I know. Stop, she said, fear creeping into her voice. You're hurting me. I can't stop, Ziad said, his voice guttural. Please. I'm sorry, Ziad said, his voice little more than grunts. The girl pulled back, looked up into his cowl, and her eyes widened. What's wrong with your face? Oh, gods, help, help! Saeed had braced himself, but the girl's screams still hit him like a knife stab. 
He wanted to turn away, but his feet seemed rooted in place, stuck in the mud, stuck in the horror of his life with his brother. Ziad held the struggling, screaming girl in his hands, his form roiling, and half turned to Sayid, his face thankfully lost in the shadow of his cowl. Stop looking at me, Sayid! The words freed Sayid to move. He turned away, bile in the back of his throat, acrid, harsh. Lonnie screamed, a pitiful, terrified shriek. One kiss for your savior, Ziad grunted in the voice of a beast. He began to cough, to heave. Just one! Help! Help! The girl's pleading stopped, replaced by muffled sounds of terror, a wet gurgling. Saeed tried not to hear his brother's wretches, the girl's abortive wails, the final violent wet heave, followed by blissful silence. Saeed stared off at the plains, at the darkness, at the rain, and tried to make his mind as blank as his emotions. It's done, Ziad said at last. Saeed steeled himself and turned. His brother his form more normal than it had been in a ten-day, stood over the limp, prone form of the girl. She looked tiny on the ground, her arms thrown out, her head thrown back like a broken flower. Open eyes stared up into the rain. A rivulet of black phlegm hung from the corner of her mouth. The tendril of black mucus wriggled like a living thing and disappeared into her mouth. She was a girl, Saeed said. Just a girl. I know that, Ziad said, wincing. Do you think I don't know that? This is the price I must pay to keep the curse at bay. He holds me between worlds to ensure I do his work and find the sun. Mephistopheles? Thunder rumbled and the darkness seemed to deepen. Do not say his name, Ziad said in a hiss. He looked about, eyes wide with fear. Somewhere, out in the plains, the dog, King, yelped with pain. We can't continue like this, Saeed said dully. I can't. We'll have release, Ziad said. We'll need only find the sun. Bear with it a while longer. In the years they'd sought Kale's son, Ziad's divinations had revealed nothing. Consultations with seers and prophets had not availed them. It was as if the sun had fallen out of the multiverse. But recently, Ziad's divinations had pointed them to the legendary oracle of the Abbey of the Rose. The oracle will know how to find him, Ziad said. Saeed looked past his brother to the girl, Lani, lying still in the grass among the corpses of her family. He hoped the oracle would know. Saeed just wanted to sleep. He'd never wanted anything more in his life. His brother had turned into a monster serving the Lord of Cania. Saeed had turned into a monster serving his brother. The cats padded out of the shadows, their paws and muzzles covered in the dog's blood. They stopped, sat, and licked their paws clean while they eyed Saeed and Ziad. Saeed didn't want to see the remains of the dog, if there were any. He turned back to his brother to find him staring at the cats. Why do we keep doing this, Ziad? I'm so tired. Ziad peeled his eyes from the bloody felines. Because we must. Because my pact with him is the only hope we have. And because I'm getting worse. Vaisin's adoptive father, Derek, had buried Vara in the common cemetery atop a rise in the eastern side of the valley. When Derek died, Vaisin laid him to rest beside Vara. They'd known each other only a short time, but Derek had insisted that he be buried beside Vara in the cemetery for lay folk rather than in the catacombs under the abbey. The stones that marked their graves were the same as those that marked all the other graves on the rise. A simple piece of limestone etched along the bottom with the spraying lines of the rising sun. Vaisin sat on his haunches before the graves. 
He'd plucked two of the pale orchids that grew at the base of the mountains and placed one on each of their graves. Rest well, he said. I'll return when I can. He stood, turned, and looked out and down the valley. The Abbey of the Rose sat in a deep wooded valley, a gash hidden in the heart of the Thunder Peaks. A hundred years earlier, the oracle, then only a child, had led the first pilgrims to the valley, telling them that it was a protected place into which the Shadowvar could not see. We will be a light to their darkness, he'd said, or so the story went. And as with all of the oracle's pronouncements, the words had proven true. The veil had remained unmolested by enemies, its location a secret to all but a select number of the faithful. Ringed on three sides by cracked limestone cliffs that merged with the sloped sides of pine-covered mountains, the veil felt like a world unto itself, a pocket of light in the heart of shadow, a singular thing like the rarely seen sun. Vason loved it. Foaming cascades from melting glaciers poured out of the notches in the eastern and northern cliff faces, falling with a roar to the valley floor. The rushing waters joined to form a fast-moving river that bisected the vale before carving its way farther down the mountains. Smaller brooks and streams branched from the river to feed the vale's lush vegetation. Dozens of tarns dotted the terrain, their still waters like dark mirrors. Vason took one last look back at his mother's grave, at Derrick's, then headed down the rise. When he reached the valley floor, he picked his way along the many walking paths that lined the pine forests. Pilgrims had trod the same paths for decades. Nesting cowbirds fluttered unseen in the branches. They'd head for warmer air to the south soon. From time to time, the canopy thinned enough overhead that he could glimpse the sky, the whole of it the gray of old metal, as if the shadow var had encased the world in armor. Despite the impenetrable sky, Vason's faith allowed him to perceive the sun's location. He always knew where he could find the light, yet he felt comfortable, even welcome in the shadows. He credited his blood for that and it only rarely bothered him. He had mostly reconciled himself to his dual existence. He told himself that his connection to both light and shadow gave him a better appreciation of each. He existed in the nexus of light and shadow, a creature of both, but a servant of only one. His hand went to the rose symbol the oracle had given him, silver under the tarnish, light under the darkness. Where will you go when I die? The oracle had asked him. He kicked a piece of dead wood and frowned. He could scarcely conceive of the oracle's death. The oracle was the fixed star of Vason's existence. Vason's sworn purpose was to protect him. Without the oracle, without the oath, what would Vason have? Who would he be? He didn't know. He lacked family and friends without a purpose. He inhaled deeply to clear his somber mood. The air was thick with the smell of pine and wildflowers, the scent of his home. Wisdom and light, Dawn Father, he said softly. Wisdom and light. Ahead, a beam of sunlight escaped the cloak of the shadowed sky and cut a line down through the pines, a golden path that extended from the hidden sun to the hidden veil. Vason whispered his thanks and hurried forward to the boon. He placed his hand in the beam's light and warmth. Shadows leaked from his dark flesh, the blade of a monitor's sun, and the darkness of his blood coexisting in the light. The beam lasted only a few moments before the sky swallowed it again, but it was enough. The Dawn Father had heard and answered. His spirits lightened. Vason turned the direction of his thoughts from his own concerns to those of the pilgrims he would soon lead out into the dark. He asked a monitor for wisdom and strength, prayed that his light and that of the Dawn Swords would be enough to see them all to safety. 
A voice broke the spell of solitude. Well met, Dawn Sword. Surprise pulled a rush of shadows from Vason's flesh. He turned to see one of the pilgrims standing on the path a few paces behind him. The man had come with the most recent group from the war-torn Dalelands. The light keep you, Vason said, recovering himself enough to offer the standard greeting between believers. Are you lost? I can escort you to the abbey if— The man smiled and approached— he wore a gray cloak, dark breeches, and a loose tunic. The compact stride of his lithe frame wasted little motion. Oh, I've been lost for years, but maybe I'm finding my way now. The man's eyes struck Vason immediately, pupilless orbs the color of milk. Vason might have thought him blind had he not moved with such confidence— Tattoos decorated his bald head, his clean-shaven face, and his exposed neck, lines and spirals and whorls that made a map of his skin. He held an oak staff in his hand, and carved lines and spirals grooved its length, too. I didn't hear you approach. Orson, isn't it? So I tell myself these days, and you're Vason. Aye, well met. Vason said and extended a hand. Orson's grip felt as if it could have crushed stone. Do you mind if I join you? Orson asked. I was just walking the veil. Ordinarily, Vason preferred to prepare his mind and spirit in solitude, but he remembered the oracle's admonition. Things change, Vason. Please do. I was just walking too, and the company of a brother in the faith would be welcome. Orson hesitated, an awkward smile hanging from his lips. Something wrong? Basin asked. Not wrong, but I should tell you that I'm not a worshipper of a monitor. Given the context, the words struck Basin as so unlikely that he thought he might have misheard. What? You're not? Orson shook his bald head. I'm not. Now that he thought about it, Vason did not recall seeing Orson at dawn worship, or at any of the oracle sermons, or at anything else associated with the faith. Concern pulled shadows from Vason's skin. He tensed. Then what? Orson held his hands loose at his side. Perhaps he read the concern in Vason's face. I'm not an enemy. All right. Vason said, still coiled, eyes narrowed. But are you a friend? Orson smiled. The expression seemed to come easy to him. I was, once. I'd like to be again. What does that mean? Vason asked. I ask myself the same thing often, Orson said. Vason's faith allowed him to see into a man's soul, and he saw no ill intent in Orson. Besides, the man would have been magically interrogated in the Dalens before being brought to the Vale, and had he been hostile, the spirits of the past would have barred his passage. Still, Vason could not imagine anyone other than a follower of a monitor risking the Sembian countryside to come to the Abbey. I'm at a loss, Vason said. I'll need to tell the Oracle. Oh, he knows. He knows, Orson smiled, shrugged. He does. I'm confused. Why are you here, then? Orson's milky eyes were unreadable. That, too, is something I often ask myself. The answer usually is happenstance. I just follow the wind. Vason could not quite make sense of either the reply or the man. He could tell Orson was not giving him the entire truth, yet he sensed no lie in Orson's words. You're a strange man, Orson. Would it surprise you to know that I've heard that before? Orson chuckled. Does this change your answer? May I still walk with you? Oh, I insist you walk with me now. Very good, then, Orson said and used his staff to scribe a line in the dirt before their feet. I hesitate to ask, Vason said. 
What's that you just did? He wondered if perhaps the man were mentally unsound. Lines mark borders, a beginning. This is before, Orson said, and used his staff to point to the one side of the line. Then he pointed to the other side. This is after. I hope there's a friendship on this side. The words, so guileless, touched Basin. Then I do too, Basin said, and together they stepped over the line. Orson's steps were so light on the undergrowth that they made almost no sound. Where are you from? Basin asked him. He made a note to ask Byrne and Eldris about Orson. In particular, he wanted to know how Orson had slipped through the interrogation they performed on all would-be pilgrims. A non-worshipper getting through suggested a problem. The battles being fought in the Dales could not be an excuse for carelessness. I'm from the east, Telflamar, Orson said. Do you know it? Vason shook his head. It was just an exotic name he'd heard from time to time, although perhaps coming from Telflamar explained Orson's exotic appearance. It's very far from here, Orson said, looking off in the distance. It was changed in the spell plague. What wasn't? True, true, Orson said. And you, where are you from? Vason made a gesture that took in the veil. I'm from here. Sembia? Not Sembia, no. Sembia belongs to the Shadowvar. I was born in this vale, and it belongs to us. Us, Orson said. You're not Shadowvar? Vason had heard the question often from pilgrims, and it no longer offended him. No, I'm something else. Something else, but akin to shadows, yes? Vason held up a hand. Listen, do you hear that? Orson looked puzzled. He cocked his head. The water? Vason nodded. The cascades. They're the first thing I hear when I lead pilgrims to the Vale or return from taking them home. Hearing them, I know I'm home. You walk much, but never far. Vason liked that. Yes, never far. Are you interrogating me, Orson of Telflamar? So it seems, the man said with a grin. You've spent your entire life here? Since the day I was born. Only the Oracle has been here longer. All the others, even the Abbot, rotate in and out. The gloom is not for everyone. No, but it calls those it calls, Orson said, and nothing lasts forever. Orson's words reminded Vason of the Oracle's words earlier. His expression must have turned somber. Orson picked up on it. I'm sorry. Did I speak out of turn? I meant that the darkness couldn't last forever. Vason waved off the apology. No need for sorry. Your words just put me in mind of words someone else said to me recently. I see. And if anything can last forever, I fear it's this darkness. I think not, Orson said. Vason smiled. You're sure you're not a worshipper of the Dawn Father? Very good, Orson said with a chuckle. Very good. The end of Orson's staff put little divots in the earth as they walked. Where are we walking? I'm just following the wind, same as you. They came to the river's edge. The burbling water, shallow and fast-moving, cut a groove in the valley's floor. Trees jutted at odd angles from the steeply sloped bank. Round rocks like cairn stones lined the bank. Vason felt a chill, and it reminded him of the dream of his father. Directly across the river stood another pair of pilgrims, a middle-aged man with a scarred face who held the hand of a plump, long-haired woman, probably his wife. Vason held a hand aloft in greeting and called, The light warm and keep you. The pilgrims stared at him for a moment, finally raised their hands in a tentative wave and mumbled an echo of his blessing. They hurried on without another word.
My appearance makes some uncomfortable, he said, pointing a finger at his eyes, which he knew glowed yellow in dim light. My appearance does the same, Orson said. He looked in the direction the pilgrims had come. Seems unfair, since they owe their safety to you. Fairness does not enter into it, Vaisin said. It's my honor to serve. And true service often demands solitude. Vaisin heard something forlorn in Orson's tone, an echo of his own feelings. You speak as one who knows that firsthand. Orson nodded. I do. Well, neither of us walks alone today, yeah? Very good. Not alone, not today. Abruptly, Vaisin made a decision that surprised him. Come on, I'll show you a place. Orson's eyebrows rose in a question, but his tongue did not utter it. Vaisin followed the bank of the river for a time. Ahead through the thinning pines, he saw the cracked, pale face of the eastern wall of the Vale, and above it, crags like teeth. The shadows of the mountains fell across the forest, darkening the already dim air further. Vaisin felt the deepening darkness draw around him like a blanket, thick and comfortable. He turned right, leaving the river behind. The ground sloped upward, and the pines, older and taller than elsewhere in the vale, towered over them. The scrub overgrew the walking path. Few come this way, Orson observed. I usually come here alone, Vaisin said. He'd always felt drawn to it. Thank you for letting me accompany you then. Eventually they came to Vaisin's destination— a large tarn of still dark water. Tall pines, the oldest in the vale, ringed the water, standing silent, dignified sentinels. One of the tall pines bordering the tarn had fallen over years earlier, blown down in a storm, perhaps. Half of its roots lay exposed, and a portion of it extended out into the tarn. Weather had stripped it of much of its bark, but still it lived. When they stepped within the circle of the trees, sound seemed to fall away. The distant rush of the cascade, the stirring of birds, the hum of the wind, all diminished. Near the tarn there was only stillness, silence, shadows. Orson spoke softly. This place is waiting. Vaisin nodded. That's always been my feeling also. I come here to meditate and commune with the Dawn Father, although he did not say that the tarn pulled at the part of him he owed to Erebus Kale, the dark part, the shadow. Although, Orson prodded, for other reasons, too. Orson looked at the earth, the trees, the tarn. I don't think this is the Dawn Father's place. None come here but you? None but me for a very long time, Vaisin acknowledged. What do you mean, this isn't the Dawn Father's place? Orson did not answer. He glided forward, his pale eyes fixed on the dark water. Vaisin followed, his skin inexplicably goose-pimpled. Who are you, Orson? Vaisin asked. He felt as if much hung in the answer. He wondered why he had brought the man with him to his place of solitude. They'd only just met. He'd been walking with the man for half an hour, and Vaisin knew essentially nothing of him. I think I should take you back to the Abbey, explain matters to the Oracle. I'm a walker, Orson said over his shoulder. He reached under his tunic to remove something, a disc of some kind, a symbol. A hopeful wanderer and a congregation of one. Is that... Orson was nodding. This is the symbol of my faith. This place doesn't belong to the Dawn Father, but it's holy still. And now I know why my path brought me here, why you brought me here. Kneeling at the water's edge, Orson held the symbol, a black disc bordered with a thin red line over the water. Vaisin did not recognize the symbol, but felt as if he knew it. 
He froze when shadows flowed up from the surface of the water to enwrap the symbol, twisted around Orson's hands. Orson murmured words, a prayer that Vason could not hear. Vason looked at his own hands, also leaking shadows. His entire body was swimming in them, wrapped in them. Once more, he felt as if he were living life in a story written for him by another. Write the story. Orson stood and turned to face Vason. His white eyes widened slightly when he saw the mass of shadows swirling around Vason. This place was left here, for me, maybe, but I think more likely for you. You're connected to it, so I'll ask you the same question you asked me. Who are you? Vason looked at his hands, leaking shadows. You're a shade, but not a shadow far. How? Tell me. Vason cleared his throat. He tried to pull the shadows back into his form, but they would not diminish. My father. Orson took a step toward him, his fingers white around the disk of his holy symbol. Who was your father? Vason looked past Orson to the tarn, its deep black water. His name was Erevis Kale. Orson's hands fell slack to his side. That can't be. You've heard his name? I thought you came from the east. Orson took his symbol in both hands, held it to his chest. Erevis Kale died more than a hundred years ago. You're too young to be his son. It's not possible, is it? How can it be? Magic sent my mother here while I was still in the womb. Vason took a step toward Orson, toward the tarn. How do you know my father's name? Vason's hand went to the hilt of his blade. Suspicion lodged in him, grew. Orson seemed not to notice, or not to care if he did. Erevis Kale was the first of the Shadow Lord. Orson brandished the symbol, held it out for Vason to see. The first of Mask. Orson was shaking his head, pacing now along the edge of the tarn. I was led here to see this, to meet you. But why? I don't see it. I don't see it. Vason said nothing, could say nothing, just stood in the midst of the shadows gathering around them. He let his hand fall from the hilt. Orson suddenly stopped, looked over at Vason. This is their place, Vason. Mask, your father, this is their place. For a moment, Vason could not speak. His dreams of Erevis Kale reared up in his mind, dark visions of a cold place. No, Mask is dead. Erevis Kale is dead. This can't be their place. I keep the faith alive, Vason, Orson said. He gestured at the fallen tree. It's like that tree, uprooted by a storm, broken on the rocks, but still it hangs on to life. So too does the Shadow Lord's faith, in me and maybe a few others. You worship a dead god? Not quite dead, Orson said. He pointed at the tarn as if it signified something. This tarn is different from all of the others in the Vale, yes? Vason stepped to Orson's side, his eyes on the water. It is deeper. No one has touched its bottom. The faint light of the dying, shrouded day cast their darkened reflection on the water, faceless and black, only half-formed. You've tried? Once, the water gets too cold, and the depth is too great. It's like a hole. Orson inhaled deeply, put a hand on his hip, and looked up at the mountains. I think I've stood on this ground before. Vason shook his head. You've never been to the Abbey before. I'd remember if you had. Orson smiled, no teeth, just a faint rise at the corners of his mouth. There was no Abbey here then. Vason could not control the swirl of shadows around him. The Abbey has been here since before you were born. The spirit is eternal, Vason, Orson said, nodding at some truth only he understood. 
the body is not. Before going to its final rest, a spirit is often reborn into a new body. Sometimes this happens many times. His wide eyes looked distant as he fixed them on the dark water of the tarn. But the essence of the spirit, its core, is the line that tethers its lives to one another through time, a thread that connects them all. Basin thought he better understood the tattoos on Orson, the grooves in his staff. And you have been reborn many times, he smiled. It seems I have a disquieted spirit. Are you... I don't... I'm not human, Vason, at least not fully. The essence of the plains runs in my veins. In the Dalelands they call me a diva but I've been called other things in other places, in other lives. Asimar, celestial, but Diva suits me well enough, and Orson suits me best. Vason tried to process everything he was learning, to make sense of it. And you came here? Orson shrugged, following the thread of previous lives. I told you the truth. I follow my feet where they lead. His gesture took in the tarn, the veil. I'm here now to see this, to see you, I think. Vason felt the threads of his life being drawn into a knot. His dreams of Erebus, the oracle's words, Derek's admonition to be prepared, the appearance of Orson. Why? To what purpose? Orson disappointed him with a shrug. I don't know. Maybe I'm just walking a path that allows me to meet those I've known before. That'd be pleasant, I think. The hairs on Vason's neck stood on end. Us? Then you think we've known each other before? Orson smiled. I believe so. Vason had no words. He didn't know if he believed Orson, but he could not deny the connection he felt with the diva. He'd felt it the moment he'd seen him, like reuniting with an old friend. That was why he had brought him to the tarn. That was why he had tolerated the questioning. Thank you for bringing me here, Orson said. You've renewed my faith. It had been flagging. You're welcome, Vason managed. Very good, Orson said, chuckling. The diva tucked his holy symbol back under his tunic and took another look around. Odd, not so, that a place holy to the Shadow Lord is in a place holy to the Dawn Father? Perhaps not so odd, Vason said, thinking of his own soul, his own life, the tarnished holy symbol he bore. Orson watched him and seemed to take his meaning. No, perhaps not. Shadows require light, after all. The distant peal of the abbey's bell sounded three times, breaking the spell of the moment. That's the call to gather, Basin said. Neither man moved. Basin eyed the tarn, the trees, seeing all of them as if anew. He took the rose holy symbol in shadow-shrouded hands. Wisdom and light, he whispered. The bells sounded again, three peals. We must go, he said. The pilgrims are to leave the veil. Orson's pale eyebrows rose. All of them? So soon? Vason nodded. Including you, I'm afraid. Why now? Because the oracle commands it. He sees things we cannot. That's his burden. Orson's expression fell, but he recovered with a smile. Strange to say farewell so soon after we met. Strange that I would have come so far only to cross paths with you for so short a time. You won't have to say it quite yet, Basin said. I'll be leading the pilgrim's escort back to the Dales. The war there makes things especially dangerous. I should have gone last time, although then perhaps, he said with a smile, I wouldn't have let you come. Orson chuckled. So the shade but not shadow var will take us back to the sun then. Very good. Very good. The lines of our lives will stay crossed.
for a while longer at least. He scraped another line into the soft earth and eyed Vason. Revelation means a new beginning. We walk together yet, Vason Kale. No one had ever called him Vason Kale before. He allowed that it sounded right. Together, they stepped over the line and walked back toward the abbey. Chapter 4 Jarek followed the seldom-used road out of Fair Elm for a few hours before cutting across the plains. The rising sun's light did not penetrate the dark clouds and rain. It might as well have been midnight. But Jarek knew the terrain well enough to navigate it in the dark. The wet caused his cloak to hang heavy from his shoulders. He did his best to keep his bow dry— as always, he kept his eyes and ears sharp. A lifetime ago, his father used to take him to a wood that was two days' trek out of Fair Elm. Game had been plentiful then, but it had been more than two years since Jarek had ventured there. If Timora smiled on him, he would make it there in safety, take a deer or two, rig a sled, and drag the carcasses back to the village. After drying and smoking the meat, he and El would use it to get them through most of the winter. Fording flooded creeks and picking his way through intermittent stands of broadleaf trees and whispering whipgrass, he made his way toward the wood. He had trod the plains alone before, many times, but it felt different this time. He felt exposed, a man walking a darkness not meant for men. The black pressed against him, made it hard to breathe. The sounds of his breathing and footfalls broke a silence that felt lurking. He crested a rise and looked back the way he had come, hoping to catch a final glimpse of Fair Elm. But the village was gone, swallowed by the darkness. He stood there a moment, reconsidering his decision to leave on a hunt, but finally pushed away the uneasy feeling that plagued him and continued. El and the baby needed real food. As the day wore on to afternoon, the hidden sun lightened the nearly impenetrable ink, turning it merely to oppressive darkness. Around midday, a high-pitched shriek sounded from somewhere out in the black, a terrified distant wail that put Jarek in a crouch and sent his heart to pounding. He did not think it was human, and it was always difficult judging distance on the plains. It could have originated a bow shot away, or it could have originated half a league distant. Moving in a low crouch, he stationed himself behind a rotting broadleaf stump, sweaty hands around the shaft of his bow, and waited. The sound did not recur, and he saw and heard nothing more to give him alarm. After calming himself, he renewed his trek. He walked all day, the wet ground pulling at his boots, as if the earth would suck him down under the sod. Several times he felt certain that eyes were upon him, hungry leers out in the dark, just beyond eye shot. Always he would knock an arrow and put his back to a tree or rock, his senses alert to any sound or motion. But he never saw anything. Twice he doubled back, and once he hid in a ditch, his sword in hand, and lay in ambush, but nothing seemed to be following him, or at least nothing he could see. He told himself that stress was pulling phantasms from his mind. He passed the first day out in the lonely dark without seeing another living creature, except once, a flight of pheasants far too distant to bother with an arrow. The absence of even small game did not bode well for what he might find in the wood. The rain relented by nightfall, and before the air turned once more from merely dark to total pitch, he gathered kindling and wood and found a suitable campsite under a stand of pines that swayed in the rising wind. There was risk in a fire, but he needed the warmth and light. Besides, he'd scratch out a fire pit so the flames wouldn't be visible from too far away. One benefit of the shadowed air... With his sword, he scraped a fire pit out of the wet sod. The kindling resisted his flint and steel, but he eventually won it over, 
and a fitful, smoky fire provided a dim counterpoint to the night. He had never been so happy before in his life to see flames. He stripped off his pack, staked up the tarp that would serve as his tent, and sat before the flames for a time, thinking, trying to keep from shivering. He needed to dry out his cloak, so he shed it and laid it out near the fire. Some kind of animal brayed in the distance. Overhead, he heard the flap of wings, large wings. Furtive movement at the edge of the firelight drew his eye, a small night creature that vanished before he could knock an arrow or note its shape. Sitting out there alone, he turned maudlin. He thought of his father, Fair Elm, the cottage, El, the baby. He realized that he was attached to the farm because it had been his parents, and that was not enough of a reason to stay. Sembia was no place to raise a child. The land did not belong to men anymore, not really. It belonged to the darkness and was no place for his family. Staring into the fire, he decided then and there that he would take El and the baby out of Sembia. Having made the decision, he felt a weight come off him. He considered heading back to the cottage first thing in the morning, but decided against it. He was only a half day away from the woods where he hoped to take a stag. It would take some time for him and El to gather up their things and sell what they couldn't carry. In the interim, they'd have need for some meat. Thunder rumbled in the distance, and his stomach echoed the sound. He thought of just enduring it. He'd gone without food often enough in recent years, but he did not relish the thought of going to sleep hungry. Besides, he'd need energy tomorrow. He remembered whatever small creature had crept up on his campfire, the pheasants he'd seen in the air. There was food out there. He just had to find it. His mind made up, he threw enough wood on the fire to keep it burning for an hour or two and stalked off into the plains. He didn't wander far, wanting to keep the fire visible at all times. Selyun was not visible through the swirl of clouds. Instead, her light created only a dim, shapeless yellow smear in the sky. But once his eyes adjusted, it was enough for him to see by. He realized that he had not had a clear view of the moon in many years. He would do better by his child. In time, he reached a low-lying area of tall whip grass that looked promising. Knife-wing pheasants were migrating south across the inner sea, and the birds roosted in whip grass, feeding on the seeds, grasshoppers, and crickets. He'd seen a flock earlier in the day. They would be grounded for the night. The birds were notoriously keen-eared, so he knew he would not be able to sneak up on one and take it while it nested. He'd just have to be ready when they went airborne. Taking a shot in the dark would be difficult, but the moonlight, feeble as it was, would help. And Timora smiled on the brash. He started forward into the grass, holding his bow in one hand, two foul-tipped arrows in the other. The ground softened as he advanced, and he sometimes skirted puddles. Moving slowly, he imitated the pheasant's ground coup. His father had taught it to him as a boy, and listened for a response. Eventually, soft coos and a rustle of wings answered him. Three, maybe four knife wings were near. He moved closer to the sound, gliding through the terrain like a ghost, and knocked both fouling arrows. He eyed the sky. The moon lightened the clouds enough to provide some contrast with the rest of the darkness. Estimating the location of the pheasants, he circled around to give himself a shooting angle against the light part of the sky. Ready, he gave a sudden sharp whoop that sounded perilously loud in the dark. Wings flapped and five startled knife wings launched into the air, he took aim, two arrows each held between a pair of fingers, tracking their motion. He waited for the birds to rise high enough against the sky to give him a clear shot. When they did, he targeted two near each other, adjusted his finger pressure to alter trajectories, and let fly. The arrows hissed through the rain and struck. 
Feathers flew and both birds spiraled to the ground while the other three vanished into the night. Grinning and pleased to have lost none of his accuracy, Jarek kept his eyes on the exact spot they fell and hurried through the grass. Despite the darkness, he found them after a short search. He'd hit both in the body and both had died instantly. No need to wring necks. He carefully withdrew his arrows from the carcasses, wiped the small amount of blood clean on the grass, and replaced the arrows in his quiver. He carried only four fowling arrows and could not afford to lose them. Grabbing both birds by the neck, he stood and tried to get his bearings from the fire. He didn't see it. Fear tightened his chest. Thunder rumbled closer now, and a light rain started to fall. He imagined the precipitation putting out his fire, leaving him stranded on the plains until morning, and the fear he felt threatened to turn to panic. He cursed, turned a circle, the birds dangling futilely from his fist. He wasn't sure which direction his camp was. He'd gotten turned around when he'd angled himself to take the shot, and now he wasn't sure. He needed to get to some higher ground and to do so fast. The rain was picking up. He eyed the terrain, spotted a rise capped with the twisted, malformed trunks of mature broadleaf trees, and tore off for it. As he ran, he nearly lost a boot to the muck. He climbed the rise, heart racing, and looked around. There, he saw the glow of his fire, maybe two bow shots distant. He did not realize he had come so far. He sagged with relief, hands on his knees. His heart started to slow, his breathing to grow more regular. His legs felt watery under him. And that was when he noticed it. The rain had sputtered out, and the plains were quiet as a grave. Even the night insects had fallen silent. His breathing sounded loud in his ears, too loud. He remembered the whoop he'd used to startle the pheasants. The sound must have been audible for half a league. He cursed in a whisper. He edged toward the broadleaf, wanting to put something at his back, feeling terribly exposed atop the rise. He inhaled deeply, held his breath, remained still, and focused his hearing. Nothing. A breeze from the east kicked up, carrying the faint scent of putrid meat. A dead animal, maybe, or so he hoped. How had he missed it before? Because the wind changed. Damn it, he said. A rotting animal would attract predators. Thunder rumbled again, a promise of renewed rain. He looked at the glow of his fire and considered making a run for it. A natural predator would avoid a fire. But not all predators on the plains were natural. The wind gusted, causing the whipgrass to whisper, the leaves of the broadleaf to hiss, the limbs to creak. A deep-throated bellow sounded from out in the darkness to his right, a wet snarl that reminded him of a rooting pig. His heart leaped against his ribs, and the sound of flapping wings sounded from all around as two score startled knife wings rose into the air. He found it hard to breathe. His muscles failed him, left him standing still in the dark, exposed, alone atop the rise. Sweat ran in cold rivulets down his back. Whatever had made that sound might be able to see him, to smell him. Move, his mind screamed. Move! He felt heavy footsteps thudding into the sod out there in the dark. He had no idea what it could be, but his mind summoned nightmares. He knew that aberrant creatures stalked Sembia's plains, horrors that no man should see. A second grunt carried through the darkness, closer this time, and punctuated with wet inhalations, the sound of a creature with a scent. His scent. It had him. Terror freed him at last. Fueled by adrenaline, he turned and leaped, grabbed hold of the lowest branch on the broadleaf and scrambled up. The sound of his boots on the trunk, his soft grunts of exertion, sounded like shouts in his ears. The creature heard him, for it bellowed loudly, and the heavy tread of its footsteps bounded toward him. He climbed a few limbs higher, frantic, 
awkward, catching scrapes and cuts in his haste, then froze, afraid to make more noise. He was not safe in a tree, not for long. He knew that. He got his feet as steady as he could on a thick limb, clutched his bow in a sweaty palm, and fumbled for one of his arrows. His breath would not slow down. It was loud, too loud. His heart thudded in his chest so hard he swore he could hear it through his ribs. A large form lumbered out of the darkness on two legs, a misshapen bulk half again as tall as a man, and thudded into the broadleaf. The impact caused the tree to shiver, sent a shower of leaves and seed pods earthward, and nearly dislodged Jarek. He caught himself only by firing his knocked arrow wildly as he grabbed for a limb. The tree seemed not to notice the pointed shaft that stuck in the earth near its feet. In shape, it looked vaguely human, and Jarek wondered if it weren't some kind of troll. Folds of flabby skin drooped from its obese arms, legs, and midsection. Torn, muddy rags covered skin the sallow yellow of an old bruise. Long, lank hair hung from the creature's head, a head far too small for the rest of the bloated body, like capping a bucket with a sewing thimble. It circled the base of the tree, sniffing the ground, raising its face to the sky to sniff the air. Small, dark eyes looked out from a pinched face. Its mouth looked malformed, the lips stretched and hugely swollen. Jarek hoped that the foliage and the darkness hid him from the creature. He dared not reach for another arrow, not with the creature right below him. It would see the movement. Another low growl. The creature's stink, like spoiled milk, made Jarek wince. It fell to all fours and sniffed the bowl of the tree where Jarek had gone up. Jarek's breath came fast. Still sniffing, the creature got to its hind legs and put distended hands on the tree, as if it would climb. Its tiny eyes, nearly invisible in the flabby folds of its face, started to work their way up the tree trunk. Jarek tried to shrink into himself, tried to find calm, and failed at both. He moved his hand slowly, so slowly, for his quiver. As his fingers closed on the fletching, the creature froze, cocked its head, and gave a curious grunt. It dropped back to all fours, an eager snort escaped it, and its sniffing took on a note of urgency. It scrabbled around the bowl of the tree, moved away a couple of paces, its face to the wet earth. When it reached the pheasants, the pheasants Jarek had dropped in his panic, it let out a roar of pleasure and seized both in its sausage-like fingers, then began shoving them into its mouth, feathers, bones, and all. The wet slobbering and satisfied grunts of the creature, together with the wet cracking of the bird carcasses, made Jarek nauseous. Still, he took the opportunity to pull an arrow, knock it, and draw. He sighted at the back of the creature's thick neck, figuring he could sever the spine, if not, kill it outright. Something on its neck caught his eye, a leather lanyard, like a necklace. He hesitated, struck by the oddness of its presence. The creature bounded a few steps away, perhaps searching for more pheasant, and its movement took it clear of Jarek's firing line. The boughs of the broadleaf blocked the shot. Moving slowly, his eyes fixed on the wrinkles of the creature's neck, he shifted his position. The limb creaked under his feet. The creature's head jerked up, wide nostrils flaring as it sniffed the air. Jarek froze awkwardly, the muscles of his calf already starting to scream. Sweat oozed from his pores. He still did not have a good shot. He might have to just risk shifting position again. The creature growled, a deep, wet sound, the tone of it, calculating, suspicious, put Jarek's hair on end. He'd get only one shot, if that. He sighted along the arrow shaft, waited for the creature to move into position. It held its head cocked, lank hair spilling to the side. It was listening. It shifted on its weight, its feet sinking into the soft earth. A single loud pop from the night... The wet wood from Jarek's distant fire caused the creature to snort and Jarek to start. The creature roared and tore off in the direction of Jarek's camp, the stumps of its feet puckering the sod as it went. 
Jarek did not hesitate. The moment the creature disappeared into the night, he dropped from the tree, bow in hand, and ran in the opposite direction of the camp, until he reached a natural ditch. He slid into it, soaking his clothes in mud and organic stink. It would help mask his smell, and remained still. The creature's roars carried across the plains. A shower of sparks went up from the area of the campsite. The creature's form, a frenzied silhouette in the dim light of the floating embers. It was destroying the camp. He cursed, thinking of his lost gear, thinking of El's locket still sitting in the pocket of his cloak. The creature rampaged through his camp for a time, and then the plains once more fell silent. To be safe, Jarek waited another half hour, cold and shivering. All remained quiet. He crept out of the ditch and ran in a crouch for the campsite. He didn't care about anything there except L's locket. Brennis stood in the doorway of his scrying chamber, a tarnished solid silver scrying cube, two paces wide on each side, rested on the floor in the center of the round vaulted room. Shadows curled around the cube in thin wisps, the dim light of the tears of Selyun, their glow diffused by the shadowed air of Sakor's enclave, gleamed feebly through the vaulted glass-steel roof. His homunculi, tiny twin constructs made from dead flesh and Brennus's own blood, climbed down his robes from their usual perch on his shoulders and pelted across the chamber ahead of him. They took turns tripping each other, clambering over one another in their haste, a chaotic ball of leathery gray skin, thin limbs, high-pitched expletives, and squeals of outrage. Smiling, Brennus followed them until he stood before the cube. In his hand, he held his dead mother's platinum necklace. He'd found it a hundred years earlier, and plumbing its mystery had been his obsession ever since. Her ghost haunted his thoughts, her voice whispering two words in his mind over and over. Avenge me. Again and again over the decades he returned to his scrying cube, his divinations, seeking a way, any way, to make his brother Rivalin pay for the murder of their mother. But always the exercise ended in frustration. Rivalin was too powerful for Brennus to confront. Brennus had caught hints of a plan by mask to foil Shar and anything that hurt Char would also hurt Rivalin, but they remained only hints. He couldn't see how things fit together. He'd thought for a long time that Erebus Kale's son, by Vara, would play some role, but the son had seemingly vanished from the multiverse. Brennus had watched Vara, pregnant with the boy, disappear from the forest meadow, and he'd never been able to locate her. One hundred years had passed since then. Vara and the child would be dead by now. He thought all of it might have some connection to the mysterious Abbey of the Rose, a temple to a monitor supposedly hidden somewhere in the Thunder Peaks. After all, Erebus Kale had been allied with worshippers of a monitor at the Battle of Sakors. But Brennus had never been able to divine the location of any temple in the Thunder Peaks, and now he wondered if the Abbey of the Rose wasn't a myth. So, with nothing else to go on, Brennus was reduced to compulsively spying on his brother, waiting and hoping for an opportunity, a moment of vulnerability that he suspected would never come. Look now, asked the homunculi, their two voices synchronous. Yes. The homunculi squealed with delight and clambered up his cloak, their tiny claws snagging but not harming the magical fabric. They took their usual station, one on each of his shoulders, bookends to his head. Show, show, they said. Brennus put a hand on the smooth, cool face of the scrying cube and uttered the words to a divination. Goaded by the magic, the smears of tarnish began a slow swirl. Abruptly, the face of the cube took on dimension, depth, the swirls and whorls of black constituted themselves into recognizable shapes. The dark city, 
the homunculi said, their tones hushed. Or Doolin, Brennus said, but it hasn't been a city for a long time. Maps called it the Maelstrom, and not even the Lords of Shade set foot within it. None save one. The scrying cube showed Ordulin from high above. The dark, miasmic air around the ruined city made everything look dull, diffuse, cloudy pigments on a surreal painting. Once grand buildings lay in shattered heaps, the broken bones of a broken city. Streaks of green lightning split the sky from time to time, ghastly veins of light that cast the ruins in viridian light. Shadows formed and dissipated in the air, wisps of reified darkness. Undead flitted among the bleak ruins, specters, living shadows, ghosts, wraiths, hundreds of them, thousands, the glow of their eyes like a sky of baleful stars. The hole in the center of the maelstrom, the hole his brother and his brother's goddess Shar had created when they'd loosed the shadow storm on Sembia, drew undead the way a corpse drew flies. Or Doolin was a graveyard, haunted by its past and ruled by Brennus's brother, who had murdered their mother. He held up a hand and intoned a refinement to the scrying ritual. The homunculi mimed his gesture, murmuring nonsense syllables. The perspective in the face of the cube changed, and the arcane eye of the divination streaked toward the blasted ground, wheeled through the shattered stone and wood, and stopped in the center of the ruins, at the edge of what once was a large open plaza. Chunks of weathered statuary and jagged blocks of a fallen citadel lay scattered across the cracked flagstones, monuments to destruction. A shield-sized hole hung in the air in the center of the plaza, a colorless distortion in reality that opened onto nothing, an emptiness so profound that looking at it for more than a moment made Brennus nauseated. The homunculi squealed and pulled the loose folds of his robes before their eyes. It seemed slowly to swirl, but Brennus was never certain. What he was certain about was that the hole represented the end to everything. He'd noticed that it grew over time, a minuscule amount each year, the mouth of Shar that would eventually devour the world. He hated it, hated Shar, hated his brother, who was her nightseer, her chosen, and a godling in his own right. Rivelin sat at the edge of the hole on the cracked face of a once enormous statue. He stared into the maelstrom, his hands in his lap, unmoving. As always, Brennus wondered what Rivelin thought of when he looked into the work he'd wrought, the apocalypse he'd sown. Did he welcome it? Regret it? Did he even think like a man anymore? The wind stirred Rivelin's cloak and his long, dark hair. Shadows leaked from him in long tendrils. He stared at the hole as if he could see something within it, as if he wanted something from it. The night's here, the homunculi said, and covered their faces with their clawed hands. Brennus said nothing, merely watched his brother a long while. He had no purpose in it anymore, other than to fuel his hate and remind himself of his mother. He relaxed his grip on the necklace he held. I'm going to kill you, he promised his brother. Shadows oozed from his skin, swirled around him, marked his anger with their churn. For her. I'm going to kill you for her. I'll find a way. The homunculi, sensing his frustration and sadness, patted his head with their tiny hands and made cooing noises. A cascade of green lightning veined the sky above Ordulin. Brennus blinked in the sudden glare, and when the spots cleared from his eyes, he saw that his brother was gone. He saw only the hole, the ruins. Knights here gone, the homunculi said. Before Brennus could acknowledge them, a voice spoke from behind him. Gone from there said Rivelin's deep voice, as the power of his presence filled the room and put pressure on Brennus's ears. Because I've come here.
The homunculi squealed in terror and curled up in the cowl of Brennus's cloak, trembling. Brennus swallowed and turned to face his brother. Rivalin's golden eyes glowed in the dusky crags of his angled face. The darkness in the room coalesced around him, as if drawn to his form. The weight of his regard threatened to buckle Brennus's knees, but he thought of his mother and held his ground. Every day I feel your eyes on me, Brennus. Brennus felt his back bump up against the still warm metal of the scrying cube. He relied on his hate to give him courage. Then perhaps you felt my hate, too. His words caused the homunculi to squeal with alarm and try to burrow more deeply into his cowl, but Rivalin's neutral expression did not change. Yes, I've felt it, Rivalin said. He glided over the floor toward Brennus, his form lost at the edges, merged with the darkness. He seemed to displace space as he moved, causing the room to shrink, sucking up the air. Brennus tried to steady his breathing, his heart tried to slow his rapidly blinking eyes. He knew he looked a fool, and it only made him angrier. What do you want? Brennus asked, and was pleased to hear the steadiness in his voice. The shadows leaking from his body merged with those swirling around Rivelin and were overwhelmed by them. That's my question to you, Rivelin answered. His golden eyes drifted to Brennus's hand, to the jacinth necklace he held there. Ah, still that. Brennus dared take a step closer to his taller brother. He knew Rivelin could kill him easily, but he did not care. Always that. The darkness around Rivelin intensified. His eyes stayed on the necklace. That damn trinket. Brennus clenched his fist around the necklace. Our mother wore it the day you murdered her. Rivelin's eyes came up, met Brennus's, flared in the black hole of his face. You never told me how you found it. You're not all-knowing. Ask the whore you worship or the hole you stare into every day. Rivelin held out his hand. Shadows rose from his palm, wound around his fingers. Give it to me. Shadows stormed around Brennus and words leaped out of his throat before he could stop it. No, never. I can take it if I wish. Rage boiled in Brennus, the steam of his anger leaking around the lid of his control. He uttered a guttural cry of hate, extended a hand, shouted a word of power, and unleashed a blast of life-draining energy that would have shriveled a mortal to a husk. But Rivelin was not mortal, not any more, and the beam of energy slammed into his chest, split, and ricocheted off in several directions, all to no effect. Rivelin's eyes narrowed. Power coalesced in him as the darkness about him deepened. He stepped toward Brennus, and his form seemed to grow, to fill the room— his hands closed on Brennus's robes and lifted him into the air. The homunculi squealed with terror. Imminent death steeled Brennus's courage. He glared into his brother's impassive golden eyes, squeezed his mother's necklace so hard the metal pierced his skin. Blood ran warm and soaked his fist before his regenerative flesh closed the wound. Rivelin pulled Brennus close enough until they were nose to nose. Give it to me. Brennus spat in his brother's face, the face of a god, the globule running down Rivelin's cheek. You'll have to kill me first. Rivelin's eyes flared. He studied Brennus's face, perhaps measuring his resolve, then threw him across the length of the scrying chamber. Brennus hit the far stone wall hard enough to drive the breath from his lungs and crack ribs. His body began immediately to regenerate itself, and he winced as shadow stuff re-knit his broken ribs. He grimaced as he stood, shouting at his brother, A hole, Rivelin! You've had a hole in you since you murdered our mother for your bitch goddess! Now the hole is all you have! How does it feel? How does it feel? Mother died thousands of years ago, Brennus.
The impassivity in Rivalin's voice drove Brennus to distraction. Shadows swirled and he pointed his finger at his brother. You don't get to call her mother. You call her Alishar, or don't speak of her at all. And she did not just die. You murdered her. Rivalin did not deny it, did not apologize for it, said nothing at all. He stepped forward to the scrying cube, his expression thoughtful, and put his palm to his face. The entire cube turned black as onyx. In a moment, the darkness lightened, and an image began to resolve in the cube's face. Brennus's breath left him in a rush. Is this... this cannot be. It is. Don't do this. It's done. His mother's face formed on the cube. She was lying on her back amid a meadow festooned with purple flowers. Her long, dark hair haloed her head. The wind stirred her clothes, caused the flowers to sway. Brennus recognized the meadow. It was the same meadow where he had found her necklace, the same meadow from which Erevis Kale's love Vara, pregnant with Kale's child, had disappeared. His mother's pale face looked pained, but Brennus did not think the pain physical. Her breathing was rapid, too rapid. Brennus found himself walking slowly toward the cube. His mother reached out a hand, her arm visibly shaking. Brennus felt as if he could almost reach out and touch her. His hand went up to take hers into his. Mother, he said softly, but her eyes were not on him. He was seeing an image of events that had occurred thousands of years before. Hold my hand, Rivalin, she said, her voice a whispered gasp. Brennus saw that her other hand held the necklace Brennus now held. Rivalin's voice answered her, his voice from the time when he had been a young man, before he'd become a shade, before he'd become a god. We all die alone, mother. She closed her eyes and wept. Tears fell down Brennus's cheeks in answer. He stood next to Rivalin, his hate a wall between them. Your father will learn of this, mother said. No, this will be known only to us and to Shar. And to me, Brennus said through clenched teeth as he watched the scene. She stared at where Rivalin must have been standing, then closed her eyes and inhaled deeply. What did you wish for, mother? Rivalin asked. When she opened her eyes, Brennus was pleased to see that the hurt in her eyes was gone, replaced by anger. To be the instrument of your downfall, Good night, mother. I answer to another mistress now. Rivalin removed his hand from the scrying cube and the image faded. No, Brennus said. No! He put his hands on the cube, tried to reactivate it with his own power, but it remained dark, a void, a hole. Tears streamed down his face, but he did not care. Show me the rest. You know the rest. Brennus stared at the cube, his mother's face floating at the forefront of his memory. Bastard! You thrice-damned bastard! Why did you show me that? Rivalin, taller than Brennus by a head, stared down at him. I thought it was time you saw what I was capable of. I always knew what you were capable of. I also thought it was time to remind you that my patience is not infinite. I'm going to kill you, Brennus said, wiping stupidly at his tears. I'll find a way. Rivalin put a hand on Brennus's shoulder. Your bitterness is sweet to the lady, Brennus. Brennus slapped his brother's hand away. Get out of here. Rivalin turned away. You see nothing, Brennus. You understand so little. I'm unmatched in power here on the Prime... But what use is my power? Brennus did not understand. The Lords of Shade had traveled the plains freely, always had. You're bound here? Rivalin shook his head. His left fist clenched, a small gesture of frustration. Not bound, no. Hunted. My power protects me here. But elsewhere, 
There are those who want what I possess. Brennus's mind latched onto the import of the sentence. His brother feared someone or something. Brennus could use that, perhaps. The divinity you stole? Rivalin whirled on him, shadows swirling. The divinity I took. You and Erebus Kale and Dracic Riven. Kale is gone. Mephistopheles holds his power now. Comprehension dawned. Mephistopheles wants your power. He's hunting you. He needs it for his war with Asmodeus. Rivelin shrugged. No matter. I can safely leave this world, even as it marches to its inevitable end. I'll be the last living thing on this planet, Brennus, screaming into the void as everything dies. You'll be dead before that, Brennus said. Rivelin smiled. I could kill you easily. He snapped his fingers. Like that. But I won't. At least not yet. Do you know why? Brennus refused to respond, but Rivelin spoke as if he did. Because we're already dead, and my bitterness too is sweet to the lady. Wallow in it then, Brennus spat. Suffer with it. The shadows gathered around Rivelin. I will, and because I do, so will everyone else. The darkness took him, and Brennus stood alone in the scrying chamber. Sweat and shadows poured from his flesh, his heart thumped against his ribs. The homunculi emerged tentatively from the blanket of his cowl, exhaling audibly when they saw that Rivelin was gone. Lady was pretty, one of them said. Yes. Brennus said, turning back to the dark scrying cube where he had seen the image of his mother. He put his hand on the silver face of the cube, replaying the images in his mind, her words. They made him smile. You would have made her laugh, he said to the homunculi. His mother had encouraged Brennus's skill with constructs and shaping magic. She'd always loved the little creatures and moving objects he'd create for her. His father, the Most High, had forced him to turn from the frivolity of shaping to the serious study of divination. Something about the image Rivelin had shown him stuck in his mind. Something odd. What did you wish for, Mother? Rivelin had asked her. Realization struck. The meadow had been a magical place, perhaps powerful enough to grant wishes. Such places had existed in ancient Faroon. Vara had vanished from the same meadow as undead shadows had closed in on her. Brennus had seen her curl up in the flowers, had seen a flash, had visited the meadow and found the flowers gone, as if consumed. Gods, he breathed and shadows swirled around him in an angry storm. Vara had wished herself away from there, and the meadow had granted her wish. Where would she go, he mused aloud, and then it struck him. When would she go? Hope swelled in him, the antipode of Shar's despair. He hurried to his library to renew his search. Rivelin rode the darkness back toward Doolin, back to his haunt among the cracked stones of the plaza. Upon arrival, his expanded consciousness took in every shadow in the maelstrom. The darkness was an extension of his mind and will. In the emptiness of the ruins, he heard the voice of his goddess, who whispered dooms in his ears. Wind gusted, tore at his cloak and hair. Forks of green lightning flashed again and again across the inky vault of the sky, dividing it into a shifting matrix of jagged angles, the bursts of light painting deeper shadows on the ruined landscape. The whole of Shar's eye hung in the air before him, slowly rotating, imperceptibly expanding year by year, a void that would in time consume the world. Even Rivelin could not stare at it for long without feeling dizzy, nauseated. The hole took up space, but seemed apart from space, not a thing that existed, 
but a thing that was the absence of existence. Its depth seemed to go on forever, a hole that tunneled through the multiverse, a hole that would pull him and everything and everyone into its emptiness and stretch them across its length until all of existence was so thin that it simply ceased to be. He felt her in there, Shar, or at least he felt her essence. Her regard radiated out of the hole like a poisonous, annihilating cloud. The shadow storm had begun the cycle of night and heralded her arrival on Faroon. The leaves of one night, a singular tome sacred to Shar, held her here. Rivelin had recovered the tome from the ruins of the shadow storm, but she was trapped now, stuck in the middle of her incarnation. Small pieces of the leaves of one night, tiny bits of parchment, whipped in the wind around the hole like wounded birds, orbiting it the way the tears orbited Selyun, darting in and out of the void as if Shar were reading them page by page. But she wasn't reading them. She was writing them, writing them for Rivelin, so that he could read them and finish the cycle of night. Write the story, he whispered to himself. Once, long ago, he'd possessed the leaves of one night. He had tried to read it and found the pages empty. He'd heard voices upon touching the book, true, but he'd been unable to understand them. The words, like the pages, had been meaningless empty. He thought the emptiness of the pages and the raving of the voices profound, meaningful somehow. How wrong he'd been. They'd merely been incomplete. They'd merely been waiting. He watched them flutter around Char's eye, moths to the flame of her spite. He could see the black ink on the pages, characters, words, but the language was nothing he'd ever seen before. He needed a mortal filter to translate it, a despairing soul to serve as the lens, and that mortal filter would suffer in the process. He intended to use Brennus. He'd lied when he said he hadn't killed his brother because they were already dead. He hadn't killed Brennus because he needed him and because Brennus was not yet ripe for the picking. The bitterness in his brother grew with each passing year, a tumor in Brennus's soul. Rivelin had heightened it by showing Brennus the murder of their mother. Rivelin would read the book's words through the lens of his brother's bitterness and despair. The thought made Rivelin smile. Shadows swirled around him. The leaves of one night were said to articulate Shar's moment of greatest triumph— a ritual that would destroy a world, but also to suggest her moment of greatest weakness. Of that, Rivelin was doubtful. He longed to read the book. He desired an end. He was tired. He existed only to complete the cycle of night, only to end Toral. And when that was done, either his goddess would reward him after death, or he would pass into nothingness. Both appealed to him more than the state in which he currently existed. Both Shar and Rivelin were aware that the powerful were moving in Toral. They knew that the gods and their chosen were plotting, that something was happening with the overlapping worlds of Abir and Toral. Wars were being fought all across Faroon, the Silver Marches, the Dalelands. Rivelin understood those events no better than anyone but he didn't need to, because he knew that all of it was for nothing. When he succeeded, the gods, their chosen, and everyone else would precede him into the void, and then he would follow them to his own end. Distantly, numbly, he admired Shar's ability to turn what had been his zeal to preserve himself into a zeal to end himself. When he'd first turned to her worship, when he'd murdered his mother to seal his oath to Shar, he'd done so strangely with a sense of hope. He'd recognized even then that everything must one day end, that Shar would have her eventual victory, but he'd thought that worshiping her would allow him to extend that day far into the future, and that in the meanwhile 
he'd have the power to make the world as he wished it. How she must have laughed at his naivete. How she must have laughed hundreds of times, thousands of times on other worlds with other night seers whose worship started in hope and ended in nihilism and annihilation. My bitterness is sweet to the lady, he whispered. Lightning split the sky, darkness reigned. Shar's eye looked out on the world in hunger. Chapter 5 Vasin stood toward the rear of the abbey's northern courtyard, near a columned gate, arms crossed over his chest. A mail shirt and breastplate sheathed him under his traveling cloak. Sword and dagger hung from his weapon belt. His pack, stuffed full with the supplies he'd need for the journey, as well as some extra for needy pilgrims, lay on the ground near his feet. His most important possession, the rose holy symbol given him by the oracle, the symbol that had belonged to Dawn Lord Abelar, hung from a lanyard around his throat. The air smelled damp, rife with the promise of autumn's coming decay. Distant thunder rumbled in the black, starless sky, vibrating the earth under his feet, threatening to drop rain on the open-air courtyard. The gathered pilgrims did not seem to mind. At the moment, they did not see the darkness. They were, instead, awaiting the light. They had their backs to Vasin, young and old, thin and fat, tall and short, facing the high balcony that jutted from the side of the abbey sanctum, where the oracle would soon appear. Cracked, age-pitted flagstones paved the courtyard, trod underfoot for decades by groups of pilgrims just like those who stood upon them now. The stones in the center of the courtyard had been inlaid with colored quartz to form a sunburst pattern, a symbol of a monitor's light, defiant in the face of the perpetual darkness. None of the pilgrims stood upon the sunburst. Instead, they surrounded it, orbiting it in faith, Roses of gray stone, petrified by the passage of the spell plague's blue fire a hundred years earlier, bordered the courtyard on three sides. They had been red and yellow once, or so Vasin had heard, but now they, like the sky, were forever gray, their forms eternally fixed, unchanging, bound forever to the valley. Like Vasin. Vasin felt eyes on him and turned. Orson stood beside him, a larger pack than even Vasin's slung over his shoulders. Vasin had not heard him approach. The man's quiet was disconcerting, as was his gaze, with the eyes like opals, as if he were not a man, or even diva, but some kind of construct. You move with less sound than a field mouse, Vasin whispered to him. The corners of Orson's mouth rose slightly in a smile. Old habits... He cleared his throat. Is it acceptable if I remain? What do you mean? Since I'm not of the faith, Orson explained. I'd understand if you wanted me to wait outside the courtyard and... Vasin shook his head. No, no, stay. The oracle's light won't diminish in the presence of your mask-shadowed soul. Orson grinned and lowered his pack to the ground. Nor your shadowed flesh. Indeed. Vasin said and smiled. Is this also ground you stood upon in another life? He meant the words as jest, but Orson seemed to take them seriously and glanced around. Not this particular ground, no, but I've stood on the ground to your right hand before. Shadows leaked from Vasin's hands. A joke, yes? Orson smiled and nodded. A joke, yes. You're more than a little strange. Orson clasped his hands behind his back. Well then, quite a pair are we. Vasin chuckled. Quite a pair. For a time they stood beside one another in silence. Vasin admitted that Orson at his side felt right, and the feeling struck him oddly. He had no one in his life he'd call friend. Never had. Comrade, yes. Trusted ally, brother in faith, these he had in abundance. 
But a friend? He had none. His blood, the shadows that clung to him, set him apart from everyone else. Except Orson. And while they weren't exactly friends, he certainly felt comfortable with the diva. A distant chime rang from somewhere within the abbey, and its sound cut through the murmur of the pilgrims. They fell silent as the chime sounded ten times, a ring for each hour of daylight at that time of year. Dawn follows night and chases the darkness, Mason whispered. The chiming ended, and the pilgrims shifted as one, their collective movement and expectant assurance over the cobblestones. They inhaled audibly as the oracle emerged from an archway, his hand on his dog, Brownie, and stood on the second-floor balcony overlooking the courtyard. The oracle, one of the pilgrims whispered. Look at his eyes, said another. Kindled by a monitor's touch, the oracle's eyes glowed orange in the dim light. His colorful robes seemed illuminated from within, a stark contrast with the dull gray of the day. He seemed more real than the world, too bright for Sembius' drab air, a portion of the sun come to earth. Age lines seemed his clean-shaven face, crevasses in his flesh. His platinum holy symbol hung from a thong around his neck, a rose in a sunburst. Basin's hand went to the symbol he wore, a rose, the symbol of a monitor in his morning guise of Lathander. It felt warm to the touch, sun-kissed. The oracle patted Brownie, and the magical dog lay on the balcony beside his master. Putting his hands on the balustrade, the oracle stared down at the assembled pilgrims. Vason imagined him seeing not the world, but the possibilities of the world— a smile pulled the oracle's lips from his rotted teeth, and he raised his hands. Heads bowed, including Vason's, including Orson's, and a reverent hush fell. His light keep you, the oracle said, his voice forceful, portentous. As one, the pilgrims and Vason looked up and recited the ritual answer. And warm you, oracle. The presence of so many faithful warmed Basin's heart, as it always did. It pleased him that, for the moment at least, no shadows leaked from his skin. You braved the journey to this abbey to see the light that lives in the darkness. Yes, Oracle, the pilgrims answered. You need not have come. The light lives not here, but in each of you. We are all but humble servants to the Dawn Father. Smiles around murmured thanks, nodded heads. I hope that the time you spent here, although brief, has kindled a blaze in your heart. More nods and murmured assent. Carry that with you always as the world changes around you. The path ahead is fraught for all of Toral. Be a light to others, a torch in the deep that shows the way. Will you do this? A resounding shout, We will! The oracle nodded. I have met with each of you, seen for each of you. Orson shifted his feet at that, and Vason didn't miss it. The oracle continued. I know you all would have preferred to remain longer, but it is important now that you return to the lands of the sun, before the war in the Dales, a war that has already cost many of you a great deal, makes it impossible to get you safely through. Go forth with his light and warmth upon you. Be a light to a world in which war and darkness threaten. Bless you, Oracle, said many. Thank you, Oracle, said others. The light is in him said another. And with that, the oracle backed away from the balustrade. Brownie stood and came to his side. The oracle placed his hand on the large canine's shoulder, and the two of them moved off into the abbey. The moment he removed himself from view, the pilgrims turned to one another, smiling, laughing, embracing, a light with the oracle's blessing. Vason turned to Orson, you seemed affected by his words when he mentioned a seeing. Did he see for you? 
He did, Orson said, the first day I was here. Vason was mildly incredulous. The first day, but you're not... Among the faithful? Very good. He knew that. Vason had never heard of the oracle performing a seeing for someone not of the faith. Then what did he... He stopped himself mid-question. Forgive me, his words are for you alone. I was just surprised to hear this. Orson wore a peculiar expression, a half-smile, perhaps. As was I, and I'll tell you what he told me, if you wish. Vason stared at Orson, but said nothing. He told me to walk in the woods of the valley this day, and to do so exactly where we met. Shadows curled out of Vason's skin. His eyes went to the balcony, now empty. That's what he told you? Orson nodded. He wanted us to meet, I presume. Vason nodded absently, puzzled. When do we leave? Orson asked. Right now, Vason said. He stepped forward and called for the pilgrim's attention. Faces turned toward him and he watched their expressions fall. They'd gone from looking upon the face of the oracle, lit with the monitor's light, to looking upon Vason with his dusky skin and yellow eyes. The oracle has spoken. Today is the most auspicious time for us to leave. Resigned faces, nods. I'll lead the squad of dawn swords that will take you back to your homes. Shadows leaked from his skin, wisps of night that diffused into the dusky air. More nods. I didn't lead you here, but I'll lead you back. I've made this passage many times. The rules are the same going out as they were coming in. Stay close together. You experienced the pass coming in and know how easy it would be to get lost there. Don't heed the voices of the spirits. They won't harm you. Once we've cleared the mountains, make little noise. The aberrations of the plains are attracted to sound. As we near the Dalelands, we'll have to watch carefully for Sembian troops. We know ways to get through. Fear not. The import of his words caused the pilgrim's expressions to cloud. He saw fear settling on them, watched it fill the lonely places in their spirit that their courage had left vacant. They'd always known in theory what it would mean to once more dare the dark of the Sembian plains and run the gauntlet of an ongoing war. But the reality of it, its immediacy after only ten days in the valley, was hitting them now. Vason continued, his tone even. Be aware of your surroundings. You're all eyes and ears until we see the sun. Signal to me or another dawn sword if you notice anything that causes you alarm. Anything. And if I or another member of my squad gives you an instruction, follow it without question or delay. Your life and ours may depend on it. Do you understand? Nods all around, murmured assent. The youngest of the pilgrims, a boy of ten or eleven, took hold of his mother's hand, fear in his wide eyes. She absently mussed his hair, her own gaze distant, haunted. An elderly gray-haired woman, so thin she looked like a bag of dry sticks, smiled crookedly at Vason. He winked at her, smiled. I'll die to keep you safe, my oath on that. Now gear up. Your packs are already prepared and await you in your quarters. We leave within the hour. Only an hour? someone asked. The oracle has spoken, Vason said, and that was that. The pilgrims filed past him as they returned to their quarters to gather their packs. Several touched his shoulder or offered him a thankful gaze. He smiled in return, nodded. After they'd all gone, Orson grinned and said, Your words didn't brighten them quite so much as the oracles. My work isn't to brighten their spirits, but to keep them and you alive. Orson shouldered on his pack. Very good. I guess we'll soon know how well you do your job. Jarek approached the campsite in a half-hunch, an arrow knocked, senses primed. The ground all around showed pits from the creature's heavy tread. 
The creature had flattened his tent, tore the tarp, scattered the logs from the fire. Fitful streams of smoke leaked from the spread embers. With almost no light to work by, Jarek fumbled through the mess of the campsite and sought his cloak. He found a shred of it stomped into the muck, another shred elsewhere, and his heart fell. The creature had torn it to bits and trotted underfoot. He found a few more bits of it, but not the part with the pocket, not the part with the locket. He sank to the ground near the remains of the fire, put his hands on his knees, and tried to figure out how he'd tell L about losing it. So much for good luck, he muttered. He'd spend the night hungry and cold. He never should have ventured out of Fair Elm. Instead, he should have packed up with L, left the damned village, and headed for the Dales. He felt the vibrations in the ground at the same time the creature's roar split the night. Adrenaline had him on his feet in a heartbeat, an arrow knocked and drawn. The creature barreled out of the darkness, all flabby bulk and sour stink and ear-splitting roars. He fired, and the whistle of his arrow was answered with a satisfying thunk and pained shriek as it sank to the fletching in the creature's flesh. But the bulk kept coming. Jarek backstepped, dropping his bow and trying to draw his sword, stumbling on the broken muddy earth. His boot stuck in the muck, tripped him up. He fell onto his back as he pulled his blade free. The creature rushed him, snarling, slobbering, arms outstretched, clawed fingers reaching for him. Shouting with fear, he stabbed his blade at its midsection as one of its hands slammed into the side of his head. Pain, sparks exploding before his eyes. He flashed on the creature devouring the pheasants, bones and feathers and all, and imagined himself consumed entirely, clothes and bones and flesh. Instinct and adrenaline kept his hand around the hilt of his blade, even as his body went numb, and the creature's bulk fell atop him and drove him a handspan into the soft earth, a grave of his own making. His breath went out of him in a whoosh, the creature spasmed atop him, a mountain of stinking flesh, its bulk crushing him. A huge hand closed over his face and shoved his head into the sodden ground. Water from the saturated earth got into his eyes, nose, his mouth. Panic seized him as he inhaled water. Desperate, terrified, he stabbed and stabbed with his blade. Distantly he was aware of warmth, the pained snarls of the creature its shifting bulk atop his body. He couldn't breathe. More sparks, his field of vision fading to black. He was failing, dying. He blacked out for a moment. He didn't know for how long, but when sense returned, he realized that the creature was no longer moving. He'd killed it? He was too exhausted and pained to feel much relief. Its stink filled his nostrils. Its weight made it hard to breathe. He was face to face with its bloated countenance. Its eyes were open, thick black tongue lolling from its mouth. The brown eyes gave Jarek a start. They looked entirely human, almost childlike. Squirming to the side, he maneuvered himself from under the creature and stood, covered in mud, blood, and stink. He stared down at the creature's bulbous form, the folds of flesh, the network of burst veins on the surface of the skin. The tip of his sword stuck out of its back. With a grunt, he rolled the creature over so he could retrieve the blade. The rags it wore were the muddy, torn remains of a homespun and trousers. He pulled his blade free, wincing at the stink it freed. He remembered the lanyard he'd seen, and used his blade to lift a fold of flesh at the creature's neck. Hung from the lanyard was a charm— a dirty cube of amber. At first his mind refused to draw the conclusion. He stood perfectly still, eyeing the charm, the clothes, insisting that it wasn't what he thought it was. But it was. He knew the charm. It had belonged to a little girl from Fair Elm, Lonnie Rab. But her family had left Fair Elm days earlier. Had it killed her and taken the charm? Or, he stared at the creature, its hair, the brown childlike eyes, the torn homespun. 
The reality hit him, and he vomited into the grass until his stomach had nothing left to give. He sagged to the ground. Lonnie, he said. It seemed obscene to connect her name to the bloated, twisted form before him. But it was her. He was sure of it. And he'd killed her. Some magic or curse had changed her into something awful. And then he'd killed her. Gods, 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 he said. He tried not to think about what might have happened to the rest of her family. Sickened, he cast his blade away and kneeled beside her. The tiny, waifish young girl he could still picture running and laughing in the village commons. He reached out a hand but did not touch her. I'm so sorry, Lonnie. What could have done this to her? Thunder sounded. A trickle of rain started to fall. He sat there for a long while, engulfed in night, wrapped in a sense of grief, not just for Lonnie and her family, but for himself and Elle and the baby, for all of Zembia. The land itself was corrupted by darkness. He had to get out, get Elle out. But he could not just leave Lonnie there. He had to do something with her body. Burn it. It was the least he could do. He found his wood axe amid the scattered debris of the camp, split some dead broadleaf limbs he found nearby, and started to build a pyre around Lonnie's body. He took her by the wrists to move her a bit and get some of the logs under her. As he did, he realized that she was holding something in her closed hand. He uncoiled Lonnie's swollen, misshapen fingers, already stiffening in death to reveal L's locket, a bronze sun. Of all the things in the campsite, she'd taken L's locket. He remembered once, long ago, Lonnie telling L how beautiful the locket was. L had mussed her hair, thanked her, and Lonnie had run off. Emotion bubbled up in Jarek, raw, bitter, and he couldn't swallow it back down. He wept as he worked and in time had built a serviceable pyre, a pyre for an adolescent girl that Sembia had turned into a monster. He gently placed Elle's locket back in her hand. I'm sorry, he said to her again, and worked on the kindling. When it took, he tended the logs until the fire was going strong. He thought he should say something, a prayer, but he could not manage one. The gods damn this place he said softly as the flames darkened Lonnie's bloated body. The gods damn it all. He watched for a while, until he was sure it was going, then gathered what he could find of his gear and headed back out. He had to get back to Fair Elm and get El away. He walked with his bow in one hand, his sword in the other. He had no intention of stopping and he put leagues behind him before exhaustion made his vision blurry and caused him to stumble. Still, he pressed on. His purpose compelled him, a fish hook of fear set deep in his guts, pulling him back to Fair Elm and L. After two hours, he was blinking so much with fatigue that he could hardly see. His legs felt as if they were made of lead, slabs of meat attached to him at the hip. He stumbled, fell, crawled and finally collapsed. He attempted to stand, but couldn't. His face hit the wet ground. His strength went out of him, drained away into the ground. Shivering with cold and exertion, he decided he'd just rest for a moment. Just a moment. Rain fell as the pilgrims gathered on the high rise that overlooked the valley, they stood in a huddled, sodden, miserable mass, hoods pulled over their heads. All but Orson. He stood apart from the others, dressed only in his tunic, trousers, tattoos, and boots. The rain seemed not to bother him. The pilgrims gave him a wide berth. He was not one of them, and they must have sensed it. The diva caught Basin's gaze, nodded. The pilgrims stared down at the valley, its towering pines backed by the teeth of the mountains, the vein of the river, the pitted stone walls of the abbey nestled among the greenery. Not for the first time, 
Vason wondered what the valley would look like bathed in sunlight. He imagined the river flecked with silver, the bits of mica in the walls of the abbey glittering like jewels, the snow caps of the mountains shining like lanterns. It saddened him that the valley would never see unadulterated sunlight. He vowed to himself that when he saw the pilgrims to the dales, out from under the shadow of Ars shroud, he would allow himself a few hours of sunlight before returning to the darkness. Your thoughts wander, First Blade, said Byrne, standing beside him. Vason turned to look into Byrne's heavy-lidded eyes, overhung by thick brows. A jagged scar marked Byrne's temple. Vason sighed. My thoughts seem to do that a lot of late. It's the time of year, Byrne said, gesturing at the sky with a gloved hand. Winter approaches. The mind wanders in hopes of finding spring. But soon we'll see the sun. We will, Vason said with a firm nod. The pilgrims are ready. You've done a head count? Byrne nodded, his conical helm falling over his eyes. He seated it more snugly on his head and said, Twenty-three plus the four of us. The four of them. Four servants of a monitor that would lead the faithful through the shadow vars perpetual night. Eldris, Nald, Byrne, and Vason, the first blade. Veterans all, good men. Each of them knew the markers to follow across the plains to the dales, to safety, to the sun. Take position, then, Vason said to Byrne. A prayer, and then we move. Aye. Vason pulled his long hair back into a horse's tail and secured it while Byrne, Eldris, and Nald took position around the pilgrims, shepherds ringing their flock. When they were ready, Vason ran his hand over his beard and addressed the pilgrims. He saw the fear in their eyes and did what he could to dispel it. He drew his blade and held it high. Byrne, Nald, and Eldris did the same. Shadows snaked from Vason's flesh, spiraled around his forearm and hand, but he channeled the power of the Dawn Father, and his blade glowed with a bright rosy hue. It fell on the pilgrims, on the Dawn Swords, its power stealing their spirits, amplifying their hopes, even while painting their shadows on the ground. Vason felt both the warmth of the light and presence of the shadows. The glow elevated the pilgrims' expressions. Many made the sign of the rising sun and bowed their heads. We walk now into darkness on a journey toward the sun, Basin said. A common faith binds us, a common purpose. We are each warmed by the light that's in our fellows. In faith we'll hold the darkness at bay. His light keep us. And warm us, the pilgrims answered. Basin and the dawn swords lowered their blades. The glow faded, and Sambia's darkness once more crept close. Everyone waited Vason's order to begin. Before giving it, he turned and called Orson to his side. The other dawn swords eyed him strangely, but Vason did not care. Vason? Vason raised his eyebrows, nodded at the ground, at Orson's staff. Lines signify new beginnings, you said. Maybe draw one? Orson smiled. Very good, very good indeed. He dragged a line in the mud. We go, Vason called, and the column moved, crossing the border Orson had drawn. The sky relieved itself in a drizzle as they walked the labyrinthine pass, navigating its switchbacks, its hidden paths, its deadfalls. Orson hovered near the front of the column near Vason. The other dawn swords assisted those who stumbled or bore the packs of those who sagged under the weight. The air thickened with moisture as they moved. Mist gathered around their feet, rose to their knees, ahead a wall of swirling gray within which lived the spirits of the pass. Vason did not understand what the spirits were. He only knew they had been harvested from elsewhere by the blue fire of the spell plague and deposited the pass. Perhaps they couldn't leave. Perhaps they didn't wish to. They seemed to answer to the oracle in some way that Vason did not comprehend. They let dawn swords and pilgrims pass unmolested. 
others they led astray. From time to time through the years, the Dawn Swords had found errant wanderers in this or that switchback, dead for lack of food or water, their eyes wide with fear. The mist swirled around him as they neared the fog, climbed up his thighs, his flesh answered with shadows. Muttering filled his ears, whispers, a meaningless chatter that threatened to cloud his thinking. He touched the holy symbol at his throat, uttered a prayer, drew upon a monitor's power, and channeled it into his shield. Energy charged the metal and wood. It began to glow with light, grew warm in his grasp. The voices in his head fell back to distant whispers. Behind him, Nald, Eldris, and Byrne did the same, and soon a monitor's light hedged the pilgrims. Stay within the glow, Vason said. It will be as it was when you came through the first time. You'll hear the spirits, perhaps even see them, but heed nothing. They won't harm you directly, but if you wander in the pass, it will be hard to find you again. We won't stop until we're through. Hold hands with the person nearest you. If one of you stumbles or cannot keep up, shout for aid immediately. Grunts and murmurs of assent answered his words. A child whimpered, a cough cleared throat. Vason led them into the wall of the fog, and it enveloped him immediately, deadened sound, attenuated his connection to the world, to himself. He felt cocooned in it. Even with the light from his shield, he could see only a few paces. But he'd known what to expect, so he kept his wits. Stay together, he called over his shoulder. Behind him he heard the footsteps of the pilgrims, the soft crunch of sandal and boot on rock. But the sound seemed distant, and he seemed separated from them by more than mist. The reflected light of his shield glowed white on the whirls and eddies of the mist. He sought the markers as he moved, boulders with glowing sigils etched into the base. He found the first, the glowing rose of a monitor's dawn incarnation scribed into the stone. We're at the first marker, he said. Nald, burn, Eldris. With you, they all answered. Two more markers, and they'd be clear. The way etched into Vason's memory as clearly as the markers were etched into rock. In the churn of the mist he saw ghostly faces outlined, mouths open and full of secrets, eyes that were holes into which one could fall forever. Whispering from all around him, the sound like the hiss of falling rain, the words hard to distinguish, an eerie sibilance. A bearded face before him, mouth open in a scream. A woman's visage to his left, eyes wide with terror. A child's gaze, forlorn, lost. He kept his mind focused, his feet on the path, same as always. Snippets of phrases rose out of the inchoate storm of whispers, the City of Silver, said a man's voice. Elgrin Fall, hissed a woman. Vason ignored them as he had countless times before. You must free him, said a boy's voice. You're the heir. Write the story. The words halted Vason in his steps. They recalled to his mind the dreams he'd had of his father, the words of the oracle. Burn, he called. Nald? No response. Had he gotten separated? Had he lost his charges? Eldris? He turned a circle, realizing immediately that he'd made a mistake. The mist had scrambled his senses. Dizziness seized him. The world spun and he stumbled on a boulder, nearly fell. The light from his shield dimmed. Shadows poured from his flesh, mixed with the mist, he put his hand on the holy symbol at his throat, held on to it as if life depended upon never letting go. The whispers intensified. The mist closed in on him, a funeral shroud. He muttered a prayer, tried to drown them out, but they grew closer, louder, a rush in his ears, the cascades of the valley falling all around him in a foam of voices. Save him, said a deep voice. You must... Save him, then write the story. Save who? he shouted, but he already knew the answer. The air around him grew cold, freezing, knives on his flesh. 
His teeth chattered. He tried to speak, to call for his comrades, but Frost rimmed his lips and prevented speech. The wind picked up, pawed at his cloak with frozen fingers. The whispers of the spirits gave way to screams, prolonged wails of agony. He smelled brimstone, the stink of burning flesh. What is happening? He tried to shout, but no words emerged, just a croak and a cloud of frozen breath. The mist parted before him to reveal distant mountains larger than any he'd ever seen, jagged ice-covered towers that reached to a glowing red sky. Smoke poured into the sky in thick columns. He stood on a precipice overlooking a plain of ice. Below he saw a mound of ice, like a cairn, alone in a flat, frozen plain. Shadows curled out of cracks in the mound, a river of fire cut through the plain, veins of red in which, in which, by the light, he whispered, and sweated darkness. Souls burned in the river, their screams rising into the air with the smoke, Towering insectoid devils stabbed at them with long pole arms, lifted them from the fire like speared fish. Kania, a deep, powerful voice said to his right. He turned but saw no one. Is that where he is? Vason called. In hell? Tell me. No answer. He turned back to look upon the horror once more, but the vision of Kania, of hell, had faded. Warmth returned, as did the mist, as did the dizziness, the whispers. Save him, said another voice. He is cold. Vason stumbled on legs gone weak, but before he fell, a hand closed on his shoulder and pulled him roughly around. He brought his shield to bear, readied his blade. But it was Orson. Orson had pulled him around. You wander, the diva said. Are you unwell? No. Yes. They showed me things, Orson. Horrible things. Orson's pupilless eyes fixed on Basin, the pale orbs strangely analogous to the mist. Worry lines in his brow creased the lines of ink on his flesh. I've seen nothing, he said, but I hear them. They whisper of Elgrin Fall, the city of silver. They speak of your father— it was not so when I journeyed through the mist on my way to the temple. Then I heard only jabberings. It's never been so, Basin said, his thoughts clearing. And what's the city of silver? And how could they know of my father? Orson looked around as if he could decode an answer from the swirl of the mist, from the malformed faces staring out of the gray at them. I don't know. Maybe something has changed. Vason held on to the diva like a lifeline. Changed. I. Orson patted Vason on the shoulder. We'll speak more of this when we clear the mist. Orson's words moored Vason, reminded him of his duty. He shook his head to clear it, called out, Elders, Burn, Nald, speak. One after another they called out, their voices not far from him. And the pilgrims? Vason called his voice hollow in the mist. Accounted for, answered Byrne. All is well, Orson said. It was you we worried after. You spoke strangely and walked off. And you followed? You could have been lost. Orson pulled back, showed Vason his quarterstaff, scribed with lines, his flesh, made into a map from the tattoos that covered him. He smiled, I seldom lose my path, Vason. Despite himself, Vason smiled. No, I suppose not. You have my thanks. Come on, let's get everyone clear of here. Rather than walking a few paces behind, Orson walked beside Vason to his right, and Vason welcomed his presence. The spirits receded to silence, as if they'd had their say— and the column had only to manage the fog and switchbacks as they journeyed through the pass. This is a maze, Orson said, a challenge to even those who seldom lose their path, not so? Orson chuckled. Very good. The pass has kept the abbey safe for a century, 
When he was only a boy born dumb, the oracle entered his first seeing trance and led the survivors of the Battle of Sakors through the pass. Sakors, Orson said, where Kessin Rel fell. Yes, Vason said, and the shadows leaked from his skin. A whisper went through the spirits of the mist. He fell to your father and Drasic Riven and a Shadowvar, Rivalin Tan Thul, Orson said. He fell, too, to the light of the servants of Amonator, among them my adoptive father's sire, Reg, and Abelar Cornthal, the oracle's father. Shadow and light working as one, Orson said. Yes, Vason said, and eyed Orson sidelong. The diva's hand was over the holy symbol he wore under his tunic. Vason continued, and when the survivors reached the valley— the oracle pronounced it the place where light would thrive in darkness. The abbey was built over the next decade, and there it has stood since. I hear pride in your accomplishment. The order does a monitor's work here. Good work. I'm privileged to serve. I don't doubt it, Orson said. He walked in silence for a time, then said, I'm pleased our paths crossed, Vason. I share the sentiment although our meeting appears to have been no accident. No, Orson agreed. No accident. They said nothing more as they led the pilgrims out of the pass. As the mist thinned and finally parted, the dark sky spit a heavier rain. Chapter 6 Vason led the pilgrims down toward the rocky foothills of the Thunder Peaks. He stopped them there. Beyond the hills stretched the Sembian Plains, a vast expanse of whipgrass dotted with large and small stands of broadleaf trees and pines. Occasional elms and maples, the giants of the plains, loomed like protective parents over the smaller trees. The bleak Sembian sky merged into the dark of the plains at the horizon line, the one blurring into the other. All was darkness and rain. Vason scanned the sky for any sign of a Shadowvar patrol. The floating city of Sakors had not been seen so far north in a long while, but Vason would take no chances with pilgrims in his charge. Now and again the Dawn Swords had seen airborne Shadowvar patrols, Two or three soldiers mounted on the flying, scaled worms they called Vesserabs, but even those had grown uncommon. Vason suspected the Shadowvar had diverted the bulk of their forces toward Cormier and the Dales. The Dawn Swords scouted the area around the Thunder Peaks and knew a Sembian force was encamped on the plains south and west, blocking the passage between the southern Thunder Peaks and the sea probably to hold any forces from Cormier that might otherwise try to aid the Dales, which had already endured months of attacks by Sembian forces. Hurry now, he called to his men, the pilgrims. We're exposed in the foothills. We have to reach the plains as rapidly as possible. With the hail assisting the elderly or weak, the group moved quickly through the boulder-strewn hills. Vason knew his mother had been found in the foothills among a stand of pine not far from the pass. Pines still dotted the hills, and each time he walked there, he felt connected to her. He wondered if the trees under which she'd been found still stood. Soon the rocks and gravel surrendered to scrub and whipgrass. Vason led the group to a stand of broadleaf trees he knew, and they stood under it, fatigue in the eyes of the pilgrims. Rest a moment, he said. Eat. We move quickly from here. The less time we spend on the open plains, the less likely we are to be spotted. We're three days from the Dales. Three days from the sun. He forced a smile. That's not long, is it? No, some said. Not long, said others. The pilgrims pulled bread, cured mutton, and goat cheese from their packs. Orson sat apart, cross-legged on his pack, eyes closed, hands on his knees. He seemed to be meditating or praying. Vason, Nald, Eldris, and Byrne moved among the pilgrims as they ate, keeping spirits high. He's a strange one, yes? 
Byrne said softly to Vason, nodding at Orson. He is. Of course, many say that of me. To that, Byrne said nothing. Both of them knew it to be true. He's an honorable man, I think, Vason said. He's not of the faith, though, Byrne said and gave a harumph. He's of a faith, Vason said, and left Byrne to visit with the pilgrims, offering encouraging words and blessings to ease pain and warm spirits. A monitor had gifted all of the dawn swords with the ability to channel their faith into various miracles. How do you fare? Vason asked a heavy-set woman of maybe forty winters. He thought her name was Elora. Her son sat beside her, a boy of perhaps ten. Vason searched his memory for the boy's name. Noel. As well as I might in this rain. Do you need anything I can provide, you or Noel? We're fine. Fine, good sir, said the boy around a mouthful of cheese. You hail from the Dales? Vason asked to make small talk. A shadow passed over Elora's face. Archendale, before the Sembian attack, then Daggerdale. Vason could see loss in her face. Judging from the fact that she and Noel traveled alone, he could guess what. If there is anything I can do for you, sister, Vason said, and touched her lightly. You need only ask. She recoiled slightly at his touch and saw that his hand leaked shadows. He pretended not to notice her response, stood and moved to walk away. Are you a shadow var? Noel blurted at his back. The question silenced the other pilgrims. Vason felt their eyes on him. A child had asked the question, but they were all thinking it. He turned, shadows leaking from his flesh. Elora colored. No! Her son spoke around a mouthful of cheese. I didn't mean to be rude, Mama. Vason produced a smile to reassure Noel. He'd heard the query often enough, and not always from children. With his dusky skin, long dark hair, and shining yellow eyes, he looked not unlike a shadow var. I'm not, he said, and left it at that. Be at ease. Then what are you? asked Noel. Boy, said the middle-aged man. You go too far. Forgive the boy, another man said. His mouth outruns his sense. There's nothing to forgive, Vason said loudly enough for everyone to hear. I'm a man, a servant of a monitor, and a follower of the light, the same as you. He smiled at Noel and winked. I've found that to be quite enough to keep me busy. Noel grinned in return, bits of food sticking to his teeth. Now gather your things, all of you, Vason said. Time to move. Groans answered his proclamation, but the pilgrims did as he bade. As they gathered their things, Eldris walked to Vason's side and put a hand on his shoulder. They meant nothing by it, First Blade. I know, Vason said. Soon they set off. Sticking to the route he'd traveled many times in the past, they made rapid progress. Always Vason kept his eyes to the sky, watching for any sign of the shadow var. His lineage allowed him to see in the darkness as if it were noon, so everyone relied on him to spot danger before they could. The rain picked up after a few hours, the water of the downpour as brown as a turd and carrying the faint whiff of decay. He considered calling a halt, but the pilgrims seemed to be holding up, even the old— Vason saw that Noel had his face to the sky, his mouth open to drink. Before Vason could speak, Orson tapped the boy on the shoulder. Don't drink that or your pee will come out green. The boy grinned. He's right, Vason said, seriousness in his tone. He admonished himself for not telling the pilgrims not to drink the rain. The boy colored, lowered his head and grinned sheepishly. Orson offered Noel his own water skin, and the boy drank deeply. Vason nodded gratitude at Orson and said to the pilgrims, Drink only from your water skins. Rain like this can make you sick. They murmured acquiescence. Elora cuffed Noel in the back of his head. Orson fell in beside Vason. I should have told them before, 
Basin said, shaking his head at his oversight. Sometimes I assume they know what I know. No way to anticipate the boy would drink rain that smells like death. He must have drank all his water at the first break, Vason said. Maybe, Orson said. Or he's just a boy drinking the rain because he's bored, and that's as boys do. He didn't drink much, Vason said, hoping Noel wouldn't get ill. He didn't, Orson agreed, and he's young. The wet pasted the pilgrims' cloak hoods and hair to their scalps, their robes and cloaks to their bodies. They trudged through muck that pulled at their feet, stumbling often. But despite the rain and the bleak sky, they smiled often at each other. Each carried a symbol of their faith blessed by the oracle, a wooden sunburst and rose, and most held it in hand as they trekked, heads down, prayers on their lips. Despite the rain and the black churn of the Sembian sky, the pilgrims held a monitor's brightness in their spirit. Basin found joy in their happiness, although he kept an eye on Noel. The boy seemed fine, if a little pale. Byrne sat beside Vason under a broadleaf tree while the pilgrims took another rest. As usual, Orson sat apart from the rest of the pilgrims, with them, but not of them. The diva stared off into the rain with his peculiar eyes, maybe seeing things Vason did not. Old lives, perhaps. Byrne drank from his water skin, offered it to Vason. Word of the Abbey and the Oracle is spreading, Byrne said as Vason drank. The pilgrims speak of loose tongues in the dales and beyond. That's always been a risk, Vason said, but no one knows even the general location of the Abbey except those of the faith, and none of them could find their way back without us to guide them. Byrne shook his head. Still, too many know of us. The Oracle's on every tongue. He's sought by many. The war in the Dales is only making it worse. Vason pushed his wet hair out of his eyes. Aye, the times are dark, Burn. People crave light. Aye, that. But if loose tongues bring the shadow var down on us while we have pilgrims, Burn said, then what light shall we cast? Vason stood, offered Burn a hand, and pulled him to his feet. That'll depend on how well we fight. There are only four of us here, First Blade. Five, called Orson. Byrne raised his eyebrows in surprise. The man's ears are keen. He raised the water skin in a show of respect. Five it is, then. I'm called Byrne. The diva stood, approached, and took Byrne's hand. Orson, and even with five we will need to fight very well indeed, should we encounter Shadowvar. Truth, Byrne said. Vason shouldered on his pack. Let's hope we don't have to fight at all. Time to... A deep growl from somewhere out in the darkness of the plain pulled their eyes around. Vason drew his blade. The pilgrims stared at one another, wide-eyed. They huddled close. A few of them drew eating knives, little use in a combat. Eldris and Nald stationed themselves before the pilgrims, Vason, Byrne, and Orson drifted a few steps toward the sound, ears primed, weapons drawn, all of them knowing the horrors the plains of Sembia could vomit forth. The sound did not recur. Vason called his men to him. Appear calm and unafraid, he said to them, eyes and ears sharp, and watch the boy, Noll. He drank more of the rain than I'd like. Let's move. The group left the shelter of the pines and re-entered the stinking rain. All of the dawn swords carried bare blades, and Vason didn't breathe easy until they had put a league under their feet. During the trek, Noll began to cough. At first, Vason told himself it was merely the ague, but hope faded as the coughing grew worse. Soon the boy hacked like an old man with wet lung. Vason had never seen disease root so fast. Nall stumbled as he walked. His mother, Elora, tried to help him. Assist them, Vason ordered Eldris, and Eldris did, letting Nall lean on him as they walked. The rain has infected the boy, Orson said. Vason nodded. I'm worried. Illness from the rain is usually days in the making. 
Can he be helped? Burn, Vason called and nodded at Nall. Burn hurried to the boy's side, and the group halted for a moment while the Dawn Rider placed his holy symbol, a bronze sun, on Nall's forehead and invoked the power of the Dawn Father. Burn's hands glowed with light. The holy symbol glowed too, and Nall smiled and breathed easier. Burn must his hair. The reprieve lasted only a short while. Soon Nall was coughing again, worse than before. What's wrong with him? Elora called. While Elders sought to calm her, Burn came to Vason's side. The healing prayer did not rid him of the disease. No, Vason said. Healing prayers could close wounds, even fix broken bones, but against disease they were useless. If we can get him out of this storm, I can see him healed. Thunder growled in answer, the spite of the Shadowvar's sky. I'll find shelter then, Orson said and darted off into the darkness. Wait, Vason called, but the diva was already gone, one with the darkness and rain. What now? Burn asked. Vason eyed Nall. We keep moving until we find shelter. Orson will find us. He doesn't seem to get lost. Another round of lightning veined the sky, celestial pyrotechnics that elicited a gasp from the pilgrims. A prolonged roll of thunder shook the earth. Soon the rain fell in blistering sheets, blocking even Vason's vision. Vason could not believe that the oracle had deemed their departure time an auspicious moment. They'd walked into the worst storm Vason could remember. They pressed on because they had no choice, the dawn swords shouting encouragement, scanning the terrain for shelter but seeing none. Nall lagged, stumbled, his coughing loud between the intervals of thunder. The boy would fail if they did not do something soon, and they were moving too slowly. Vason strode to the back of the column, where Eldris tried to keep Nall upright. Elora, her dark, curly hair pressed by the rain to her pale face, fretted over the boy. The rain failed to hide her tearful eyes. "'Can you not help him?' she said to Vason, and took him by the hands. "'Please, Dawn Sword!' Vason held her hands and spoke softly. "'I hope so, but I need shelter to perform a more powerful ritual.' I need a fire, among other things, and no flame will hold in this downpour. He kneeled and looked the boy in the face. The wind whipped both of their cloaks hither and yon. Nall's eyes were bleary, his face wan. I'd like to carry you, Nall, but I can't do it all alone. Can you hold on to me? The boy's gaze focused on Vason, and he nodded. Vason shed his pack, shield, and sword as another round of lightning lit the plains. Come on, shouted one of the pilgrims. We'll be struck by a bolt standing here. Eldris carried Vason's gear and Vason lifted Nall onto his back. The boy wrapped his arms around Vason's neck, hooked his legs around Vason's waist. Even through his armor, Vason could feel the heat of the boy's fever. He got a feel for the weight. Just hang on, Nall, Vason said. You won't be able to carry him far, said Eldris. Far enough, said Vason, and started off. To the pilgrims he shouted, Move! Faster now! The sky darkened further as night threatened and the storm strengthened, and still they'd found no suitable shelter and no orson. Lightning split the sky and bisected a twisted, long-dead elm that stood a spear cast from the group. Wood splintered with a sharp crack, and the two halves of the dead tree crashed to earth. The ruins spat flames for only a moment before the rain extinguished them. "'Where's a damned stand of living trees?' Vason shouted as another coughing fit racked Nall. The boy's mother hovered near Vason, fretting. Vason focused on putting one leg in front of the other. Shadows poured from his flesh. Nall was either past noticing them or didn't care. So, too, his grief-stricken mother. Fatigue threatened to give way to exhaustion in Vason, and still the rain did not relent. Byrne drifted back to the rear of the column. How do you fare? Well enough. How fares the boy? Byrne checked the boy, returned his gaze to Vason. 
Not well. Nall's mother wailed. Not my boy, not my sweet boy. I've already lost his father to the Sembian army. I can't lose him, too. Find some place, Vason said to Burn. Any place. We must try the ritual. There is nowhere, First Blade, Burn answered. A shout from the pilgrims drew their attention. Two of them were pointing off to the left, but the rain and darkness prevented Vason from seeing anything. Lightning ripped the sky anew. There! There! Vason saw. One hundred paces away, Orson stood atop a rise, waving his staff over his head. Hope for Knoll rose in Vason. Light us up so he knows we saw him, Vason said to Burn. Burn nodded and uttered a prayer lost to the howl of the wind. His shield began to glow, the warm, rosy glow of a monitor's blessing. So lit, Burn headed toward where they'd last seen Orson. Hurry now, everyone, called Vason. Quickly, quickly! Sloshing through the sopping plains, the group followed Burn toward Orson, who came down from the rise to meet them. Thunder rolled. I found a cave. It'll bear us all. Vason grabbed him by the cloak, leaned on him for strength. How far? Orson's eyes looked like moons in his face. Less far, the faster we move. Vason let him go, and all of them staggered through the storm. Fatigue and the weather made Vason's vision blurry, but Orson appeared to know exactly where he was going. They topped a rise, descended, found below a sizable stream turned river by the storm and followed it a ways. It cut a groove in the landscape, the banks falling steeply to its edge. Not far, Orson said. Almost there, Vason shouted to the pilgrims. None responded. They just kept plodding forward. Orson pointed, and Vason saw it, a cave mouth in the river bank on the opposite side of the stream. Orson pulled Vason close so he could hear. There's a ford ahead. Follow me. Orson led them to a narrower stretch of the rapidly flowing stream. He did not hesitate, stepping directly into the water. Make sure none are swept away, Vason called to Burn, Eldris, and Nald. All nodded, and they, with Orson, assisted the pilgrims across, carrying the frail and young on their backs. The water rose waist-high at its deepest point. Flotsam spun past in little eddies, mostly fallen limbs and leaves. The current pulled at Vason as he crossed. He moved slowly, methodically, taking care not to dislodge Knoll. In time, all made it across, and they staggered into the cave. The relative quiet struck Vason first. The rain had been a drumbeat on his hood. Byrne placed his shield in the center of the cavern, prayed over it, and its rosy light painted their shadows on the walls, dark, distorted images of the real them. The cave was ten paces wide and tunneled into the riverbank perhaps another twenty. Brown lichen clung to the cracked walls, oddly reminiscent of Orson's tattoos. Smoke from old fires had stained the ceiling dark. At first the cave smelled faintly of mildew and rot, but the smell of the exhausted sodden humans and their gear soon replaced one stink with another. Most of the pilgrims sagged to the floor around Burns' shield, stripping off packs and wet clothes. Some wept. Others smiled and praised a monitor for the shelter. Vason had time for neither pity nor praises. I need wood for a fire, he said as he laid Knoll down on the cave floor, and bring me anything dry to cover him with. The boy's face was as pale as a full moon. His eyes rolled back in his head. Heat poured off of him. Elora sat beside Nall, cradled her son's head in her lap, stroked his head. Coughs shook the boy's small frame. Black foam flecked his lips. Several of the pilgrims brought dry blankets from the packs, and Vason covered the boy with them. Burn soon returned with several small tree limbs. Using his dagger, he rapidly stripped the sodden exterior from the logs to reveal dry wood. Nald set his shield on the floor, concave side up, and Byrne stacked the wood in it. Orson tore a section of his tunic, shielded from the rain by his cloak, and shredded it for tinder. Flint dragged over a dagger sparked the tinder, 
and soon a small blaze burned in the bowl of Eldris's shield. What could have been in the rainwater to cause this? Elora asked, her voice faint as Noel groaned. What? Vason shook his head as he stripped off his cloak. Who can say? The Shadowvar poison land and sky with their magic. It is cursed, Elora said, tears leaking from her eyes. Sambia is cursed. Vason did not dispute it. He filled the tin cup from his pack with water from his water skin and set it on the edge of the fire. Orson nodded to him, backed away to stand among the flickering shadows on the wall. While Vason waited for the water to heat, he cleared his mind, stared into the fire, and began to pray softly. The pilgrims fell silent, watching. The sound of the rain outside fell away. Burn, Eldris, and Nald soon joined him and formed a circle around the fire. Their voices fell in with his. Soon the pilgrims too joined. In a dark cave in the midst of a black storm, the faithful of a monitor raised collective voice in worship. As the water warmed and then boiled, and without a break in his intonation, Vason removed from his belt pouch a pebble taken from the river in the abbey's alley. He dropped it into the warm water while he, his fellow dawn swords, and the pilgrims all continued their imprecation. The stone began to glow, a pale rosy light that diffused through the water. Vason lifted the lanyard with his holy symbol from around his neck and lowered the rose into the glowing water while his prayers finalized the ritual. The glow intensified, the water shining brighter than the fire. For a moment, the rose looked not tarnished silver, but red with life. It's ready, he said, and all fell silent except the thrum of the rain and the roll of distant thunder. He replaced his holy symbol over his neck and picked up the cup. Despite sitting in the heat of the fire, it was cool to the touch. He carried the glowing liquid to Noel, lifted the boy into a sitting position, and held the cup to his lips. You must drink, Vason said. Noel's bleary eyes sought focus, and his hands fumbled for the cup. Vason held it too, wincing at the heat of the boy's flesh when their hands touched. Noll drank. All of it, Vason said. Do it, sweet boy, said Elora. Noll's head moved in what might have been a nod. A prolonged coughing spell prevented him from drinking for a time, but when it ended, he gulped what remained in the cup. Vason lowered him to the ground, covered him with his blankets. The boy shivered, coughed more, the black foam still flecking his lips. Vason looked at Elora, her eyes stricken. Now we must wait, he said. She looked at her son, at Vason. I believe a monitor will save him. I do. Vason touched her shoulder. Your faith will help. Rest now. There's nothing more to be done. She reached for his hand, did not blanch when shadows snaked from his skin to caress her flesh. Thank you, Dawnsword. I'm sorry for... Before, many pilgrims echoed her words or patted him on the back. Fatigue from carrying Noel, from carrying the pilgrims' hopes, settled on him. His legs felt like foreign things, detached from his body. He staggered, and Orson and Byrne were both there to steady him. You should eat, Orson said. And rest, added Byrne. Rest first, Vason said. Watch the boy. I said Byrne. The rain had gotten through the flap of Vason's pack, making his bedroll damp. He did not care. He did not bother to unroll it, just tucked it under his head along the wall and lay flat on his back on the cave floor, staring up at the smoke and shadow-stained ceiling, listening to the rain, the soft murmur of conversation. The pilgrims were talking about him, he knew. Exhaustion overtook him in moments. The last thing he heard before falling asleep was the sound of Noel's coughing. For the first time in a long time, he did not dream of Erevis Kale. Eldon sat on his favorite chair in the sanctum of the abbey. He felt like a king on a throne, like the ones in stories. 
The others had made it his chair because he could see what they could not. He did not fully understand how he saw, but he did. And because he did, everyone treated him as if he were special. And maybe he was, although he didn't feel special. He reached down to the floor beside his chair and felt for Brownie's soft fur. The dog exhaled happily as Eldon scratched his ears. The feel of fur under his fingers calmed Eldon. He smiled when Brownie licked his hand. Pretty orange and pink and purple ribbons hung from the walls. Eldon knew they were colors favored by Amonitor, the god of the abbey, but Eldon liked them because they were pretty, because they reminded him of sunbeams. He had not seen the sun in a long time. He missed it, but he'd long ago accepted that his life was a service to the light, even though he lived it in darkness. He did not understand exactly why, but he knew people came from all over to see him, because he could see. They looked so hopeful when they met him, lit with the light of their own. He liked that. He made them feel hope, and hope made them glow like the sun. A tall bronze statue of a monitor stood on the tiled floor in the center of the circular sanctum. The god had that same look of hope on his bearded face. He held a large orange crystal globe in his open palm. It would have caught the light entering through the glass dome built into the ceiling, had there been any light to catch. But the sky remained as it ever was, dark, swirling with shadows. The dome in the ceiling, too, was a symbol of hope. Eldon had hoped to see the unfiltered sun pour through it during his lifetime, but he doubted it now. Sometimes, if Eldon asked, one of the priests would use magic to light the god's globe. He loved the globe when it was lit, shimmering, shiny, so shiny. It called to mind the spheres that jugglers used when entertaining children. Eldon loved jugglers. He still carried a set of spheres that he'd been given as a boy, although it had been so long ago he could not remember who'd given them to him. A dark man, he thought, with only one eye. That had been a good day. But it had also been about the time that Papa had died. He had not seen it. Uncle Reg had told him about it afterward. He stared at the statue, floating through memories a hundred years old, and wondering why a monitor had chosen him to see things. He had never asked to be gifted had not even known such gifts to be possible. Soon after Papa had died, Eldon had dreamed of a blazing sun, a sun no longer visible in the Sembian sky. He'd heard his father's voice in his head. Stare at the sun, Eldon, and don't look away. It will blind me, Papa. I promise that it won't. It's all right. So Eldon had stared and had not looked away. His eyes stung, though he hadn't been blinded. It hurts, Papa. I know. I'm sorry, son. That's enough. Look away now. You were very brave. Where are you, Papa? Uncle Reg said you died. A long pause, then. I did die, Eldon. But it's all right. I'm all right. Eldon had not understood how Papa could be both dead and all right. Tears formed in his stinging eyes. Please come home, Papa. Me miss you. I am home, son, and you will be too one day. Listen to me now. When you awaken, you will see things. Don't be afraid. Tell Reg and Jiris and the others what you see. They'll listen to you, and they'll know what to do. Be a light to them. Eldon did not understand the words, not completely, but that sometimes happened when people spoke to him. All right, Papa. Papa? Yes, Eldon. Please don't go. I must, son. I'm sorry. I know it makes you sad. I'm sad, too. Be strong. All right, Papa. But it wasn't all right. Eldon, I love you very much. I'll be waiting for you. 
Sobs finally broke through, shook Elton. Me love you too, Papa. He'd never heard his father's voice again, and when he had awakened, his face tear-streaked, he had been able to see things others could not, strange things, frightening things. At first he remembered the things he'd seen. He did not like that. Over time he no longer remembered, but he still saw. Others told him that he did, that he spoke to them even though he didn't remember. They said he was touched by the light, gifted with prophecy. Reg, Jiris, and the others had listened to him, just as Papa had said. He had led them to the valley, where they had built the abbey and become a light in darkness. He leaned back in his chair, his eyes on the statue. The face of a monitor looked serious under his beard, the deep-set eyes staring out at some distant point from under the domed helm. Eldon wondered what the god was looking at. He wondered if Papa was with a monitor. Thinking of Papa made him happy and sad at the same time. He reached for Brownie again, stroked the dog. Eldon had lived more than one hundred years, but he felt that things were changing. Not so many people came to see him anymore. Maybe the darkness kept them away. Or maybe he'd cast what light he was to cast. He replayed his father's voice in his head. I love you very much. He smiled, and tears filled his eyes. Everyone in the abbey called Papa Dawn Lord. Eldon did not know for sure what Dawn Lord meant, but that was all right. He knew it meant they liked Papa. Everyone liked Papa. Their voice dropped when they spoke of him. But to Eldon, Papa was just Papa, a tall man of kind smiles and soft words. The pain of losing Papa still hurt, even after a hundred years. Eldon missed him more than ever. I'll be waiting for you. Sensing Eldon's sadness, Brownie stood, whined, and nuzzled his hand. Eldon rubbed the dog's big head, his muzzle. The dog sighed contentedly. Eldon sensed changes, but did not know what to do with the feeling. Me need to see Papa, Bounty, he said. The dog stood, stretched. Eldon closed his eyes for a moment, willed his inner eyes to see, and entered a seeing trance. Images swept through the oracle's head, the growing menace of the Shadowvar, two shade brothers in the center of events, both pained with loss, but each alone. A second pair of brothers appeared to him, not shades, but plague changed, and behind them lurked the shadow of an arch-devil. He saw the hole in the center of Sembia where Ordulin once had stood. He saw Vason, his image bisected down the middle, half of him in shadow, half of him in light. Such bright light. He saw a tattooed diva surrounded by shadow, standing at Vason's side, and he saw the one-eyed man, now a god, who had given him the juggler's toys so many years ago. Drasic Riven. All of the images he saw swirled past his inner eye, a swirl of shadows and light and violence. He did not try to interpret what he saw. He had not entered a trance to see. He had entered the trance to speak. The Shrine, Brownie, he said, and put his hand on the back of the large black dog. The dog triggered its power, and in an instant the oracle and brownie stood in the Dawn Lord's shrine. Two elaborately carved, magically preserved wooden beers sat in the center of the large round room, ringed by a candelabra-lined processional the pilgrims used to view the shrine. Dried roses and other small offerings covered the beers, the floor around them. A soft glow from a ceiling-mounted glow globe suffused the chamber. The light was never allowed to die in the shrine. The lids of the beers featured carved images of the oracle's father, Abelar Corinthal, and Jiris Knave, sculpted in lifelike relief. After Abelar's death, 
Jiris had sworn to serve and protect the Oracle for as long as she lived, just as Vason did now. She'd loved Abelar and had insisted that she be laid to rest beside him. Jiris had been the first to hold the title of First Blade. Vason Kale, the Oracle knew, would be the last. With Brownie at his hip, he walked to his father's resting place. Spells and subtle use of wood chisels had carved the perfect image of his father from the wood. His shield, inscribed with a rose, rested on his feet. He held his blade at his waist. The image showed not armor, but burial robes, and his father's strong-jawed, bearded face looked at peace. Inscribed under his father's feet, the words, Abelar Corinthal, Servant of the Light, who rode a dragon of shadow into battle against the darkness and fell in glory. Beside him lay Jiris, her fine features and high cheekbones as delicate as the oracle remembered them in life. The sculpted image, however, did not capture the loveliness of her red hair. Brownie curled up on the floor near Avalar's beer. I did what you asked, Papa. We were a light for a long time, but now darkness encroaches. Erebus Kale's son stands in the center of it and I cannot foresee the direction of his life. I gave him your holy symbol, the rose you loved. I think you would have wanted that. I will give him something more when the time comes. He ran his fingertips over his father's face, over Jiris's. Tears pooled in his eyes, ran down his cheeks. I miss you both. I wish we could have spoken this way when you were still alive. He thought about his words for a moment, then chuckled. Then again, maybe we spoke to one another in the ways that matter. Love doesn't require perfect words, does it? He took a look around the chamber, at the ribbons of warm color that decorated the walls, at the high windows in the round, a symbol of hope that light would one day return. Perhaps it would. Brownie stood, sensing that it was time to depart. I love you, Papa, and I will be home soon. He placed his hand on Brownie's back. The dog had been his companion, guide, and bodyguard for more than a decade, and there had been another before him, and another before that. The pass, Brownie, the oracle said, and the dog looked up, a question in his dark eyes. The debt is nearly paid. I must release them. The oracle pulled his cloak tight about him as the dog again activated his power and in an instant moved the two of them from the abbey to the spirit-guarded mountain pass that shielded the veil from unwanted incursion. The wind pawed at the oracle's robe, but he did not feel the chill. Brownie stood close, hackles raised, sniffing the air. The fog swirled, thick and gray. The oracle felt the spirit's awareness focus on him. Their sentience coalesced the fog into forms discernibly human. The outlines of men, women, and children stood all around him, dozens, their eyes like empty wells their outlines shifting in the wind. He saw the anticipation of their expressions, the hope. He would leave neither unanswered. With the aid of Abelar, Reg, and the servants of Lathander, the spirits had helped slay Kesson Rell, the god thief, during the Battle of Sakors. The oracle spoke above the whisper of the wind, above the whisper of the spirits. Kessenrel cursed Elgrin Faw, the city of silver, your city, to perpetual darkness in the shadow fell. But shadow and light came together on the field of battle, in the shadow of Sakors, and there combined to kill the god thief. One of the spirits glided forward, a thin aged man in robes. Avnon Des, the oracle said. The spirit inclined his head in acknowledgment. You come to free us, Oracle, yet we don't wish release. 
We vowed to serve the Order in gratitude for the Order's role in destroying Kesson Rel. We will hold true to that vow until the darkness is lifted. The other spirits nodded agreement, even the children. The Oracle held up a hand. Your oath is fulfilled and your service to me has ended. The world is changing, Avnandes. The spell plague was but a symptom of it. The war of light and shadow against the darkness of this world is no longer mine or yours to fight. It falls to others now. Shar's cycle will run its course, or it will not. I cannot foresee its end. The spirits rustled in agitation. You've kept the veil and abbey safe for a century, the oracle continued. But the time is past. I have only one more favor to ask. Return to the Shadowfell, but not to Elgrin Faw. Go to the master of the Citadel of Shadows. You serve him now. Tell him I still enjoy juggling. Tell him I said... I know the burden he carries. They looked at one another, back at the oracle, and nodded. The light is in you, Avnon Des, the oracle said. Avnon Des, the first demark of the Conclave of Shadows, smiled in return. And there is shadow in you, oracle. Farewell. Avnon turned to face the others, and their collective whispering sounded like wind through leaves. As one, they faded from view, returning to the shadow fell. The oracle stood his ground until they were gone. With them went the mist. The pass was exposed, unguarded for the first time in more than a century. The oracle put his hand on Brownie. Light and shadow, Brownie, will combine to fight the darkness, and I don't know if they will prevail. Return me to the abbey. A lurching sense of abrupt motion, and he once more stood in the abbey's sanctum. He enjoyed the quiet for a moment, the solidity of the walls. He could scarcely conceive of no longer calling it his home, but so it would be. I need you to get Abbot F., he said to Brownie. He would order everyone away. He would concoct some excuse, tell them that his vision demanded they go on a pilgrimage to Arabelle while he resanctify the abbey alone. They would worry for him, but they would obey. And after they were gone, he would remove all of the scrying wards that shielded the abbey from divination spells. Anyone would be able to find it, were they looking. And there were those who were looking. He kneeled, faced Brownie, and rubbed the dog's face and muscle. The dog must have sensed something amiss. His stubby tail did its best to wag. I'm going to send them all away, Brownie. And after they've gone, you must go too. The tail wag stopped entirely. The dog sat on his haunches, and a question formed in his eyes. I know, but you must go. I am to be here alone. Brownie licked his hand, refused to move, started to whine. Why? The oracle put his forehead against the dog's head, rubbed his sides, and stood. Because the chick has grown into a bird— and now we must kick him from the nest. Go fetch the abbot. Yellow lines of power spiraled out from Brennus's outstretched fingers, flowed around and into one face of his scrying cube. Shadows spun around his body, sweat slicked his brow. He was hunting a ghost. Come back, he murmured and once again slightly tweaked the nature of his spell. An echo of the images Rivelin had shown to him had to remain in the cube. They had to. He pictured his mother's face, pictured the flower-filled meadow, her outstretched hand as she died. On his shoulders, his homunculi hunched and mirrored his expression of concentration. 
A charge ran through the line of his spell, and a flash of light appeared in the cube. An image flickered just for a moment, his mother lying amid a field of purple flowers. The image was blurry, not as clear as when Rivelin had shown it to him, but it was there. It was there. What did you wish for, mother? Rivelin asked, the replay of the images slurring his voice. His mother, poisoned by her own son, said, To be the instrument of your downfall. The image fragmented on the face of the cube, eyes, nose, hands, all falling to pieces before fading altogether. Brennus cursed, and his homunculi echoed him. He blinked, wiped the sweat from his face, adjusted his spell, and tried to pull the echo back, but the face of the cube remained black. Damn it, he said. A soft knock sounded on the scrying chamber door. Not now, he snapped. Apologies, Prince Brennus, said Laurel, his seneschal, but... Brennus irritably waved a hand, and the ward on the door dispelled with a soft pop. The wood and metal slab swung open on silent hinges to reveal Laurel, standing alone in the dark hallway. You know that I'm not to be disturbed in this chamber, Brennus said. Laurel, his hands clasped across his stomach, bowed his balding head. Shadows poured from his flesh, a sign of his agitation. Yes, Prince, humblest apologies, but the Most High wishes to see you. The words brought Brennus up short. His homunculi squeaked with alarm. Shadows slipped from Brennus's skin. When? He sent a summons? No, Laurel said, looking up. His glowing green eyes narrowed with warning. He's here, Prince. Now. The words did not quite register. Here? On Sakors, now? From the dark hallway behind Laurel, the voice of Most High said, Yes, Brennus, now. Laurel stiffened, glanced over his shoulder in irritation, back at Brennus, and spoke in a formal tone. Prince Brennus, your father, Telamont Tanthul, the Most High. I think he knows who I am, Laurel said the Most High, and glided around the steward. The Most High towered over the seneschal, and his platinum eyes glowed feverishly out of the black hole of his sharply angled, clean-shaven face. An embroidered cloak hung from broad shoulders that age had not bowed. He held a polished wooden staff in one ring-bedecked hand— his body merged with the darkness, the outline of his form shifting, difficult to separate from the shadowed air of Sakors. That will be all, Laril, said Telamont. The steward held his station, jaw stiff, upper lip drawn tight, and looked at Brennus. Brennus nodded at him while he tried to gather his thoughts. That's all, Laril. Laril's exhalation was audible. Yes, Prince Brennus. Shall I have a meal prepared for two? Brennus looked at his father, asking a question with his eyes. I can't stay long. Very well, Laurel said. He bowed first to the Most High, then to Brennus, and exited the scrying chamber. This is a surprise, Brennus said. His homunculi cowered, covered their faces with their hands. I imagine it is the Most High said. So, Brennus cleared his throat. So? Father and son regarded one another across the gulf of things unsaid. The silence grew awkward, but Brennus refused to break it. At last, the Most High did. You and your constructs, he said, smiling, and nodded at Brennus's homunculi, like Rivelin with his coins. I'm nothing like Rivelin, Brennus answered, and could not keep a bitter edge from his voice. And you've always hated my interest in shaping magic, father. Mother encouraged it, but never you. No, the Most High said, irritation coloring his voice. I didn't, because I wanted you to focus on your gift with divination magic, and Brennus had heard it all before. What do you want, father? 
The Most High looked everywhere but Brennus's face. Brennus had never seen his father so discombobulated. Do you think that Rivelin still collects coins? Of course he doesn't, Brennus said. What use would a god have for such things? Shadows swirled around the Most High. Godling, he corrected, not a god. Neither, Brennus corrected in turn. Murderer. Telamont sighed. Still that. That. Telamont glided toward Brennus's scrying cube. I explained this to you before, Brennus. We needed him. You needed him. Do you still need him? He does nothing more than sit in his darkness and ponder his goddess. He can't be of use to you now. To that the Most High said nothing. Or perhaps he's just too powerful for even the Most High to challenge now. Is that it? The sudden tension in the air caused Brennus's homunculi to squeal in alarm and secret themselves in the hood of his cloak. The Most High turned to him, his platinum eyes mere glowing slits, the darkness about him deepening. It took everything Brennus had not to back up a step or lower his gaze, but he thought of his mother and held his ground. Shadows swirled around him. You push and push, Brennus, the Most High said softly, and then push again. My patience is not limitless. Brennus's homunculi trembled. Brennus bit his lip and held his tongue. The fire in the Most High's eyes diminished to coals. He cleared his throat. I didn't come here to fight with you, and Alishar died long ago. I've come to terms with how it happened, with the compromises I've made. He turned from Brennus and put his hand on the face of the scrying cube. This was just used. What were you scrying? Brennus lied. I was searching for the Chosen, as you asked me to do. The Most High turned once more to face him, and Brennus's lie crumbled under the weight of his eyes. And I was also searching for something else, something I hope to show you some day. The Most High seemed not to hear him. He spoke absently, almost to himself. Matters are afoot in Faroon, in Toril. I don't mean the wars. The Dalins will soon fall to our forces, but I mean something more than squabbles over territory. Something is changing. There's power in the air, stirrings. He seemed to remember himself and looked over at Brennus. Have you felt it? I have sensed something, Brennus said carefully, although he'd been so fixated on Rivelin and Mask and Erebus Kale's child that he'd had time to notice little else. The Most High nodded. I need you to refocus on the work I've asked of you, Brennus. Find the Chosen for me, as many as you can, as fast as you can. I believe they're important. Important? How? This change you feel, it's connected to the Chosen? Telamont nodded, turned, paced before the cube. The Chosen and the Gods. Pieces are moving. I'll admit that it's still opaque to me, but yes, the Chosen are involved somehow— I need them found. And then, you hold them? Kill them? Using his divinations, Brennus had already identified a score of Chosen for the Most High, but it was painstaking, time-consuming work. Surprising work, too. He had not expected there to be so many Chosen. It was as if the gods had birthed a brood of them in preparation for something neither he nor the Most High had yet been able to discern. Brennus had provided names, descriptions, and locations of those he'd found, and after that he had no idea what happened. In truth, the only chosen he was interested in was already dead, Erebus Kale. The Most High stared into Brennus's face. Just find them, Brennus. Brennus nodded. I hear your words, Most High. Will that be all? 
the Most High approached him, and his expression softened. Must it be like this forevermore, Brennus? I barely see you. We were never close like you were with your mother, but there wasn't always this distance. You no longer attend the conclaves. Your brothers ask after you. Eder is overseeing war with the Dales, yet I suspect you know nothing of it. Our Sembian forces recently took Archendale. Did you know that? Brennus knew nothing of any of it. His obsession with Rivalin had driven him into isolation. I've no interest in the movement of our armies. That's work for Eder. I have my own work. The Most High's expression regained its imperious cast. Your work is an obsession with your brother, with your mother, with revenge. It was too much, and the shouted answer slipped Brennus's control before he could rein it in. And it should be your obsession, too. He murdered your wife. You should want revenge. You! You fear him, though, don't you? The Most High's mouth formed a tight line. You overestimate his power and underestimate mine, and now you've come dangerously close to overestimating my capacity for indulgence. Brennus swallowed and said nothing, knowing an apology would sound foolish. Inside his cloak the homunculi trembled uncontrollably. You do as I've told you, the Most High said. Am I understood? Brennus stared into his father's face, bowed his head, and said, Most High, am I understood, Brennus? Your words are clear. The Most High studied his face, seemingly satisfied. His expression softened once again. If it helps, I believe Rivlin is being punished, Brennus. He's gone mad. He thinks he's going to end the world. Brennus blinked. And you think he can't? Of course he can't, the Most High snapped, and shadows swirled around him. He stares at a hole in reality for days on end. His thoughts bounce around in the cage prepared for him by his goddess. He dreams only of darkness and endings and suffers for it. He should suffer. My point isn't so much about him as you. Live your life, Brennus. We have work to do in Faroon. I will, father. The Most High stared into Brennus's face for a long moment before nodding. He pulled the shadows about him, was lost in them, and was gone. Brennus swallowed down a dry throat, exhaled. The homunculi poked their gray heads out of his clothing, looked around, their pointed ears twitching. Father gone now? Yes, Brennus said. Do as he ask? They inquired as one. Eventually, Brennus said. He moved to his scrying cube and once more tried to resurrect the image of his mother's murder. Chapter 7 Standing in the doorway of Anna and Coral's small, warm cottage, Elle drew her hood tight. The austere darkness of the late afternoon contrasted markedly with the warm glow of the cottage. Our thanks once more for the eggs, Elle, called Anna from behind her. You're welcome, Elle said, tying the string under her chin. You'd do the same if your hens were producing. Even so, it's idle day, Elle said, half turning, so stay in and keep dry. Anna tended a cauldron near the hearth. Her husband, Coral, sat in a rough-made chair before the fire, sharpening the blade of a hoe. I called Coral. There's naught to be done in this weather anyway, and thank you, Elle. You're a saint. Coral's sincerity touched her. Go feed that baby something, Anna said, smiling at her and nodding at Elle's belly. I Elle said. She pulled the door closed behind her and stepped out into the muddy cart road. The namesake elms that ringed the village whispered and creaked in the wind. The rain smelled of decay, a shit rain, Jarek would have called it, and she would have frowned at his use of profanity. She worried for the village's crops, 
A fouled rain would harm an already fragile harvest. More of her neighbors than Anna and Coral would suffer. The dark sky rumbled. The underside of the clouds looked burned, as if the world had caught fire and charred them black. But she knew how to read the sky, the subtle variations among the blacks and grays, and she thought the low swirling clouds promised an end to the rain, and soon. Odd, she thought, the things to which a person became accustomed. She'd grown up in Sembia's darkness and knew it as well as she knew the soil, but she'd never seen the unveiled sun and wasn't sure she'd know what to do if she ever did. But she hoped to find out one day. The thought summoned a smile. She felt oddly hopeful. Jarek would return on the morrow or the day after, perhaps with fresh meat, and she carried his child in her womb, a life unexpected. She ran her hands over the bulge of her stomach and her eyes welled. The changes to her body wrought by the pregnancy seemed to make her weep over everything. She felt silly, but smiled nevertheless. She wiped her eyes as she walked the sloppy cart road, her mind on the baby, barely cognizant of the mud fouling her shoes and soaking the bottom of her cloak. She thought of a time years earlier, when Shantia's green priests still traveled Sembia, using their magic to assist villagers with their crops. She remembered an elderly green priest, as thin as a reed, who had preached that where life grew, there was always hope. Back then, Elle had rolled her eyes at the words, but now, with a child in her womb, she understood exactly what the priest had meant. The child in her belly was hope. Again her eyes welled, again she smiled in embarrassment at her own sentimentality. Hope, she said, testing out the word. It sounded good, sounded right. She ran a hand over her belly. If you're a girl... We'll call you Hope. The sky rumbled with thunder. Elle refused to surrender her smile or her mood. She made a dismissive gesture at the sky. Bring your worst, she challenged. She crossed the village commons, heading for her cottage. The Rinz's milk cow was there, head down, chewing the grass. A scrawny barn cat slinked through the underbrush, probably stalking a field mouse. The idle day weather had kept everyone else inside, even the children. Two fishing boats tethered to posts at the edge of the pond bobbed in the chop. Before she reached the cottage, the rain lost its stink and reduced to a drizzle. With the weather cooperating and leftover stew already in the soup kettle, she'd decided she'd walk a bit more, maybe stroll the edge of the village and enjoy the elms. Shutters opened as she walked, and she exchanged greetings with her neighbors. The rain is soon to stop, she called to Mora. Mora looked up, nodded. How's the loaf? Elle put her hand on her belly. Rising. The gods keep it, and you. And you, Mora. Her feet carried her eventually to the two oldest elms in the village, the gate elms, everyone called them, the road from the plains went right between them and extended out into the darkness, a string that connected the village to the dangers of the plains. The road faded after only a short distance, devoured by Sembia's perpetual gloom. She stared at it a long while, rubbing her stomach. Jarek was out there somewhere, alone in the dark. She stood there under the leaves, sheltered from the drizzle, and wondered where he was how he fared. Your daddy's out there, she said to Hope. He'll be back soon. She turned to go, but a sound from out on the plains caught her attention. A man's voice, she was sure, although she had not made out any words. Jarek returning? A lost traveler. She considered calling out, but thought better of it. Jarek was not due to return, and Fair Elm had not seen a traveler in many months. She looked back at the village. The homes and barns and sheds within earshot were mere shadowy blobs in the gloom. Her fine mood evaporated as distant thunder rumbled anew, the sky having its vengeance for her taunt. Probably nothing, she whispered. Still, she sheltered near the bowl of one of the elms, her hand on the bark, and listened. 
She put her other hand on the handle of the small eating knife she carried. It would make a poor weapon. Long moments passed, and she heard nothing more, so she allowed herself to exhale. Probably she'd imagined the sound, or transformed a distant animal's howl into a man's voice. The gloom sometimes fooled the senses. Turning, she started back toward the village. The sound of rattling metal froze her, tightened her chest. A man's voice sounded from out in the darkness. Don't move, he said, and she didn't. Surprise shackled her feet to the ground, put a lump in her throat, sent her heart racing so hard she felt dizzy. Horrors lurked on the plains, and some of them could speak like a man. She knew she should call out for aid, but her voice seemed to have died in the sudden dryness of her mouth. She heard the slosh of something large in the mud of the road, drawing nearer, the jangle of chains. She imagined huge feet thumping in the earth, something snatching her from the darkness and stealing her away. Jarek and the neighbors would wonder what had happened to her, but no one would ever know. She'd become a warning tale for children. Thunder boomed. She blanched at the sudden sound. There now, said the voice again in a more soothing tone. Good. Good? She realized that the voice was not speaking to her, and the realization slowed her heart and freed her from her paralysis. Movement in the gloom drew her eyes. She could not make out details, but it did not appear the shadowy giant of her imagination. Who is out there? she called. The sound stopped. Who asks? I seek Fair Elm. This is the road, isn't it? By the gods, Gray, if you've walked astray, there'll be no barley for you for a ten day. Gray? Didn't she know that name? And all at once the voice and the sounds fell into place for El. Gray was a mule. The sound of jingling metal was the old mule's bridle. And the voice. Mincer, is that you? I, said the peddler, and El heard the smile in his tone. Is this Fair Elm? El laughed with relief, her legs weak with it. It is, it is. Come on, so I can see you. The slosh of Gray's hooves in the road grew louder, the sound no longer ominous, but jaunty. The dimness relented as they closed, and the shapes took on details. Mincer's large covered cart containing pots, pans, cutlery, tools, jars, all manner of metal and clay goods, even a few items of glass. Mincer sat hunched on the driver's bench like a dragon on his hoard. Gray, the largest mule El had ever seen, sullenly pulled the wagon through the muck, his ears flat on his head. El stepped away from the elm and waved. Mincer, it's been so long we thought something had befallen you. Mincer leaned forward on his bench to see her better. When he did, his jolly round face split into a smile under his thick graying mustache. No, fair lady. Gray and me know these roads better than the shades themselves. We steer clear of trouble, and we know how to shoot it when it shows. He held up the crossbow he kept beside him on the bench. Besides, a creature would have to be senile to want to chew on these old bones. He clicked at Gray to halt him before El, then heaved himself down off the wagon's bench. His belly bounced with every move he made. El rubbed Gray's muzzle, and the gentle giant of a mule whinnied with pleasure. It remembers you, lady, Mincer said. As do I. The peddler removed his wide-brimmed hat and made a show of bowing. I'm pleased to see you well, lady El. And I'm pleased to see you. El said with a mock curtsy, as will everyone else. Come, you should announce yourself. Of course, Mincer said. Will you ride? I think I will, she said. Mincer made a stirrup of his hands and assisted her up onto the driver's bench. Yep, he said, and shook Gray's reins. The mule pulled the wagon forward. You know, in the Dales and Cormier, a traveler don't announce himself as they do here. In the Dales and Cormier, everyone can see a traveler when he arrives in a village. 
Here the gloom makes sight uncertain. Hearing is best, unless you want to risk a startled crossbowman putting a quarrel in your hind end. You speak with truth, Mincer said, chuckling. You've been to Cormier and the Dales recently, then? El asked. The sun shines there still? Only Sambia is darkened by the shadow of our lady. I was in Cormier at the end of summer, and the sun shines brightly there. Things are dire in the Dales, I hear. Sambian soldiers occupy Archendale, and the other Dales brace for further attack. I myself saw Sambian soldiers, hundreds of them, on the march north. Stories of war in the far silver marches have even carried to these ears. He shook his head sadly. All of Faroon seems at war, milady. There's no place safe. I don't know what will come of it all. Well, El said, you're safe here, and welcome. Ah, even in the gloom you shine brightly, milady. El laughed. You should have had a life at court, Mincer. You've a flatterer's tongue. Mincer put a hand to his chest and feigned a wounded heart. You hear that, Gray? A flatterer's tongue, she said. El turned serious. May I ask you a question? Why come back to Sembia? Jarek and I were considering leaving. The Rabs left several days ago. I wonder if you saw them on the road. I did not, alas, although they might have been avoiding the roads for fear of the soldiers. Well, if we left and saw the sun, I can't imagine ever returning. Mincer nodded as if he understood. The road is in my bones, I'm afraid. Besides, even the darkest places need the light of Mincer's pans and urns and stories. But maybe you should leave, lady. A life in the sun would suit you. El smiled. Mincer fiddled with a bronze medallion he wore on his chest. El could not see it clearly, but caught a glimpse of an engraved flower. Is that a religious symbol, Mincer? Did you turn holy man while you were away? She was jesting, but Mincer responded with seriousness. This? He withdrew the symbol from under the tent of his shirt. It featured a rose and sun, a monitor's symbol. A bit, milady, I'll admit. I picked this up in a place of hope a few months ago. L touched his hand, his fingers like overstuffed sausages. I've been thinking a lot about hope recently. I'm glad you're here, Mincer. As am I, he said, and put the symbol back under his shirt. Mincer pulled up on the reins when Gray pulled the wagon to the village commons. A railed, wood-planked deck sat under the canopy of an elm. Seats made from old stumps sat here and there. The sounding bell hung from a post near the deck. As they debarked from the wagon, El said, You can share my dinner if you'd like. And our shed is still waterproof if you'd like to sleep in it rather than the wagon. There's a spot for Gray beside it. Keep him out of the rain. Mincer doffed his weathered, wide-brimmed hat and affected as much of a bow as his girth allowed. You remain, as always, gracious as a queen— it is a bit cramped in the wagon. It'll do in a pinch, but I admit your shed sounds appealing. She smiled, nodded. And for your hospitality, you shall have your choice of cookware from my offerings. I have some fine kettles I acquired in Derlin. Thank you, Mincer. Mincer made a show of looking about. So where, pray tell, is your king? And what sort of monarch allows his queen to walk about unescorted in such weather? El's voice dropped, and she looked off to the plains. Jarek is off on a hunt. Mincer recoiled. In this? Is he mad? I think possibly yes. Mincer chuckled. Well, I'm sure he's fine. I hope he returns before I move on. He'll return tomorrow or the next day. L heard doors opening, the voices over the rain. At least some of her neighbors must have seen Mincer arrive. They'd want to hear his stories and see what wonders his cart held. I'll set the table in two hours, she said. Meanwhile, announce yourself so all know you're here. Not even the rain will keep them away. 
Mincer's mouth formed a smile in the thicket of his mustache. L noticed the wrinkles around his eyes. He stepped onto the deck, the planks creaked ominously under his weight, and rang the bell three times, the peals loud in the quiet. Ho, fair elm, ho! Mincer the seller has returned, with wares from as far west as Arabelle, and tales from the other side of the world. More shutters and doors were thrown open. L heard the exclamations of children and the happy chatter of her neighbors as they emerged from their cottages and went out to greet Mincer. It had been so long since Fair Elm had seen a traveler, Mincer's appearance might as well have been a festival. L smiled as she walked back to her cottage. Mincer's arrival in the village always heralded a good day or three full of stories, interesting wares, and excellent beer. She was glad Jarek would return soon. He, too, would be pleased to see Mincer. After checking on her stew, she gathered all the extra blankets they had from the chest near the bed. Tattered and faded from many washes, the blankets had belonged to Jarek's parents. Mincer would not mind the condition. She took a small clay lamp and the blankets to Jarek's tool shed and made a place on the floor for Mincer to sleep. No doubt he had his own bedroll, but... He would welcome extra blankets. She returned to the cottage and laid down for a nap. The baby growing in her drained her of energy. She planned to be idle on idle day. She fell asleep to the sound of laughter, Mincer's voice spinning a tale, and the general hubbub of the gathering. It was as if Mincer had brought the village back to life, back to hope. A hand on his shoulder awakened Vasin. Darkness. The fire was mere embers, and Byrne had extinguished the light from his shield. Quiet. The rain had stopped. He had no way to tell the time, to know how long he'd been asleep. Where were the pilgrims? How was Noel doing? He was still groggy from sleep and had trouble orienting himself. He was vaguely aware of shadows crawling over his flesh, Orson's tattooed face loomed over him, lit only by the faint glow of the fire's embers. Concern showed on the diva's opalescent eyes. What? The diva held an inked finger to his mouth for silence. Vasin came fully awake as Orson nodded at something beyond the cave mouth. Noel coughed, the sound loud in the quiet of the cave. Orson's grip on Vasin's shoulder tightened at the sound. Quiet that boy, someone hissed from Vasin's right. The pilgrims were crowded into the rear of the cave, some hugging one another, others holding eating knives in their hands. One of them had produced a truncheon from somewhere. All of them wore expressions of fear. Noel lay covered in blankets near the wall, still lost in fever, muttering incoherently, but his color had returned. Elora stroked her son's head, whispered softly to comfort him. She alone seemed unconcerned with what lay outside the cave's mouth. Vasin lifted himself on an elbow, trying to move quietly in his armor, and saw that Byrne, Eldris, and Nald crouched near the cave opening, hugging the wall and looking out. Noel coughed again, summoning sharp intakes of breath from the pilgrims. Vasin saw Eldris's jaw clench as he chewed on his own tension— Nald's hand opened and closed over the hilt of his bare sword. Vasin stood, pulled Orson close, and whispered in his ear. What is it? Shadowfar, Orson said. The word flooded Vasin with adrenaline, pulled thick gouts of darkness from his skin. He crept toward the cave mouth with Orson. Behind them, more coughs from Noel. Ordinarily, the coughs would have been a good thing, indicative of the boy clearing his lungs. But at the moment, the sound put them all at risk. Elora tried to cover his mouth, but the boy, still incoherent, jerked his head to the side and cried out. That boy will get us all killed, said one of the pilgrims, a man whose name Vasin could not recall. Vasin turned and glared at him, pointed a finger leaking darkness at the man's face. The man's mouth clamped shut, and shame anchored his eyes to the floor. Eldris held out Vasin's sword. 
Vaisin took it, hugged the walls of the cave near his men, and peered out across the river. Orson stood beside him, the cave's shadows engulfed them both, as thick as ink. A Vesserab stood on the far side of the river, its head lowered to the stream to drink. Its cylindrical, serpentine body was twice as long as a man was tall, much of it coiled on the riverbank. From its side sprouted membranous wings as large as sails. The dark gray hide, fixed with an elaborate saddle and harness, faded to a pale blue on its chest and underside. Its face resembled an open sore, a pink mass of flesh in the center of which was a rictus of fangs. To Vasin, the creature seemed an impossible mix of lamprey, bat, and serpent. Its eyes looked like flecks of obsidian. A tongue as long as Vasin's forearm extended from the gash of its mouth to slurp at the water. A single shadow var kneeled at the water's edge beside the Vesserab, filling his water skin. Thick, viscous strands of shadow spiraled lazily around his form. Vasin's eyes fell to his own skin, where similar shadows swirled. A gray tabard marked with the heraldry of netheral covered the shadow var's ornate armor. The thick plates featured vicious spikes at shoulders, gauntlets, knees, and elbows. Bald, gaunt, and with skin the color of old vellum, the shadow var looked more like a corpse than a man. His eyes glowed red in the darkness. A sudden animal grunt from somewhere off on the plains behind the shadow var caused Vasin's heart to jump and startled the Vesserab. Its wings flapped and it lifted its face into the air, long tongue wagging back and forth like an antenna. The shadow var stood, patted the creature's side, and said something in his baroque incomprehensible language. A call sounded in the same language from farther down the riverbank. The first Shadowvar shouted back, then said something to his mount. Vasin could not see down the river from where he stood in the cave's mouth, and didn't dare risk exposing himself by venturing out of the cave. Another one, Orson whispered. Maybe more than one, Vasin said. Let's find out, the diva said. He crouched low and moved out into the brush, a few paces outside the cave. He looked down the riverbank, then looked back at Vasin and held up one finger. Only one more shadow var. Vasin would wait them out. It appeared the shades had stopped only to water their mounts. They would be on their way back to Sakor's or Shade Enclave soon enough. He would not risk the pilgrim's safety or the abbey's discovery by attacking. He made eye contact with Eldris, Nald, and Burn. He did not speak, but formed the words, We wait and do nothing, with his lips. They nodded. Like him, they understood the stakes. Noel coughed again, summoning a wince from the dawn swords. The intake of breath from the pilgrims at the rear of the cave was sharp enough to cut wood. The Vesserab, already skittish, grunted at the sound and again reared up drool dripping from the circle of its fanged mouth, wings half-spread. The muscles under its hide rippled. It extended its neck, and the sore of its face opened like a blooming flower, revealing more pink flesh, more flaps of teeth. It chuffed at the air, sniffing for spoor. The shadow var came to its side, the shadows around him swirling, a frown on his lips. He spoke softly to the creature while scanning the bank, the shadow var would be able to see as well in darkness as Vasin, perhaps better. Orson made himself small in the scrub. Vasin flattened himself against the wall, his fist clenching and unclenching on his sword hilt. By his side, Burn softly breathed out, and Vasin caught the tail end of a whispered prayer in an exhalation. The shadow var's red eyes poured over the terrain, the scrub, the trees— his eyes went over and past the cave mouth, and Vasin allowed himself to hope. The far shadow var called to the near one, a question in the tone. The other answered a bit too casually, nodding across the river bank. They're coming, Vasin said to Byrne, and Byrne nodded. Another coughing spasm from Knoll. The Vassarab shrieked in agitation. The Shadowvar gripped the reins and slung himself into the saddle, calling out to his comrade as he did so. Ready yourself, 
Vason whispered to Byrne. We can't allow either to escape. Moving rapidly but methodically, Nald, Eldris, and Byrne sheathed swords, unslung their crossbows, cocked and seated quarrels. Vason kept blade to hand and prayer at the top of his thoughts. The Vesserab coiled its body, tensed, and with an awkward shove, vaulted into the air. For a moment, Vason lost sight of it, but only for a moment. It landed amid the scrub just to the right of the cave mouth, crushing shrubs and snapping saplings. Orson crouched in the foliage ten paces from it. The shadow var called over his shoulder to his comrade. He cocked his head, his red eyes fixed on the cave mouth. Noel broke into another coughing fit. The shadow var slid out of his saddle, drew his sword, the blade like black glass, and advanced on the cave. Darkness clung to him, concealed his legs and lower body in a fog of darkness. The Vesserab lingered behind him, sucking in the air, its long tongue dangling between the rows of its teeth. Orson crept closer to the creature, as silent as a ghost. Noel's hacking ceased. The tension in the cave was as thick as the shadows. Many of the pilgrims whispered prayers. The shadow var halted. Vaisin held up a hand to order Eldris Nald and Byrne to hold. They nodded, but took aim nevertheless. The darkness deepened around the shadow var. He took a single step within it and moved in an instant from the darkness in which he stood to the darkness in the mouth of the cave. His sudden appearance three paces before them elicited a surprised curse from Byrne and hurried shots from the crossbows. Two bolts went wide, but Burns struck the shadow var in the chest. The darkness around the shadow var killed the bolt's inertia, and the missile thumped weakly into his breastplate. The pilgrims shouted in fear. Vason voiced the prayer he'd kept behind his teeth, and his sword ignited with a monitor's light. The shadow var blanched before the sudden glare, his darkness overcome by Vason's light, and Vason bounded forward with a shout. He slashed at the joint in the shadow var's armor between shoulder and neck, but the shadow var recovered enough to duck under the blow and stab his sword at Vason's abdomen. The black blade ground against Vason's armor, and he lurched to his left before it could penetrate to his flesh. He slammed his shield into the shadow var's face, felt the satisfying crunch of bone, and sent the shade careening backward three strides. Kill them out! Vason shouted. The Vesserab shrieked, spitting drool, and lurched like a serpent toward the combat, crushing scrub and saplings under its writhings. Byrne, Eldris, and Nald rushed past Vason toward the creature, blades high and lit. The creature reared up, hissing. Vason did not see Orson anywhere. He lunged at the shadow var, noting with horror and fascination that the shade's broken nose already had ceased bleeding, the bones reshaping themselves as the flesh regenerated. The shadow var spit a mouthful of blood, parried Vason's overhead slash with his own blade, and loosened a kick that struck Vason in the abdomen and doubled him over. Vason's breath rushed out of him, but he got his shield up in time to block a slash that otherwise would have decapitated him. He swung his blade at the shadow var's leg to drive him back a step. They regarded each other for a moment. Vason's light dueling with the shadow var's darkness while Vason's fellow dawn swords surrounded the Vesserab and hacked at its flesh. Vason moved first, bounding forward and stabbing low. The shade sidestepped the blow and loosed a cross slash for Vason's side, but Vason swept the blade out wide with his shield and lashed out with the backhand. The pommel of his sword caught the shadow var flush in the cheek, sent him reeling. From nowhere, Orson reared up behind the shade and leaped on his back, his quarterstaff drawn across the shadow var's throat, his legs wrapped around the shade's waist. The shade's red eyes flared with surprise and fear. The darkness around him swirled, churned. He spun a circle, gagging, trying to shed Orson, but the diva covered him like a cloak, his arms hooked around his quarterstaff, squeezing. The shade tried awkwardly to bring his large sword to bear on Orson, but the diva's position made it difficult. Vason did not hesitate. He lunged forward and stabbed the shadow var through the midsection. The shade screamed when Vason's glowing blade cut through the black armor, the gray flesh. Blood gushed from the wound. The shade staggered under Orson's weight, then fell to the muck. 
The moment he hit the ground, Orson rolled off of him, and Vason stepped forward and with a downward slash decapitated the shadow var. Their flesh regenerates only while they live, Orson said. The diva was not even breathing hard. This one is done, but not the other. To Vason's right, the Vesserab wailed its dying shrieks as Eldris Nald and Burns' swords rose and fell on its quivering flesh. Black blood stained their weapons, coated the creature's blue hide. Its wings flapped feebly as it made one last effort to get airborne, but it was too wounded to fly and only managed a clumsy lurch. The dawn sword's blades ran it through, its body spasmed as it died. Vason scanned the riverbank for the other shadow var, spotted him twenty paces down the river on the opposite side, strapped himself into his saddle. Shoot him, Vason said, pointing. The second shadow var's Vesserab shrieked in answer, showing its fangs. It beat its wings and tensed to take flight while Eldris, the best crossbowman among the dawn sorts, dropped his blade, took crossbow in hand, and cocked it rapidly. Basin ran in the shadow var's direction, although he had no idea what he intended. Burn, Nald, and Orson trailed him. The sails of the Vesserab's wings collected air and the creature rose into the sky, and with it went Vason's hope. The pilgrims were more than a day away from the abbey, more than a day away from the dales. The shadow var would escape, report their presence, and a full patrol would come and find the pilgrims on the plains. Vason would not be able to protect them. Eldris's crossbow sang, and a bolt sizzled through the shadows and tore a gash in the membrane of the Vesserab's wing. The creatures emitted a high-pitched shriek, lurched, beat its wings frantically, and spiraled back to the ground. A cloud of shadow swirled around the Shadowvar and his mount. The huge creature lurched about on the ground, shrieking, flapping its wounded wing. The Shadowvar spun in the saddle, his red eyes glowing in the black hole of his face. His gaze fixed on Eldris, and he held forth his free hand. A column of dark energy streaked across the river at Eldris, blasted him in the chest, lifted him from his feet, and drove him to the earth. Eldris! shouted Nald, but already Eldris had rolled to his stomach and climbed to all fours. Meanwhile, the shadow var shouted at his mount, thumped it in the side with the flat of his blade. We can't let him escape! Vason said. Burn and Nald already had crossbows to hand and let fly, one bolt plowing into the soft earth beside the Vesserab, the other striking the shadow var but dying in his darkness before ever reaching flesh or armor. Vason eyed the river, desperate. It was too wide. He'd never get across in time. Keep firing, he said, although he knew it would be futile. Responding to the furious prompts of its master, the Vesserab again coiled its body and launched itself into the air. Its wounded wing made flight awkward, and for a moment it struggled to get height under it. The shadow var shouted at it, slapped its side, all the while staring back at Vason with hate in his face. Take this, Orson said, and shoved his quarterstaff into Vason's hand. Before Vason could ask any questions, the diva was gone, sprinting over the uneven ground, zagging through the thick scrub and bounding over fallen logs toward the river. What's he doing? Byrne asked, reloading his crossbow. I don't know. Come on. Vason and Nald and Byrne ran after Orson, but could not approach the diva's speed. Orson reached the river at a dead sprint and launched himself into the air, a column of shadow formed under Orson's feet as he went airborne, and Vason, Byrne, and Nald stopped cold, gasping as Orson sailed high into the air, completely over the river and into the airborne Vesserab and its rider. By the light, Nald said. Vason thought light had little to do with Orson's feet. The diva hit mount and rider in a tangle of limbs and wings and swirling shadows, Unready for the impact or the weight, the Vesserab lurched sideways and lost altitude. It shrieked, its wings beating furiously to keep it airborne. Orson hung on, swinging free in the air, one hand closed on the Vesserab's saddle strap, one hand around the shadow var's ankle. Shoot it, Vason said. Shoot it! 
Nald and Byrne fired again, one after another, the bolts slamming into the Vesserab's flank. It keened with pain and lurched sideways. Blood sprayed from its wounded side, spattered the scrub below. Orson swung like a pendulum but did not let go. The shadow var, nearly unseated by the lurches of the wounded Vesserab, managed to steady himself enough to hack downward at Orson with his black sword. Orson released his grip on the shadow var's ankle to avoid losing a hand, but before the shadow var could pull his arm and blade back, Orson seized his wrist. The moment he had it, he twisted his grip somehow, and the shadow var shouted with pain. The sword fell from the shade's fist and spun to the ground. Still holding the shadow var by the wrist, Orson let go his hold on the Vesserab's strap and took the shade's arm with both hands. Using the arm as a lever, he flipped his legs up and got them under the armpit and around the shadow var's neck. The Vesserab careened wildly through the sky as the men atop it struggled. A fog of shadows swirled around Orson and the shadow var. Basin could see only glimpses of the tangle of limbs— the shadow var's gauntleted fist rising and falling as he punched at Orson. Come on, Basin said, and crashed through the scrub toward the river. He lunged into the cold water without stopping, burn and gnawed on his heels. He hoped that his height would keep his head above water. The Vesserab shrieked again, and so too did the shadow var. Orson dislodged the shadow var from his mount, and shade and man plummeted earthward in a cloud of shadows. Vason cursed, the current pulling hard at him, turning his straight course into a diagonal, but the water never rose above his chest, and he cleared the river. Eldris and Nald called out behind him, neither was as tall as he, and both were getting pulled downstream by the current. Help them, Eldris, he shouted over his shoulder, not knowing if Eldris could even hear him. He clambered up the muddy bank, his boots slipping in the mud, using the scrub to heave himself up. By the time he crested the top, shadows oozed from his flesh. Faith filled him, and he channeled it into his blade. The weapon ignited, lit with a rosy light. He spotted Orson and the shadow var twenty paces to the right. Darkness churned around the shadow var, and he appeared unwounded from the fall. Orson circled him at a few paces, favoring a wounded leg. Vason charged straight at them. He shouted Orson's name as he ran and hurled the diva's quarterstaff toward him. The weapon spun wildly as it flew, but Orson bounded back from the shadow var on one leg, caught it, and spun it over his head and before him so fast it hummed. The shadow var's red eyes glared as he looked first at Orson, then at Vason. He extended a hand at each, and black energy streaked from his palms. Orson tried to dive aside, but his leg slowed him, and the bolt caught him in the hip, spun him halfway around, and slammed him to the earth. Basin interposed his shield, and the bolt slammed into the steel so hard it drove him from his feet. The metal cooled at the magic's touch, and dark energy crept in tendrils around the shield's edge and dissolved the strap, but it dissipated before doing any more harm. The Shadow Var drew a secondary weapon, a black mace, from his weapon belt and stalked toward Orson. The diva rolled to his side, tried to stand on his wounded leg. Basin could see it was broken and fell back to the earth, grunting with pain. The Shadow Var would kill him easily. Vason leaped to his feet and renewed his charge, shouting a prayer to a monitor and channeling the power of his faith into his shield. The entire disc blazed with light. He gripped its edge in his hands, spun a circle, and hurled it at the shade, who saw it coming a moment too late. The blazing shield cut through the darkness around the shade, slammed into his side, and staggered him, continuing to blaze with the monitor's light. Wincing in the blazing light, the shadow var recoiled and shaded his eyes with his own shield. Vason rushed toward him, his blade held in a two-handed grip. Orson planted his quarterstaff in the soil and used it to pull himself to his feet, hopping on his one good leg. Vason hadn't taken four strides before the shadow var's darkness extinguished the light from his shield. Vason didn't care. His blade glowed with light enough. He roared as he slashed downward, a blow to cleave the shade's helm and split his skull. 
The shadow var parried with his shield, bounded a step back, and countered with the swing of his mace that clipped Vason on the shoulder. A flash of pain, then numbness. His arm hung limp from his shoulder, but he held his blade in one hand and stabbed and slashed, driving the shadow var back a step. And then Orson was there, barely mobile, but with his quarterstaff still a whirling, spinning line of oak. The shadow var parried with shield and mace, backing up under the onslaught of metal and wood, the darkness around him whirling like a thunderhead. Vason ducked under a too-casual mace swing, stepped past the shadow var's shield, and stabbed up under the shade's breastplate. He felt his glowing weapon grate against metal plates, pierce the mail beneath, slide into flesh, and grind against bone. The shadow var grunted with pain, red eyes wide. He dropped his mace and grabbed at Vason with his free hand as if he would push him away. Orson's quarterstaff slammed into the shade's temple, sending his helm from his bald head. Vason jerked his blade free and the shadow var hit the ground like a felled cow, the darkness about him still swirling. Vason straddled him, reversed his grip, and drove his blade downward into the earth. The shadow var was gone. Damn it! said Vason, looking around frantically. Orson sagged to the ground, wincing from pain. He is not far. Their power allows them to step from shadow to shadow, but not over long distances. Vason spun around, eyeing the thigh-high whipgrass, the scrub bushes, the solitary broadleaf tree here and there. He saw nothing. He escaped us, Vason shouted as Byrne, Eldris, and Nald climbed over the riverbank. He's near and sorely wounded. He'll heal rapidly, said Orson, feeling the break on his leg. Vason knew. He snatched his shield from the ground, picked a direction, and started walking. Light, Vason called, and all four servants of a monitor used the power of their god to light their swords. Holding them high, they scoured the nearby plains. Here, Eldris called, and Vason and the other sprinted to his side. Eldris crouched near a broadleaf tree. It's soaked with blood, he said, touching the bowl of the tree and holding up his fingers, red with shadow var blood. Vason sheathed his sword, darkness whirling around him. Then he's gone. We'll be pursued soon enough. His mount abandoned him, at least, Byrne said, nodding at the dark sky. The wounded Vesserab was nowhere to be seen. That earns us some time, but only some, Vason said. He can move rapidly from shadow to shadow. A patrol will pick him up eventually. So they'll be coming, Nald said. Vason looked up at the sky, thick with darkness, and nodded. They'll be coming. Get the pilgrims ready. We need to move rapidly. Not the normal way. We'll take a direct path to the Dales. Burns' eyes widened. You're certain that's wise, First Blade? No, I'm not. But see to it. I, as Byrne, Eldris, and Nald headed back to the cave where the pilgrims were sheltered, Vason hurried over to Orson. The diva sat on the grass, his loose trousers rolled up over his thigh. Tattooed lines traced paths like veins the length of his leg. The man's flesh really was a map of sorts. The places he'd been drawn on his flesh in cryptic swirls and angles. Broken? Vason asked. And the ankle. Orson nodded at his ankle. It was already purpling and the bones were angled all wrong. Only a furrow between his eyes suggested the pain he must have felt. Vason crouched beside him. I can help you. Your chain. What? Orson nodded at Vason's chest. It took Vason a moment to realize what Orson meant. The chain on which he wore Dawn Lord Abelar's holy symbol was broken. Its unlooped length hung on a ridge of his armor. His heart fell and he cursed. I have to find it. He started to rise, remembering Orson's leg, remembered his duty. After, of course. This may hurt, Orson. May? Will, Basin acknowledged. Ready yourself. Using the symbol of a monitor enameled on his shield as the focus for his power, Vason gently laid the shield over Orson's leg and intoned a prayer of healing. The shield glowed softly and warmth flooded Vason's body. 
he focused the warmth in his hands, his palms, and placed them on the shield. The power passed through to Orson's flesh, and the diva hissed through gritted teeth as bones re-knit and bruises faded. Vason slung his shield and pulled the diva to his feet. Orson tested his weight on the leg. Good? Vason asked. Good. Your symbol? It must have fallen off in the fight, Vason said, looking hopelessly at the ground around him. It's important to me. A silver rose, Orson said. Vason was surprised the diva had noticed. Yes, it belongs to the Oracle and Dawn Lord Abelar before that. I'll help you find it. They slowly walked the area where they had fought the shade. Neither of them found the symbol. Eventually both of them got down on all fours, feeling through the grass, Vason berating himself for his carelessness. He should have had it tucked under his mail shirt, not hanging free. He should have been more careful. Nine hells, he could have lost it in the battle, or he could have lost it while crossing the river. Vason, Byrne called from across the river. I know, Vason shouted over his shoulder, running his hands over the grass, hoping to feel the metal rose under his hands. Orson stood, put a hand on Vason's shoulder. I think it's gone, the diva said. I know. We should go. Vason hung his head. How would he explain to the oracle? The pilgrim's first blade, Byrne called. And that was the word that dispelled Vason's self-pity. The pilgrim's safety was more important than any holy symbol. He sighed, angry, sad, and stood. Thank you for helping, he said to Orson. Of course. The lines on your skin, what exactly are they? Orson looked down at his hands, covered in lines and swirls. The story of my life. The story of your life can be read on your skin? Orson nodded. Much of it? Where I've been, at least. But the point of the story isn't to read it. It's to write it. A man writes his story in the book of the world, Vason. Or so I tell myself. Vason heard an echo of his dream in Orson's words. He tried to dismiss it as coincidence. Well, that's a good story, Vason said, and Orson chuckled. <laughs> Very good. A good story indeed. Byrne, Eldris, and Nald already had the pilgrims geared up and ready to set out. Vason and Orson sidestepped down the riverbank and waded into the water. You'll not jump it this time? Vason said to him, smiling. Orson smiled in return. How did you manage such a feat? Orson's eyes narrowed with puzzlement. How do you cause your blade to shine? You know the answer to that, with faith. And so it is with me. Your faith manifests as light. Mine does not. But your God is gone. Yes, but my faith is not. Well enough, they waded into the water. You are a strange man, Orson. I think you said as much once already. Vason chuckled. I thought maybe you needed a reminder. Maybe you should write it on your skin. Orson laughed. Very good, very good. As they emerged on the other side of the river, Orson adopted a more serious tone. When there is time later, let's discuss some things. Ziad's satiety unnerved Sayyid almost as much as his appetite. Having spat his pollution into the young girl, Ziad seemed almost giddy. He whistled as they plodded over the plains, saturated by the rain. The cats seemed gleeful, too, their bloodlust temporarily sated. They fairly pranced around Ziad, tails held high. For his part, Sayyid could not rid himself of the foul taste of the devourer's flesh, the memory of the girl's screams of terror, his brother's wet grunts as he expelled the evil in him. Her name was Lani, he said to himself, not understanding why he felt the need to say her name aloud. What did you say? his brother asked, looking back, his voice high-pitched, irritating. Nothing. Sayyid said, knowing Ziad would not understand. 
protesting the rain. The cats eyed him suspiciously, their fang-filled mouths more devilish than feline. Ziad held his hands out, palms up to the sky. I like the rain, renews the spirit. Saeed said nothing. He feared he had no spirit to renew. He feared the spell plague had stripped him of his soul and left a moral vacancy filled now only by his brother's ambition and his own resignation. He lived, but he did not live. And so it would go forever. He swallowed down the despair evoked by the thought. Ziad stopped. I smell wood smoke. The excitement in his voice made Saeed nauseous. Saeed smelled it too, the faint hint of a chimney's exhalation. Breakfast fires, maybe. Once the aroma would have made his stomach growl with hunger. Now he barely tasted the food that passed his lips. To the extent his senses let him perceive anything with acuity, it was invariably something foul, like devourer flesh. Come, come, Ziad said and picked up his pace. A village is near. He chuckled. Perhaps Lani's village. Hearing his brother speak the girl's name sharpened Sayid's irritation. He stared at his brother's cloaked form, Ziad's soul as distorted as his flesh, and wondered how it was possible to love and hate the same person so much. He flashed on an image of his sword driven through his brother's back, the blade exploding out of Ziad's chest in a spray of blood or whatever foul ichor now flowed in his brother's veins. Come on, his brother called. Sayid came back to himself to find three of the cats sitting on their haunches before him, slit eyes staring at him knowingly. They lifted paws to fanged mouths and licked at the mud on their pads. Their eyes never left Sayid's face. Out of my way, he said, but they did not move and he walked around rather than through them. The smell of breakfast fires grew stronger with each step they took, and by the time they reached the village, the rain had sputtered to a stop. A dozen or more ancient elms sprouted from the plains, noble-looking trees with vast canopies lost to the shadowed air, giants compared to the meager broadleaves that predominated elsewhere on the plains. They must have been saplings when the spell plague struck. Within the circle of the elms was a large pond and the village whose breakfast fires they'd smelled. A few dozen single-story wooden homes huddled around a common pasturage. Bark shingles covered the roofs. Smoke rose from several chimneys. Post fences made from stripped broadleaf limbs delineated small fields and gardens. A few rickety wagons sat here and there, small chicken coops, livestock pens— the village was so small Sayid could have run from one end of it to the other in less than a fifty count. The overgrown cart path they walked carried them between two of the elms, which formed a kind of natural gate. Sayid heard voices coming from the village center, the chatter of earnest conversation punctuated with laughter and the occasional jovial shout. A collection of hovels, Ziad said, eyeing the village contemptuously. His good mood was already fading. Probably his hunger was already returning. It smells of peasants and shit. A herd dog stood in the open door of a rain-sodden woodshed, eyeing them, its hackles raised. Ziad's cats stared back at it as they walked past, and the dog tucked tail and retreated into the shed. No one seemed to be around. As Sayid was about to announce their arrival, as was the custom, a boy of maybe ten winters with a too large cloak thrown over his homespun hurried around the corner of one of the fences ahead. Head down, he clicked at a thin sheep that trailed him. When he caught sight of Sayid and Ziad, he froze ten steps away, but a world distant. The sheep, its head down against the rain, walked into him and bleated. Ho oh there, boy, Sayid said, raising a hand in greeting. The boy's sleepy eyes went wide. Saeed and Ziad must have looked to him like ghosts stepping from the shadows. Saeed tried to look harmless, despite his armor, sword, and wild hair and beard. There's no need to be afraid. 
The boy turned and ran off toward the center of the village, slipping in the mud as he went. Mother! Mother! The sheep trotted after him, oblivious. Fly back to the nest, little bird, Ziad said softly, and Saeed knew his tone promised blood. Predators are afoot. They followed the boy's shouts toward the center of the village. The few local dogs and cats they saw slinked away as Saeed, Ziad, and their cats drew near. Scrawny livestock lowed or bleated in their pens as they passed. Ahead they saw the village center. A raised, planked deck and a bell on a tall post had been built under the canopy of a large elm. It looked like the entire village had gathered there. Women, children, and men sat on stump stools or stood about, their eyes on the deck, where stood a large fat man with a thick mustache holding forth about something. A rickety peddler's cart stood to one side, still yoked to a large graying mule. Some of the villagers were examining the cart's wares, smiling. The boy Sayid had frightened stood at the edge of the gathered villagers, a woman kneeling before him, probably his mother. The boy pointed back at Saeed and Ziad while his sheep nibbled the grass. See, I told you more travelers had come, see? Dozens of eyes fixed on Saeed and Ziad, questions written in their expressions. Eyes widened at the brothers' blades, their unkempt appearance. The brothers walked toward the gathered villagers. The crowd formed up to await them, shifting on their feet, children hiding behind parents. The peddler standing on the deck bowed and doffed his cap. Mend, sir, the cellar at your service, good sirs. This gem of a village is called Fair Elm. And if I may be so bold as to speak for these good people, we bid you welcome. The villagers did not echo the welcome. Saeed did not bow in return. His gaze swept the villagers, looking for anyone who might have been other than they appeared. He saw no one of note. My name is Sayid, he said. This is my brother, Ziad. Their foreign-sounding names caused a murmur of discontent to move through the crowd. Well met, Mincer said. He waited a moment for a return greeting that didn't come, and the brother's silence seemed to take him aback. He looked around at the villagers, perhaps hoping one of them would speak, but none did. He cleared his throat. Oh, yes, well, what has you two walking Sembia's plains under this bleak sky? There are dangers on the plains, although you look like a man familiar with a sword. We are merely travelers, Ziad said. We're just passing through, Sayid added. It is custom, is it not, to offer shelter and a meal to travelers? No one offered either. Eyes found the ground. The silence thickened. Finally, the boy they'd frightened piped up. Those are strange-looking cats. Nervous laughter greeted the boy's words. Strange-looking men, said a man's voice in the back. Ziad stiffened at that, craned his neck. Who said that? Saeed took his brother by the arm, but Ziad shook it off. No one responded to the question. Who spoke so? Ziad said. It seems the custom in this stinking mass of hovels is to speak rudely to strangers. Lots of angry looks, but no words, until a woman's voice from off to the side said, And now who speaks rudely? Saeed and Ziad turned to see a tall, strongly built woman with long red hair walking toward the crowd. Saeed would have thought her attractive had he still felt such things. The cats at Ziad's feet hissed at the woman as she approached, and her step faltered, her eyes on the creatures. You mind your tongue, woman, Ziad said, lest... Saeed's hand on his brother's arm halted whatever threat he might have uttered, but the woman took his point and would have none of it. She put her hands on her hips and stuck out her chin. Lest what, good sir? L said another woman in the crowd, a small, mousy-looking woman with a mane of black tresses. No, Anna, El said, and glared back at Ziad. Say what you would, sir. Yes, last what, 
said another man in the back. Most of the villagers' expressions grew vaguely hostile, although a few looked frightened. The children in the crowd, perhaps sensing the rising tension, looked upon events with wide, fearful eyes. Now, now, Mincer the peddler said as he lowered himself from the deck, huffing with the exertion of moving his fat. The crowd parted to let him through. He wore a fake, vacuous smile that annoyed Saeed. Things have gotten off poorly for no reason that I can see. I can assure you, good sirs, that Fair Elm is a village of unparalleled hospitality. Our homes are not hovels, spat a large bearded man near the front of the crowd. Nodded heads greeted his assertion. Nor our women to be threatened, added another. Mincer gestured grandly, a king granting dispensation. Sweat beaded his brow. Of course not, and I'm sure these men meant no offense. They misspoke, is all. The cats lined up before Ziad, eyeing Mincer coldly. The peddler's eyes went to them, to Ziad, back to the cats. He licked his lips nervously. Yes, well, um, perhaps you two could explain what brings you to Fair Elm. If the good people here can be of assistance, I'm sure you'll have it. Within reason, and if not, well, then you can be on your way. Much of the day remains, and this is the best time to be traveling. A round of eyes rose from the villagers. Ziad stiffened, leaned forward, looking at Mincer closely. What's that? What's what? asked Mincer. On your neck, what is that? Ziad advanced on the peddler, who nearly stumbled over himself, backtracking. The crowd surged forward a step, but that was all. Saeed put his hand to the hilt of his blade. Ziad snatched at a lanyard hanging from Mincer's neck and yanked it hard, snapping it. Sir, Mincer said, his face blotching red. Ziad held the lanyard before him. A medallion hung from it, a medallion that featured a rose and a sun. The cats crept forward, gathering at Ziad's feet. Ziad's tone was sharp enough to cut flesh. How did you come by this? The peddler stuck out his chest. That is none of your... Ziad grabbed him by the shirt and pulled him close. His brother was much stronger than his slight frame would suggest. How did you get this, peddler? Let him go, El said and angry murmurs formed in the crowd. They moved closer. Aye, let him go. The cats at Ziad's feet arched their backs, hissed, showed fangs. Sayid moved to his brother's side, eyes cold. Keep your distance, Sayid ordered them. Speak, Mincer, Ziad said. Your life depends on truth. The peddler sputtered, terrified. My life? You threaten me? What is this? Speak, Sayid said, his eyes still on the crowd. I got, I got it at an abbey. Ziad's hand gathered more of the peddler's shirt into his fist. His voice was as tight as bowstring, his eyes on Mincer's face. The Abbey of the Rose? Mincer hesitated nodded, his eyes moving from Ziad to Saeed. Saeed glanced at the peddler, hope rising in him, making him as giddy as his brother. And while you were at the Abbey of the Rose, you saw... the Oracle? Several in the crowd made a sign with their hands, three fingers raised to the sky. Mincer gulped, nodded. And the sacred tomb of Don Lord Abelar... Saeed whirled on him. Who? Did you say sacred? Ziad asked, his voice low. He did, Saeed said. Sweat poured off of Mincer's brow. He swabbed at it with a dirty hand, streaking his face with filth. Hearing the name of Abelar Corinthal, hearing him given a hallowed title, his resting place called Sacred, all of it made Saeed want to puke. Ziad released Mincer, and the fat peddler adjusted his shirt and his dignity. Thank you, Mincer, 
Ziad said, faking a smile. You must know where the Abbey is, then. Mincer huffed. No one knows where it is exactly. The Oracle sees who will come and sends dawn swords to fetch them. But I doubt that you two— And they fetched you? Ziad asked. Mincer's mind seemed to be catching up with his mouth, so he held his tongue. Speak, man, Sayid said, his shout startling the peddler. Yes, they fetched me. I wanted to see the Dawn Lord's tomb. The sacred tomb, Ziad said, closing his fist over the medallion. Of Dawn Lord Abelar. Mincer chewed the corner of his mustache. He seemed unable to make sense of things. You think him other than a good man? Ziad smacked Mincer across the face, eliciting gasps from the crowd. I know him to be other than a good man. Mincer's mouth moved, but no words emerged. A trickle of blood leaked from the corner of his lips. Something to say? Ziad asked. Say it, fat man. The peddler's face reddened, but still he made no sound. Sayid, caught up in Ziad's growing anger, held up his maimed hand, showing the stump of his thumb. Your dawn lord took my thumb, and that of scores of other unarmed men. He was a coward. Gasps and uncomfortable expressions answered his proclamation. You're mad, someone said. Leave here! Dawn Lord Abelard died a hundred years ago, said a burly man in a thick homespun, probably the village's smith. He's jesting, said the fat peddler, rubbing his cheek, then blanched before Saeed's hard gaze. Uh, aren't you? Another man's voice from deeper in the crowd said, You look hale for a man of a hundred winters. Uncertain laughter. Saeed sought the source of the voice in the crowd. His gaze killed the laughter. Jest? Saeed snarled. You think I jest about this? The smith's wife, Anna, tried to pull the man away from the front of the crowd. Come on, Coral. Let's go now. Breakfast is ready. No one is going anywhere, Saeed snapped and whisked his blade free. He knew how events would unfold. The cats did too, for they meowed in excitement. The crowd went wide-eyed at the sight of Saeed's blade. A child wailed. The red-haired woman, Elle, stepped forward, her arms held out to her sides as if she would protect the entire village with them. Why don't you put your blade back and be on your way now? Please, just leave. The villagers nodded heads, murmured agreement. Ziad shoved Mincer away, causing the fat man to stumble, and glared at El until she took a step back. I take no orders from you, woman. I meant no offense. Ziad paced before all the villagers, staring at them, fists clenched. Ah, but now I am offended by this place, by all of you. He glared at the crowd. My brother spoke truth. One hundred years ago, Abelar maimed unarmed men, us among them. He held up the stump of his severed thumb. Dawn Lord Abelar stole our livelihood, stole our lives. His voice rose as he spoke, spit flying. He made wild gestures with his hands. The cats trailed him like angry shadows, hackles raised, hissing. Dawn Lord Abelar condemned us to a cursed existence, a living hell, with only a devil's promise to give you hope. And you venerate him, you simplistic idiots. You wish to see, do you? No one spoke. Everyone stared at Ziad, wide-eyed. Then see! He threw off his cloak, untied his tunic, and tore it from his body, revealing his torso. The villagers gasped, turned away. Children screamed, started to cry. Sayid simply stared, dumbfounded. He'd not seen his brother's exposed flesh in years. Fissures and scars, deformed skin that was the color of an old bruise. In places the flesh looked melted like candle wax. 
Tumors bulged, the largest in the small of his back, and here and there were malformed lumps of vestigial tissue. A few red scales covered the flesh in places. His distended stomach looked like that of a starving man, like it would pop if it were pierced. Blue veins visible through his skin made a grotesque net on his flesh. You see now what your Dawn Lord wrought, do you? As they watched, his skin bubbled and rippled, as if something moved below the surface of his tissue. He laughed, the sound manic, filled with rage. That is what Avalar did to me! Ziad was respiring heavily, the sound wet and bubbling. He whirled on Mincer, who quailed before his wrath, and pointed a finger in his face. You will take me to the Abbey, peddler, and I will see the Oracle. And while I am there, I will also visit the sacred tomb of Abelar Corinthal. Mincer sputtered. I... I told you I don't know how to find it, and even if I did... Ziad stalked forward and slammed the medallion into the peddler's brow, knocking the fat man to his knees and causing him to exclaim with pain. I think it's in that head, Mincer, and I'll have it out one way or another. He cast the medallion at the feet of the bleeding peddler. L stepped forward and tried to help Mincer to his feet, but the peddler seemed in no mood to stand. Instead, he sat there, stunned and bleeding. I'm all right, lady, Mincer muttered, but he was weeping. I'm all right. L whirled on them, face red with anger, a vein bulging in her forehead. Get out of here, she shouted and pointed at the road. Get out of here now. Ziad ignored her as he gathered his tunic and cloak. The cats paced around him, meowing, licking their chops, eager, hungry. Sayid could not deny that he felt some of the same hunger, looking on the faces of the stupid peasants and their foolish reverence for Abelar Cornthal. He had not come into the village intending to kill, but the desire to do so rose in him now, ugly and bloody. The peddler comes with us. Ziad said. Sayid stepped forward, pushed El away roughly, grabbed Mincer by the arm and jerked him to his feet. Leave him alone, El said. It's all right, lady, Mincer said, his speech slurred, daubing at his bleeding forehead. I'll be fine. The cats continued their insistent meowing. Ziad rubbed their heads. Hungry, are you? He looked up at the crowd, a sly smile on his face. Please, El said, just go. We are going, Ziad said. But first, something for those who revere Abelar Corinthal. A nervous rustle from the crowd, one uncertain laugh, a cough. Come out, Ziad said to the cats. Show them. The villagers watched in wide-eyed horror as the cat's mouths opened so wide it looked as if their jaws were unhinged. Their faces seemed nothing but an open hole. Something wriggled within the cat's bodies, under their skin, causing their forms to bulge grotesquely. Their eyes rolled back in their heads and their bodies convulsed. A woman screamed. Another fainted. Everyone took a step back. Terror moved in a wave through the crowd. What's wrong with them? Someone shouted. Gods, said another. Scaled hands reached out from within the cat's throats, took hold of either side of the gaping mouth and began to pull back. The cat's skins stretched as blood-slicked diabolical forms wriggled out of the maws. More screams, shouts of horror. Diabolical forms wriggled forth in a slick, bloody mess of scales and horns and claws and teeth, the bodies much larger than the skin of the cats that contained them. They snarled as they emerged, drooling, shedding the feline skins like cloaks. The light preserve and keep us, Mincer whispered beside Sayid. Sayid backhanded him in the face with a gauntleted fist. The peddler did not even groan, just fell to the ground unmoving. As the devils stretched, panic seized the villagers. They gathered children, screaming, and fled. All except L. 
She stood her ground, her hand to her mouth, terror in her eyes. The gore-slicked devils crouched on all fours, their sinewy muscles coated in a blanket of long spines. Their slit-eyed gazes darted about as they fixed on one and then another of the fleeing villagers. Long black tongues ran over mouths fanged like a shark's. The one nearest Sayid lifted its head to the sky and uttered an eager, clicking ululation. Feed, Ziad said to them, and gestured at the fleeing villagers. All but this woman and the peddler. They're mine. The devils snarled and pelted after their prey like a pack of wolves, howling for blood and flesh, their clawed feet throwing up clods of sod with every stride. One of them thumped into El as it passed, nearly knocking her down. The woman, Saeed, Ziad ordered. Two of the devils pounced on the villager who had fainted. They seized her by head and feet and tore her apart in a spray of gore. Saeed grabbed El by the wrist. She whirled, terror in her eyes, and kicked him hard in the groin. No, no, no! The blow might have doubled over another man, but Saeed barely felt it. He pulled the woman close while she slapped and clawed at his face, her nails digging bloody furrows in his cheeks. Leave me alone! Saeed grabbed her by the hair and thumped her in the temple with the pommel of his sword. She sagged to the ground as limp as a grain sack. He stood over her and watched Ziad's creatures work. The devils prowled heedlessly through the village, gleeful in the bloodletting. They overturned wagons, knocked down doors, shattered fences. From time to time they launched groups of spines from their backs, the missiles catching fire as they flew, thudding into flesh and wood and setting it all aflame. Screams sounded from all over the village, terrified shrieks from inside cottages and barns, wet ripping sounds from the street gurgling groans of pain. The devils slaughtered everything within reach, not even sparing the livestock. Pigs squealed, impaled on devil's claws. Dogs, cows, goats, and cats were chased down and torn to pieces. The devils careened wildly through the streets, soaked in blood, bits of flesh and fur hanging from their claws, arms or legs dangling in their fangs, an orgy of gore. Ziad came to Saeed's side. It's beautiful, isn't it? When Saeed said nothing, Ziad kneeled beside Mincer and pulled him to a sitting position. Slaps to his face opened Mincer's eyes. Seeing the slaughter, the peddler clamped his eyes shut, shaking his head. No, no! Ziad slapped him once, twice, a third time. Open your eyes, peddler! Open them or I will cut off your eyelids. Wincing, jaw clenched, his entire body trembling with the effort, Minster opened his eyes. He wept at the screaming, the blood. What have you done? What have you done? The light preserve us. Ziad grabbed him by the hair. That will be your fate and worse if you don't take us to the abbey. The light won't preserve you. Nothing will. You're a monster, the peddler said, sobbing. A monster! Ziad roughly released his hold on Mincer's hair. You have Abelar Corinthal to thank for that, peddler. Saeed watched the devil's work with a peculiar sense of detachment. He knew he should feel something. Horror, sympathy, elation, something but he felt nothing except tired. He might as well have been watching the slaughter of dinner chickens. He just wanted to get on with finding the abbey, the oracle, and end his perpetual self-loathing and bitterness. He ran his fingertips over his cheek and felt only smooth skin. The grooves that El's nails had carved in his face had already healed. Everything healed, except his spirit. That wound where it should have been had never healed, and never would. The Lord of Cania will cure us, Saeed, Ziad said, as if reading his thoughts. We need only get to the oracle and from him learn the location of Kale's son. He kicked Mincer. 
And now we have a way. Fewer screams carried from the village. The devils had killed most everything. Sayid heard mostly the sound of feeding, tearing meat. Sayid put a boot in Mincer's belly. The peddler groaned, curled up into a fetal position on the ground. And if this oaf cannot lead us to the abbey, he said, He can and he will, Ziad answered. Won't you, Mincer? The peddler made no answer other than sobs. When the devils had devoured their fill of the corpses, they stalked back to Ziad and Sayid. Mincer covered his eyes at their approach. Their yellow reptilian eyes glared at Sayid as they passed. Back now, Ziad said. We serve, one of the devils croaked, and each went to the bag of cat skin it had vacated picked up the fur, extended the mouth over their horned heads, and began to squirm back inside. They seemed to diminish as they wriggled and writhed their way back into cat form. Soon the devils were gone, and thirteen cats stared at Ziad and Sayid. The woman? Sayid asked, although he suspected he knew the answer. I have something special for her rude mouth, Ziad said. His bare, scarred, distended stomach began to lurch and roll as he dredged up the poison he carried within him. Put her on the deck. Saeed picked El up under her armpits and dragged her atop the deck. Her eyelids fluttered open when Saeed dropped her there. She sat up, still woozy, recoiling as Ziad advanced on her, his body heaving with the effort to expel the darkness within him. Please, don't... El said, backing away crab-wise. I'm with child. Not anymore, Ziad said, the words distorted by the black phlegm filling his mouth and dribbling down his chin. As quick as an adder, he lunged forward, grabbed her by the wrists, and pinned her arms to her sides. He leaned in toward her face, his mouth open, drooling. She clamped her mouth shut, turned her head from side to side, making little grunts of fear. Sayid sheathed his sword and walked away. He'd rather survey the slaughter of Fair Realm than watch his brother purge. He felt eyes on him and realized that several of the cats were following him, or perhaps they wished to revisit their slaughter. Looking on the cats, Sayid imagined something lurking within Ziad, too, some secret form waiting to burst forth from his brother the way the devils had heaved themselves out of the cats. Blood, bodies, and gore littered the village's streets and buildings. The eyes of the villagers, where eyes still remained, stared accusations at him. Seeing the blood and death, he thought it was good that he no longer had a soul. If he had... By now it would be a withered, shriveled remnant of feeling, a thing that brought only pain, far worse than nothing.